mr slingsby invites suspicion it is one of the delightful features of the english spring that days occur in it in fact it is almost entirely composed of days on which as evening draws in the temperature is such as to render an open fire agreeable even necessary the one that blazed in the grate of the sitting-room of bill's flat in marmont mansions battersea some ten days after flick's impulsive departure from holly house was large and cheerful it threw warm beams of golden light on the celium sleeping on the rug on bill smoking in an armchair on flick snug on the settee her fair head bent over a pair of bill's socks which she was darning bill his pipe drawing nicely had fallen into a pleasant train of thought after that hectic night in the gardens of holly house life had settled down to a smooth placidity flick was comfortably established now in a bed sitting room round the corner having stumbled by good fortune on a house whose landlady so far from objecting to dogs had welcomed bob with a motherly warmth and was now conducting a campaign of systematic overfeeding which had already begun to have grave effects on his figure this admirable woman could also cook in a manner rare among her kind so that flick though after the magnificence of holly house she could hardly hope to find a bed sitting room a luxurious had no complaints to make except for an occasional spasm of remorse brought on by remembrance of her uncle sinclair she was enjoying life hugely she liked the novel feeling of freedom she liked the sense of adventure and she particularly liked these daily visits to the home of bill and judson the only phenomena in her new world which she did not like were those twelve photographs of alice coker which seemed to stare at her with a hostile disdain every time she entered this room she had now come definitely to the conclusion that she detested alice coker to bill also the present trend of life seemed wholly excellent in a vague way he realized that things could not go on like this forever but he did not allow the thought to diminish his happiness being at an age when one does not look very piercingly into the future he was satisfied to enjoy the moment soothed by the atmosphere of quiet and spluttering fires and sock mending he could not remember a time when any one had ever darned socks for him in the days of his careless prosperity he had simply worn the things until the holes became too vast even for his uncritical tolerance and then had thrown them away he lay back in his armchair watching flick's busy fingers and told himself that this was life as it should be lived flick's fingers stopped their rhythmic movement she looked up what has become of mr coker she asked she was fond of judson he had at last got over his embarrassing habit of gaping at her like a fish as if the sight of her in his sitting-room made his senses real and there existed between them a firm and growing friendship their relations were like those of a modified desdemona and othello she liked him for the hardships he was undergoing and he liked her that she did not pity them judson had never met a girl more sweetly disposed to listen to his troubles in a black world flick restored his faith in human nature he told me he was going to look up slingsby said bill and felt the faint pricking of conscience which always came to him when the name of the london manager of the paradine pulp and paper company was mentioned recently he had rather permitted the dynamic mr slingsby to pass out of his life and the thought sometimes made him uncomfortable he had achieved he realized absolutely nothing in the direction of fulfilling the mission which his uncle cooley had entrusted to him and more and more this visit of his to london was beginning to take on the aspect of a pleasant vacation 
this was all wrong of course but on the other hand what could he do as his uncle had justly remarked if wilfrid slingsby was baffled by the problem of why the prophets had fallen off what chance had a novice like himself to solve it i didn't know he knew mr slingsby said flick oh yes i took him round to the office the other day and introduced him flick resumed work on the sock i've been thinking she said i don't like what you told me about mr slingsby oh he's all right said bill with the tolerance bred of physical well-being i can't help feeling he may be crooked bill smiled indulgently this he supposed was what they called feminine intuition the only trouble with it was that it didn't work common sense had long since caused him to abandon the doubts he had once entertained of mr slingsby's honesty oh i don't know he said i wouldn't say i liked the man but i don't suspect him of anything like that it's true he has let the profits fall off and yet you say he was such a capable man yes but he explained the whole thing to me the day i lunched with him i couldn't quite follow all of it but it seemed straight enough business conditions <laughs> and all that sort of thing you know i see said flick and there was a brief silence bill changed the subject i've been thinking too yes wondering said bill what your people are saying about your running away it seems odd there hasn't been anything in the papers uncle george would never allow anything to get into the papers he would be much too afraid of a scandal they never put any reply to your letter in the personal column of the mail it begins to look as if they intended to stick it out yes what will you do if they don't climb down flick looked up with a quick flash of her cornflower eyes that sudden impish way she had of jerking up her head always fascinated bill it reminded him of a startled kitten i shall get a job somewhere i'm pretty good at typing and i can do a sort of shorthand i used to work with uncle sinclair a lot at one time at any rate i'm not going back to marry roderick i should say not anything said bill sententiously is better than marrying someone you don't love love is worth waiting for one of these days you're bound to find a man you'll fall in love with am i absolutely bound to comes over you like a flash you know quite suddenly does it i remember when i first met alice what sort of a girl is miss coker flick interrupted what sort of a bill found himself at something of a loss for words it is a tough job describing goddesses why she's but i've told you all about her a lot of times so you have said flick demurely returning to the sock it's been wonderful having somebody like you to talk to about alice said bill judson isn't much use in that way but you're different you're a real pal i can would she mend your socks asked flick the question seemed to disconcert bill he had recently come to regard sock mending as one of the noblest pursuits of woman and it pained him to discover anything even remotely resembling a flaw in miss coker's perfection but the fact had to be faced try as he might to envisage alice mending socks he could not do it she's rather the dashing sort of society type of girl you know he said and was aghast to find himself speaking quite apologetically i see there was a silence from the fire a few glowing fragments of coal dribbled into the grate the celium on the rug gave a little whine as he chased rats through dreamland don't you usually write to her on tuesdays said flick carelessly good lord 
bill dropped his pipe and stared at her with fallen jaw i'd clean forgotten you'd better go and do it now or you'll miss the mail bill was conscious of a peculiar sensation analyzing this he was horrified to realize that for an instant what he had been feeling was a reluctance to get out of his chair a strange evil shrinking from the delightful task of writing a long letter to the girl he loved for one ghastly moment the thing had seemed a bore letters at number nine marmont mansions battersea had to be written in the dining-room it happening to contain the only table in the flat that did not sway like a lily if leaned upon and somehow the thought of leaving this cosy fireside and going into the dining-room depressed bill his better nature asserted itself he heaved himself up and left the room flick laying down the half-mended sock sat gazing into the fire then with a little impatient wriggle she started sewing again she had been sewing for some minutes when the door opened and judson came in hello said flick we were wondering where you were is anything the matter judson had flung himself moodily into the chair which bill had vacated disillusionment and dejection written plainly on his speaking countenance he was not proof against this womanly sympathy look here he said i'll tell you all about it you've got a kind heart you're not the sort who would simply kid a fellow i should hope not well then look here you know as well as i do that there are moments especially in this beastly country where the wind always seems to be blowing from the east when a fellow just has to have a nip of the right stuff to keep the cold out it's a simple matter of health medicinal ask any doctor you admit that don't you if it makes you any happier well with bill west behaving like a darned policeman i'm pretty much up against it in this direction he says he's only doing it for your good oh i've no doubt he has some story to explain his behavior said judson coldly besides he promised your sister to look after you there is only one word said judson with asperity to describe bill's attitude of groveling servility to my sister alice and that word is sickening it isn't as if she cared a hang about him doesn't she not a whoop but i thought they were engaged perhaps they are but be that as it may you can take it from me that she's just using him i'm very fond of her as a matter of fact and she has always been decent to me but a girl may be all right as far as her brother's concerned and still be a rough citizen when it comes to other men much as i like alice it's no use kidding myself that she's not a flirt ever since i've known her she's always had a dozen fellows on a string mark my words she'll let bill down yes sir one of these days that boy is slated to get a jar that'll shake his back teeth out flick though she felt she would have liked to hear more on this theme reluctantly decided at this point that she had no business to be encouraging these revelations with a strong effort therefore she changed the subject that's too bad isn't it she said but what were you going to tell me when you came in you know you said i had a kind heart and wouldn't make fun of you oh yes the animation with which judson had been discussing his sister left him his moodiness returned he spoke in a minor key as befitted a painful story i was saying that in this beastly raw windy weather a fellow has simply got to have a drink now and then or his health gets undermined and the trouble as far as i'm concerned is that it's a darned tough proposition to know which way to turn this afternoon i thought i would try an outside chance what did you do asked flick wondering she had visions of judson counterfeiting spectacular fainting fits in the middle of the street in the hope of getting restored with brandy 
i went to see if i could touch that man slingsby mr slingsby whatever made you go to him well he's old paradine's london manager and bill is old paradine's nephew and i'm bill's best pal it isn't as if there wasn't a sort of moral obligation anyway i called on him at about four this afternoon i can see now that i didn't choose a particularly good time for my visit the man was in a thoroughly nasty temper having i discovered just fired his stenographer why was that i didn't find out though i sat there all ready to be confided in if he wanted to slip me an earful he isn't what you would call a very cordial sort of bird that fellow in fact the whole atmosphere seemed to get so strained after i'd been there about an hour and a quarter that i was in two minds about going away and leaving him flat only i wanted that drink you understand so i stuck around and eventually he decided to close the office and put the cat out for the night and call it a day it was then getting on for six and he said he was going home i said i hadn't anything to do for a while so i would come along with him he must have got very fond of you by this time said flick well i don't know said judson doubtfully he seemed to me a trifle grouchy that's strange how do you account for that it beats me said judson but mind you i wasn't worrying a whole lot about it what i was thinking about was that drink by the way said flick is this story going to end happily eh i mean does it end with you getting a drink judson laughed a gruesome laugh oh ho, ho. i got a drink all right he scowled darkly at the fire i'm coming to that we left the office and got into the man's car has he a car what sort i forget he did tell me winch something winchester murphy that's right big gray limousine expensive looked as if it had cost the earth and that's what makes it all so infernally despicable here's this man rolling in money and i gave him every opportunity to invite me to dinner but he wouldn't bite this was after he had got to his house oh he has a house has he as well as a big car where does he live burton street no bruton street it's off that square uh, what's its name by devonshire house barclay square that's it barclay square you turn to the right he lives halfway down in a biggish house on the left side well he got out and he opened the door with his latch-key and stood there looking at me in a sort of expectant way so i came in and after a bit i came straight out with it as a man to man and asked him if i could have a drink and he said certainly it's very curious said flick meditatively that he should have this expensive car and live in a place like bruton street and when it came what do you think it was it costs a lot living anywhere round there it was cocoa said judson somberly a cup of cocoa on a tray and when i looked at it in a sort of stupor if you understand what i mean he said that bill had told him that i was a strict teetotaler bill mind you who's been my friend for more than fifteen years i explained this to slingsby bird that he had got the facts all wrong and hadn't he a drop of scotch about the place and the man with a beastly mocking smile said that cocoa was much better for me than scotch as in addition to being warming it contained nourishing fats and then he said would i excuse him as he had to dress for dinner i can't understand it said flick if he lives in bruton street and has an expensive car he must be quite rich crawling with money and that's what makes it all the more 
but he can't get such a big salary as manager for mr paradine i wonder how much the london manager of a firm like mr paradine's would get a year judson was impressed i see what you're driving at he said you mean the fellow's a crook i can well believe it of course he might have private means that's true said judson damped but if he had he would hardly go on being just manager for some one else he would be in business on his own account a man in his position wouldn't be paid much more than a thousand pounds a year if that i don't see how he does it i want to think this out you see as far as i can make out from bill old mr paradine has not paid very much attention to his business for the last few years he is wrapped up in his old books and has just left things alone it would be a splendid opportunity for a man in mr slingsby's position to do something underhand and he's just the man who would do it he's so clever you mean i wasn't thinking of that so much said judson what i feel is that there must be practically nothing to which a fellow who would offer another fellow cocoa on an evening like this wouldn't stoop that's the way i look at it and laughing nastily mind you while doing so End of chapter 7「A Job for Percy Pillbeam」Flick Sheridan and Judson Coker were not the only two people in London who were taking an interest in the affairs of Mr. Wilfred Slingsby. Such are the ramifications of this complex civilization of ours that the movements of the manager of the Paradine Pulp and Paper Company had also come under the observation of no less a person than young Pillbeam, the real power behind that entertaining weekly Society Spice, of which Roderick Pike was the nominal and unwilling editor. The morning after the conversation between Flick and Judson, recorded in the last chapter, Roderick sat at the editorial desk of Society Spice, gazing wanly at the galley-proof of an article by his impetuous assistant which dealt with the nefarious activities of the race of turf commission agents an article in the course of which he pallidly noted the name of mr isaac bullet was mentioned no fewer than three times and not once in a spirit of genial praise this series on bookmakers swindling methods initiated by pillbeam discontinued by roderick and resumed at the express orders of sir george had always reached a fair level of zippiness but never its reluctant sponsor felt had it so out zipped itself as in the present instalment young pillbeam dealing with the swindling methods of bookmakers and using as his leading instance the laxness of the commercial code of ike bullet made juvenile seem like a tactful pacifist the pallor on roderick's brow would seem to have been caused entirely by the perusal of this inflammatory piece of prose and not at all by the anxiety as to the safety and whereabouts of his vanished bride-to-be flick's departure though it had acted like an earthquake on others of the family group had apparently left roderick unperturbed on his arrival at the office ten minutes ago he had been in a noticeably cheerful frame of mind he had even been whistling but at the sight of the very first paragraph of pillbeam's philippic the whistle had died away and like flick had not been heard of since to him shrinking quivering in his chair there now entered young pillbeam in person striding into the room with shining morning face all pep ginger efficiency and alertness this youth with a future was about twenty-three years of age diminutive in stature and shinily black of hair he wore a lively young check suit and his upper lip was disfigured by a small fungoid growth of moustache 
he accosted his chief genially a tactful man he had never shown any disposition to rub his recent victory into roderick roderick was still technically his superior officer and he always treated him as such ah said pillbeam having passed the time of day i see you're reading that little thing roderick coming to himself with a start dropped the little thing as if it had been an adder how do you like it added the second in command and without waiting for an answer proceeded i say i've had a great stroke of luck happened by pure chance to stumble over something last night that looks pretty bubbly we shall just be able to bung it into this week's issue roderick licked his lips not with relish but because they felt dry and cracked the thought of bunging into this or any week's issue anything which a critic of pillbeam's exacting standards considered pretty bubbly gave him a dull aching sensation in the pit of the stomach what is it he asked hollowly young pillbeam removed his coat hung it on a peg donned a faded blazer bearing the colors of the cricket club which enjoyed his support on saturdays and wielding a skilful pair of scissors shaped from the cover of an old number of society spice the paper cuffs which it was his prudent habit to wear when in the office i happened to go and have a bit of supper last night at mario's said pillbeam and there was a man a couple of tables off with a girl in pink i didn't know the girl but she looked chorus girlish i suppose she came from one of the theatres the man was a chap i've seen around the place named slingsby know him roderick said he had not had that pleasure wilfred slingsby does a good deal of putting up money for shows and so on explained pillbeam sort of man you're always seeing at romano's and that sort of place well that's who he is and he was sitting there having supper with this girl and suddenly ever meet a girl named prudence stryker roderick said he had not had that pleasure either and endeavoured somewhat austerely to make it clear to pillbeam that his knowledge of the more roistering strata of london society was not so extensive and peculiar as he seemed to imagine american girl said pillbeam was in the follies in new york for a long time but came over last january to join the chorus at the alhambra big dark spanish-looking girl with black hair and large flashing eyes roderick shuddered miss stryker appeared to be the exact type of girl he disliked most and he hoped that the story was not leading up to the information that his young assistant proposed to bring her to the offices with a view to securing her reminiscences well prudent stryker suddenly came in with a chap and no sooner did she see this fellow slingsby having supper with this girl in pink than she gave a yell rushed across the room swept all the plates and glasses off the table and then swung her right and plugged slingsby a perfect beauty in the eye <laughs> how's that eh said pillbeam with the honest enthusiasm of a good scandal sheet conductor not so bad what the only trouble is that the poor girl was so instantly chucked out by the management that i didn't get a chance to have a talk with her and find out what it was all about why pillbeam should allude to the muscular miss stryker who had apparently acted so dramatically in accordance with her second name and with so lamentably little consideration for her first as the poor girl roderick could not understand so what i thought i would do said pillbeam was to go and interview this fellow slingsby and bring back a nice story for this week's issue i find he's got an office in st mary axe i can pop down get a statement from him and have the article in type by lunchtime i'll be off there as soon as i've cleaned up these proofs roderick looked at the enthusiast with a growing horror it seemed to him as if fate was going out of its way to make life difficult an article such as that envisaged by pillbeam must infallibly lead to his incurring in his editorial capacity the enmity of this miss stryker 
who would naturally be sensitive about the matter and disinclined to see it exposed to the myriad eyes of london in the staring nudity of print and last night's drama showed with a hideous clearness what happened to those whom prudence regarded with disfavor a vision of himself being plugged a perfect beauty in the eye came to roderick as vividly as if he had seen it in a crystal i don't think we want that story he said tremulously i can't use it pillbeam stared at him aghast but it's a corker he urged everybody who reads spice knows slingsby roderick in his desperation snatched at the suggestion offered by this statement if he's as well known as that he said he may be a friend of my father's no no not a chance of the boss knowing him there is persisted roderick why shouldn't there be the man may be his closest friend for all you know and you remember how furious he was the time you put in that story about sir claude molsey and the brighton bungalow i shouldn't run the risk of having that sort of thing happen again if i were you pillbeam looked thoughtful roderick's words had given him pause the incident to which he had alluded was the only existing blot on the pillbeam escutcheon as nice a little things we want to know don't you know paragraph as he had ever written and then it had turned out that the victim at whom it was directed was one of sir george's most intimate cronies most certainly he did not want that sort of thing to happen again a way out of the difficulty came to him i'll go up and see the boss he said then ask him he removed the paper cuffs changed the blazer for his check coat and thus suitably attired left the room to seek an interview with the great chief up in his office on the fourth floor meanwhile sir george pike was in conference with his sister frances and had been for the last half hour the subject before the meeting was as usual the total disappearance of flick just think how long it has been since she ran away mrs hammond was saying and how little we've done why we're no nearer finding her than we were two weeks ago i know sighed sir george i know the proprietor of the mammoth publishing company was looking more like a stuffed frog than ever this matter of flick's mutiny was weighing hardly upon him you surely do not suggest i hope he said having taken a couple of napoleonic turns up and down the room that we should give in to her and insert that advertisement in the daily mail the last two words escaped from him in a sort of miniature explosion of pent-up disgust if flick had only known the one thing in the whole unfortunate business that had smitten her uncle most sorely was her tactless request that the family capitulation should be announced in the alien mail and not in the home-grown daily record certainly not said mrs hammond decidedly of course not nothing could be farther from my thoughts i am only saying that we ought to take some definite step of some kind and you george are our only hope sinclair is perfectly useless sometimes i am not sure that he does not in his heart of hearts secretly sympathize with the girl you must do something george and at once george frowned thoughtfully i did put the matter into the hands of a private detective you know a private detective using the utmost discretion of course sir george assured her i told him that felicia was the daughter of an old friend of mine suggested that she must have been stricken with amnesia which i thought rather a happy idea but there have been no results the fact is these private detectives are no good no good whatever they exist only to take fees in advance and do no work to earn them the telephone buzzed discreetly mr spilbeam would be glad if you could see him for a moment sir george sir george turned from the instrument with the air of one whose troubles have been divinely solved good gracious what is it 
I never thought of him. What an amazing thing. The one man ideally fitted for... Young Pilbeam wants to see me, he explained. You remember him? Does all the work on spice. One of the brightest, keenest fellows in the place. A man in a million. The finest young chap for this sort of business in London. Have him in at once, cried Mrs. Hammond excitedly. I will. To Francis Hammond's keen vision, one glance at the assistant editor of Society Spice was enough to justify her brother's eulogy. Percy Pilbeam was not an ornamental young man. Aesthetic critics would have found much to cavil at in his check suit, and physiognomists might have clicked their tongues disapprovingly at the sight of his mean little eyes, and the unpleasant smile on his badly shaped mouth, but for the task in hand his qualifications stuck out all over him he looked what he was a born noser out of other people's coyly hidden secrets she bowed amiably as sir george with a brief word made them officially known to each other you wish to see me pilbeam just a trifling matter sir george i'm on the track of rather a good story about a fellow named slingsby wilfred slingsby i just thought before going any farther that i would make certain that he did not happen to be a personal friend of yours slingsby slingsby never heard of him who is he he has some sort of business in the city and he is rather well known in theatrical and sporting circles about town he has had a finger in backing one or two musical comedies just the sort of man the readers of spice are interested in exactly what i thought sir george what has he been doing he was mixed up in a rather spectacular affair at one of the night clubs last night i thought it might be worth following up undoubtedly most decidedly by all means follow it up thank you sir george oh pillbeam said the big chief as that promising young man turned to go one moment he went to his desk and took out the photograph of flick which he had recovered from the Raxhall Detective Agency, after dispensing with that organization's disappointing services. I want you just to glance at this. Pilbeam took the photograph and studied it deferentially. That, said Sir George, thrusting his fingers into the armholes of the pike waistcoat and speaking in the loud, bluff, honest voice of the man who was about to do some hard lying, is a photograph of a Miss miss as is always the way on these occasions he found himself utterly unable to think of a single name that sounded even remotely like the sort of name a girl would have mrs hammond stepped adroitly into the uncomfortable pause miss faraday she said brightly exactly said sir george relieved miss angela faraday the name pleased him and he repeated it. I want you, Pillbeam, to find that girl for me. She's the only daughter of a very old friend of mine. She left home recently, said Mrs. Hammond. Just so, said Sir George. Disappeared. In fact, said Mrs. Hammond, frankly, ran away. You see, Mr. Pillbeam, the poor child had only just recovered from a severe attack of influenza. You know how it is when you are recovering from influenza. Quite, murmured Pillbeam, quite. We think, said Sir George, feeling on solid ground once more, that she must have got amnesia. Yes, said Mrs. Hammond, there must be some reason like that to account for her staying away. There was no trouble at home, said Sir George. None, whatever. Don't imagine that for an instant. The girl was quite happy, perfectly happy and contented. Quite, said Pilbeam. He spoke with unruffled calm, but inwardly he was a tortured man. His memory for faces being excellent, 
he had recognized the photograph the moment it was handed to him as a very good likeness of roderick's fiancee that pretty girl the boss's niece who had called for roderick at the spice office a week or so ago and the realization that he had stumbled upon the most gorgeous scandal of his whole career and that there was no hope of being allowed to use it in the paper was the bitterest thing that had ever happened to him not even on the occasion when piqued by his persistent questioning as to the motives of his wife in suddenly removing herself to east uganda a large husband had kicked him down a full flight of stairs had percy pillbeam felt sadder you are a fellow who goes about a good deal said sir george i know that you have a sharp pair of eyes take that photograph pillbeam and see if you can't find that girl she must be somewhere i must ask you of course to treat the matter as entirely confidential quite quite that is all then very good sir george i would do my best and in regard to the other matter of which i spoke i will call on this man slingsby directly after lunch and see what i can find out just so and touching this business of miss um faraday you will of course charge to the office any expense in which you may be involved oh quite said pillbeam quite there was a ring in his voice which told his employer that in that side of the affair at any rate he might rely on him implicitly End of chapter eight the chase begins in the heart of the city of london's bustle and din some fifty yards to the east of leadenhall market there stands a small and dingy place of refreshment bearing over its door the name of pirandello in addition to alluring the public with its rich smell of mixed foods the restaurant keeps permanently in its window a dish containing a saintly-looking pig's head flanked by two tomatoes and a discouraged lettuce there are also cakes of dubious aspect scattered here and there through the glass you can see sad-eyed members of the borgia family in stained dress suits busily engaged in keeping up the ancient traditions of the clan in the narrow doorway of this establishment about three hours after pillbeam had left sir george pike's office in tilbury house bill west was standing with his young friend judson coker they were looking up and down the street with an air of expectancy you're sure this is the right place asked judson in a voice of melancholy the jaconda smile of that placid pig had begun to weigh upon his spirits it's what she said in her telegram pirandello's in leadenhall street very mysterious the whole thing said judson frowning at the pig ah said bill stepping from the doorway he had observed flick threading her way through the traffic from the other side of the street flick in marked contrast to judson seemed in the highest spirits she waved cheerily as she eluded a passing van she sprang onto the pavement with a gay leap so you got my wire that's splendid come in i'm hungry you you aren't going to lunch here said judson incredulously certainly it's a very good place henry recommended it strongly he always lunches here he said he would have treated me to-day only he's in conference with another man at blake's chop house henry said bill perplexed who's henry the office boy where i work bill and judson exchanged a bewildered glance where you work said judson where you work said bill yes that's what i've come to tell you about that's why i wired you to meet me here i've got a job as a stenographer at the london branch of the paradine pulp and paper company what i can't explain till i've had something to eat you idle rich don't realize it but working gives one an appetite they followed her dazedly into the restaurant 
a warm sweet-scented blast of air smote them as they entered flick sniffed smell the cocoa she said to judson doesn't it tantalize you she sat down at one of the marble-topped tables mr cocoa likes coker she said to bill i mean mr coker likes cocoa bill staring in astonishment at judson found the latter eyeing flick with the reproachful look of one who has been disappointed in a friend the light-hearted girl appeared unaware of his penetrating gaze she was busy with a waiter who accepted her order dejectedly and wrote it down on a grubby pad with a non-committal air as if disclaiming all responsibility there said flick when the lethal provender was on the table and they were alone once more now we can talk i chose this place because nobody's likely to come in here not unless they're dippy said judson gloomily poking cautiously at his plate bill who was less wrapped up in the matter of food than his fastidious friend was able to turn his mind to the extraordinary statement which flick had made a moment back you've got a job with slingsby he said marvelling what on earth for because i suspect that sinister man and i want to keep an eye on him what is this demanded judson who had now summoned up courage enough to swallow a mouthful i know it's paraffin but what have they put in it i don't understand when did you get this job this morning at about ten o'clock but how i just walked in and said i heard there was a vacancy for a stenographer how did you know there was mr coker told me so last night he spent the afternoon with mr slingsby there must be something awfully attractive about mr coker because mr slingsby simply wouldn't let him go would he eh said judson absently i said mr slingsby just kept you sitting in his office for hours yesterday didn't he i'm off that man for life said judson with sombre emphasis i have no use for him you see said flick mr coker thinks there's something wrong with him too we had a long talk last night she went on after you had gone off to write your letter and we came to the conclusion that mr slingsby is a thoroughly bad man what on earth made you think that flick sipped daintily at the odd muddy liquid which the management laughingly described as chocolate what would you think of a man who's probably got a salary of a thousand pounds a year or so and runs a winchester murphy car and lives in bruton street why shouldn't he live in bruton street asked bill mystified his knowledge of london was small bruton street berkeley square said flick you have to be pretty rich to live there anyhow you want a good deal more than a thousand a year but slingsby goes in for theatrical ventures he told me so he probably makes a lot out of those well how did he get the money to go in for theatrical ventures it's no use arguing the man is a crook he must be apart from anything else he had a black eye when i called on him this morning a man like that said judson in a hard voice is bound to get a black eye sooner or later i wish i had given it him a black eye what do you mean just what i say now do honest men get black eyes of course they don't and besides anybody could tell that he wasn't straight just by looking at him that man's a scoundrel of the worst and lowest description said judson how do you know said bill never mind said judson darkly i have my reasons he pushed away his plate and nibbled in a disheartened way at a roll bill turned to flick again tell me exactly what happened he said all right said flick i lay awake in bed last night for ever so long thinking over what mr coker had told me 
about Bruton Street and the car, you know. And the longer I thought, the fishier it looked. And then I remembered that Mr. Coker had also said that when he called at the office yesterday, Mr. Slingsby was in a bad temper because he had just got rid of his stenographer. It occurred to me that if I called early enough in the morning, I might get there before he had sent out to some agency for another. And luckily, I did. I saw Mr. Slingsby, and he engaged me at once. Didn't ask for references or anything. To Bill though he had little knowledge of what was the customary ceremonial that led up to the engaging of stenographers this seemed somewhat unusual surely he felt the proceedings were not always so rapid as that the fact was mr slingsby had happened to be in a frame of mind that morning when his ideal of feminine attractiveness was something differing in every respect from miss prudence striker and Flick's fair slimness, so opposite to the brunette heftiness of that militant lady, had soothed him on the instant. She would have had to be a far less efficient stenographer to fail to secure the post. "'Well, there I was,' said Flick. He told me to start right in, so I started right in. There's a nice old clerk in the office who has been there for years and years— he was under three other managers before Mr. Slingsby, and it wasn't long before he was talking to me about the terrible state of the business now, as compared with the dear old days. I suppose I encouraged him a little, but he gave me the impression of being the sort of man who would have confided in anyone who was ready to listen. I found out all sorts of things. She purred triumphantly over her chocolate bill in spite of his sturdy belief that this was all nonsense and that the well-meaning girl had started off on the wildest of wild goose chases could not help being interested as he sat there thinking another aspect of the matter struck him but look here he said why are you doing all this going to all this trouble i mean flick looked up with that swift kitten look of hers there was something odd in her expression which puzzled Bill. "'Why shouldn't I go to a little trouble to help you?' she said. "'We're pals, aren't we?' There was a silence. For the briefest moment Bill was conscious of a curious feeling, as if the atmosphere had become suddenly charged with something electric. There had been a look in Flick's eyes as they met his for an instant that perplexed him, he felt that he hovered on the brink of some strange revelation. Then the spell was shattered by Judson. "'I want the body,' said Judson, who had seemed plunged in a deep coma for the past few minutes, "'to be sent to my people in New York.' Flick's seriousness vanished as quickly as it had come. She laughed. "'What a fuss you are making!' she said i shan't take you out to lunch again in a hurry the food's perfectly good look how i'm eating mine women are extraordinary said judson refusing to be cheered they must have cast-iron insides don't be indelicate mr coker remember there are gentlemen present i've seen my sister alice wolf with obvious relish said judson stuff what would kill a strong man a woman's idea of lunch is tomain germs washed down with tea and iced lemonade the mention of the absent miss coker had the effect of producing another momentary silence but almost immediately flick hurried on i was telling you about this old clerk she said he seemed to have the worst opinion of Mr. Slingsby as a business man. I can't remember all he said, but one thing did strike me as curious. He told me that almost all the wood pulp is being sold at prices which allow only the smallest profit to Mr. Paradine, to a firm named Higgins and Bennett. Well, said Bill. Well, said Flick, doesn't that seem odd to you? only the smallest profit but you don't understand that's just what slingsby was talking about at lunch that day 
business conditions nonsense said flick decidedly it's fishy and you know it is because he told me something else he said that a letter had come from a firm offering a much higher price than higgins and bennett and that he had particularly noticed that no deal for this had been entered in the contract book showing that for some reason or other mr slingsby had refused the offer what do you think of that it does sound queer i'm glad you admit it sounds very queer to me and i'm going to keep my eyes open and now i think you had better be escorting me back to my office or i shall be getting dismissed on my first day henry tells me three-quarters of an hour is the official time for lunch bill was thoughtful as they walked towards st mary axe a simple-minded young man he found these puzzles uncongenial and suddenly another disturbing thought struck him look here he said is it safe for you to be round these parts aren't you apt to run into somebody you know of course not uncle george never comes into the city i'm as safe here as i am in battersea oh well that's all right i was only wondering they stopped at the entrance of the building on the third floor of which the paradine pulp and paper company had its offices and as they stood there a young man in a vivid check suit came out a small young man with close-set eyes and the scenario of a moustache he was walking rapidly and in so preoccupied a condition that he almost cannoned into flick i beg your pardon he said flick smiled forgivingly and turned to bill good-bye she said good-bye mr coker good-bye said judson you'll be coming to dinner to-night of course flick entered the building and started to climb the stairs the young man in the check suit who had been tying his shoe-lace straightened himself and followed her he moved cautiously like a leopard this stupendous stroke of luck coming so unexpectedly out of a blue sky had for a moment almost unmanned percy pillbeam he had recognized flick the instant he saw her and that feeling that comes to all of us at times of a mysterious power benevolently guiding our movements flooded over him if he had terminated his interview with mr slingsby two minutes sooner and mr slingsby's attitude and behavior on being questioned about last night's affray had given him every excuse to do so he would have missed the girl as it was everything was working out with the most perfect smoothness though he had recognized her flick he was certain had not recognized him she was entirely unaware that she was being trailed the only thing he had to do was to ascertain where she was going and if she intended to stay there long and then to send word to sir george pike to come and get her warily he tiptoed after her up the stairs they reached the first floor they reached the second they reached the third and pillbeam peering with infinite caution saw the girl pass through the door he had so recently left the window of which bore the legend paradine pulp and paper company it was now necessary only to wait and see if she was paying a brief visit or if she intended to remain pillbeam camped on the stairs and the minutes went by when a reasonable period of time had passed without any sign of flick he hurried downstairs in the doorway he paused and scribbled a note this he gave with a shilling to a passing boy then he stationed himself in the doorway to await sir george's arrival in assuming so complacently that flick had not recognized him percy pillbeam had made a tactical blunder it is true that in the first moment of their meeting he had seemed a stranger but suddenly as she started to mount the stairs her subconscious mind which after the helpful habit of subconscious minds had been working all the time on its own account sounded an alarm vaguely 
in a nebulous uncertain fashion she began to feel that somewhere at some time she had seen this check-suited young man before but where and when she had just reached the second floor when memory leaped into life as if she had touched a spring it was in roderick's office the day when she had called to take roderick out to tea that ever to be remembered day when all the trouble had started this was the man pillbeam wasn't that his name who assisted roderick in the control of society spice it was lucky that this illumination came to flick with such a startling abruptness for this very abruptness had all the effect of a physical shock it actually jerked her head sideways as if it had been a blow and so it came about that out of the corner of her eye she was enabled to see her pursuer just a moment before he made one of his wary slidings into the shadows on the staircase an instant later and she would have missed him she gave a little gasp of all the unpleasant sensations that can attack us in this world one of the least agreeable is the feeling of being hunted a brief flurry of panic shook flick then pulling herself together she went on up the stairs peril quickens the wit and she had thought of a plan of action the success of this plan depended entirely on whether that other door in mr slingsby's private office a door whose existence she had completely forgotten until her subconscious mind that admirable assistant now presented a picture of it for her inspection led anywhere it might of course be merely the entrance to a cupboard in which case she was trapped but hope seemed to whisper that a man of wilford slingsby's evil mind a man who got black eyes and sold wood pulp cheap to higgins and bennett when he could have disposed of it more advantageously elsewhere would be extremely likely to select for his office a room with a bolt hole for use in case of emergency she entered the office with a high heart a loud and angry voice proceeding through the door had warned her before she turned the handle that a disturbed atmosphere prevailed within she found mr slingsby in a state of effervescing fury engaged in a passionate passage with henry the office boy one cannot altogether blame wilford slingsby for his lack of self-control his unfortunate encounter with miss prudence stryker at mario's restaurant overnight had brought him to the office in a mood of extreme edginess and when a good lunch had to some extent pulled him round he had been plunged into the depths once more by the totally unforeseen intrusion of mr percy pillbeam these things upset a man and render an office boy's whistling more than ordinarily disturbing to the nerves the consequence was that henry a dreamy youth who was apt to forget his surroundings when he became absorbed in his work had secretly got half-way through the latest song hit before something that seemed for an instant like a charge of cavalry shot out of the private office and the next moment young master smith henry was one of the smiths of somerstown was being told things about himself which even the companions of his leisure hours and they were a candid and free-speaking band had never thought of saying mr slingsby roused had a large vocabulary and henry was getting nearly all of it the instinct of self-preservation rules us all flick though their acquaintance had been so brief was fond of henry and had her own affairs been less pressing might have attempted to create a diversion as it was she merely welcomed the fact that mr slingsby was busy outside of his private office and walked into that sanctum without a pause and there was the second door beckoning her flick opened this second door and thrilled with exquisite relief it was not a cupboard the door led into a passage the passage in its turn led to a flight of stairs the stairs led into a small dark courtyard full of boxes and barrels and the courtyard after she had threaded her way among these obstacles proved to lead into a street 
flick reached this street and hurrying down it without a backward look left the employment of the paradine pulp and paper company for ever a matter of half an hour or so after flick's departure a cab stopped at the main entrance of the building and sir george pike sprang out pillbeam leaving his doorway advanced gambling about him like a faithful dog where is she in here demanded sir george a man of few words quite said pillbeam a man of fewer they entered the building pillbeam explaining as they climbed the stairs the events that had led up to this tense situation events which he had neither time nor space to record in his brief note you're sure it was the right girl quite now what in the world mused sir george as they halted outside the door could the fool of a girl be doing here pillbeam baffled by the same problem forbore to speculate they went into the office a meek and chastened henry took sir george's card into the inner room where mr slingsby outwardly calm once more but inwardly still a mere volcano scrutinized it captiously who's this dunno sir what's he want dunno sir well show him in blast him said mr slingsby forcefully we have already seen wilfred slingsby considerably persecuted by fate but even in the brief interval which has elapsed since his last appearance another blow had befallen him on top of all the prudence strikers percy pillbeams and whistling henry's that had recently made life so hard to bear he had now discovered that his stenographer had mysteriously disappeared at just the time when he needed her assistance most there were a number of important letters waiting to be dictated and if the plight of a man all dressed up and having no place to go is bad that of one full of dictation with nobody to dictate it to is hardly less enviable small wonder that the world looked black to wilfred slingsby the episode of the vanishing stenographer as mr slingsby would have called it if he had been a writer of detective stories had that quality of utter and insane inexplicability which makes a man moan feebly and stick straws in his hair he had with his own eyes seen her come in and now she simply was not the thing got right in amongst wilfred slingsby's nerve centres and just as he was feeling that he could stand no more he saw sailing in in the wake of sir george the loathly figure of young pillbeam it is a curious phenomenon which can be vouched for by any one who has ever boiled an egg that a slight increase of provocation added to a bubbling fury produces a condition strangely resembling calm the water which has hissed and shrieked in the saucepan seems to subside almost phlegmatically when it reaches the boiling point it was so with mr slingsby now the sight of pillbeam seemed to produce in him a kind of frozen inertness with his unblacked eye he looked venomously at his visitors but he did not spring from his chair and bite them in the leg and though his fingers closed for an instant on the large ink-pot on his desk he released it again pillbeam did the honours this is sir george pike of the mammoth publishing company mr slingsby he said do you publish society spice asked mr slingsby in a dull voice among a great number of other papers replied sir george with a touch of pomposity ah said mr slingsby he toyed with the ink-pot once more but again relaxed his grasp pillbeam proceeded briskly to business he had had a word with the elderly clerk in the outer office while waiting and ascertained the reason for flick's presence in this place we have just discovered he said that your stenographer is the daughter of an old friend of sir george's mr slingsby she recently left home amnesia said sir george 
quite said pillbeam indeed said wilfred slingsby still in the grip of that sinister calm sir george glared impressively he intended to stand no nonsense from this man mr slingsby's black eye and the knowledge of how it had been acquired had made an unfavourable impression i have come to take her back to her home oh have you the poor girl is in an unfit state to be wandering about alone oh is she and so said sir george imperiously i should be obliged mr slingsby if you would produce her wilfred slingsby his mind working with cold swiftness during these exchanges began now to see his way to getting a bit a small bit but nevertheless a bit of his own back he forced a winning smile into his bleak face i should be only too glad to produce her as you put it but she is not here she came in here exactly and went away again she said she had a headache and wanted to go home so i let her off for the afternoon but i've been watching the door and she didn't go out said pillbeam keenly yes said sir george how do you account for that you are at liberty said mr slingsby to search the premises if you wish here are the keys of the safe and the drawers of this desk are not locked the waste paper basket as you see is empty i imagine he continued for the solution of the puzzle which had been vexing him had now presented itself that she went out by that door there which leads to another exit by now i expect she is well on her way home what is her address seven paradise walk earlsfield said mr slingsby promptly the locality had not been selected by him at random paradise walk earlsfield was he knew in a particularly unpleasant part of london and had in addition been quite recently the scene of a rather unusually spectacular murder mr slingsby was not without a faint hope that the inhabitants if given to that sort of thing and having nothing better on their hands might turn their talent for slaughter in the direction of his visitors thank you said sir george not at all said mr slingsby much obliged said pillbeam don't mention it said mr slingsby the visitors picked up their hats as the door closed behind them there came into mr slingsby's drawn face something almost resembling a smile of happiness End of chapter nine the chase continues the callousness of nature in times of human suffering has been commented on so often by poets and others that it has become a truism if nature had possessed a heart the day following that on which sir george pike and his young assistant had visited the office of mr wilfred slingsby would have been one of dark clouds and weeping skies as it was it reached a level of bright serenity that had not been equalled in london since the summer of the previous year tilbury street whose inhabitants still seemed to be boiling cabbage as if their lives depended on it stewed in the sunshine so that horses drooped their heads and strong men went gaspingly about their work counting the minutes till the pubs should open the pavement in front of tilbury house was all inlaid with patines of bright gold and sparrows revelling in the warmth chirped merrily as they lunched in the gutters in a word all nature smiled nevertheless as has been suggested by our opening remarks there were aching hearts in tilbury street hearts to which the glorious weather brought no balm chief among these was that of percy pillbeam he sat in the office of society spice in that dismal half-hour that precedes luncheon brooding miserably of all sad words of tongue or pen the saddest are these it might have been and the thought of how narrowly he had missed pulling off the coup of a lifetime 
gnawed at pillbeam's vitals like a vulture if only flick had proved less elusive what a triumph would have been his sir george would have showered commendation upon him and what is more could hardly in decency have avoided giving him a handsome rise of salary instead of which it is a defect in the characters of napoleonic men that they are apt to demand from their subordinates success and nothing but success to come within an ace of triumph advances the subordinates stock not at all indeed it rather depreciates it pillbeam realized that he would now be standing considerably higher in sir george's esteem if he had never got on flick's trail at all his employer had exhibited a disquieting disposition to blame him for everything that had happened number seven paradise walk earlsfield had proved when reached after a long and expensive journey in a taxicab to be an evil-smelling bird and snake shop owned by a dirty and cheerful old man with gray whiskers and a skull-cap who had proceeded to answer their inquiries for flick by urging them to examine his stock with a view to purchase sir george had read into the man's words a suspicious evasiveness and it had been his idea that they should sit down and wait the memory of that vigil had seared pillbeam's soul deeply and the recollection of the long green snake which he had suddenly found nestling in his lap was destined to haunt him for many days eventually the realization that mr slingsby in his low fashion had sent them to a false address had dawned upon them both at about the same time and they had gone away pursued to the last by the owner of the shop who wanted to do a sacrifice deal on a parrot the last they had seen of him before threading their way through the local murderers and starting back to civilization he was standing in the street with the parrot on his shoulder doing some spirited price-cutting it was just about this point that sir george had become peevish pillbeam sighed it was hard that he should be blamed for what was none of his fault sir george's statement that he ought to have had the sense to know that a man like slingsby with one eye black and the other gleaming with the light of pure deceit would naturally send them to the wrong address struck him as unjust still there it was he had failed and he was suffering the penalty always meted out to failure in tilbury house he had just begun to busy himself with the revision of an article on plague spots of the west end he was alone in the office to-day roderick being absent with a cold in the head when a boy in buttons entered bearing a form jem to see you sir pillbeam took the form listlessly his sufferings had had the effect of subduing his normal pep and ginger and for a moment so greatly did he desire solitude in his hour of travail he had the churlish intention of telling the boy to say that he was out then his eye fell on the name written on the paper in his hand judson coker something stirred at the back of pillbeam's mind coker why was that name vaguely familiar coker why were those two simple syllables somehow oddly significant coker where had he heard he gasped awed by the sudden suspicion of a terrific possibility now he knew where he had heard the name before good-bye mr coker they were the last words that infernal girl for so he was now unchivalrously accustomed to think of flick had spoken before going into her office building good-bye mr coker he remembered it distinctly and then he had asked her if she would be coming to dinner and she had said of course what could this mean but that she was in the habit of visiting this coker so frequently that her presence at his dinner table had become a matter of routine what sort of a looking fellow is he 
he cried. The boy in buttons seemed perplexed. It was not usual for the editorial staff of Society Spice to demand word portraits of visitors. A kind of bloke? he said vaguely. Pillbeam perceived that to continue examining this unprofitable witness would be wasting time. The thing to do was to have the fellow up and inspect him face to face. Unusual as the name Coker was, he dared not allow himself to hope that this could be the same man. That would be too much like a miracle. Yet, as he waited, nervously pulling at his small moustache, he could not keep himself from hoping, and when the door opened and Judson was ushered in, he saw with a pang of excitement which seemed to stop his heart beating that his hope had been fulfilled. The million to one chance had come off. This was the fellow he had seen yesterday in St. Mary Axe. Come in, come in, he cried ecstatically. Do take a seat, won't you? thanks said judson a little surprised at this cordiality but rendered by it distinctly happier it began to look to judson as though his mission was to be plain sailing it was the story which flick had told on visiting marmont mansions on the previous evening that had brought judson coker to-day to the office of society spice flick's description of pillbeam's pursuit and how she had eluded it had been spirited and absorbing but though all of it had interested him the point that interested him most had been the revelation that roderick was not the only official in charge of things at the spice office his knowledge of the inner workings of weekly paper offices was slight and he had assumed until now that the only person to whom he could apply for a correction of that paragraph about toddy von reiter and the silks was the fellow who had batted bill west over the head with his stick obviously a man of the worst and one from whom it would be hopeless to seek justice the discovery that roderick had a partner altered the whole aspect of the affair he had come here of course in a spirit of the utmost weariness and caution very much on his guard judson was on no account he realized must he let fall a word that would establish in the mind of this man a connection between himself and flick pillbeam he understood from flick's narrative was acting as a sort of amateur bloodhound as far as she was concerned it caused judson a faint amusement as he sat down to reflect what a lot this man would give to know that he lived in a flat to which the girl he was hunting came every night for dinner what did you want to see me about asked pillbeam well it's like this judson began you had a piece in your paper a couple of weeks ago pillbeam looked at his watch i didn't know it was so late he said you haven't lunched yet have you no said judson thrilled from head to foot by a sudden spasm of hope in his wildest dreams he had never foreseen a bit of luck like this how about coming out and having a bite i can see you've got all sorts of interesting things to tell me and we can talk better at lunch so we can said judson enthusiastically so we can you're american aren't you said pillbeam yes then we'll go to the cheshire cheese you must see the cheshire cheese you aren't a teetotaler by any chance no said judson vehemently i only asked because they have some rather special port port whispered judson tawny port judson's eyes closed for a moment in a prayerful ecstasy lead me to it he said in a low reverent voice it is strange how the views of different people concerning any given individual can differ there were men in london dozens of them who heartily disliked percy pillbeam if you had asked wilfred slingsby what he thought of the young man behind society spice it would have taken him ten minutes to reply and scarcely a word of his remarks would have been printable 
yet judson coker found him one of the most delightful fellows he had ever met the cheshire cheese that historic tavern pleased judson immensely its old associations it is true made but small appeal to him and he was only tepidly interested in dr johnson's chair but the lark steak and kidney pudding that famous specialty of the house went with a bang from start to finish washed down with tankards of old ale it appealed to all that was best and deepest in judson by the time the tawny port arrived he was in a mood so mellowed that it was difficult for him to realize that the man with the slightly blurred outline sitting opposite him had not been a trusted friend since the days of boyhood besides apart altogether from the port and the old ale pilbeam had endeared himself to judson by his thoroughly sympathetic and understanding attitude in the matter of that silks article it was unforgivable declared pilbeam warmly that such a mistake should have occurred but a man of the world like judson would understand how hard it was to keep a paper like society spice free from these occasional errors of course they would creep in from time to time exactly but it should be corrected in the very next issue awfully good of you said judson not at all not at all said pilbeam oh but it is no no oh but it is not a bit oh but it is but it does but it is insisted judson with enthusiasm he drained his glass and gazed with goggle-eyed affection at this obliging man whom he liked he was now convinced quite a good deal better than any one else in the world i'll write an article myself said pilbeam putting the matter straight and look here we don't want any more mistakes i'd better send you proofs how's that proofs no sir judson waved his hand in a wide and generous gesture don't want any proofs take your word for it proofs of the article explained pilbeam gently so that you can see it before it appears oh ah where shall i send it nine marmot mansions battersea right said pilbeam and now he went on for triumph had made him kindly tell me all about the fifth avenue silks you must have had a great time i can't think how you ever happened to get the idea it was a flushed and uplifted pilbeam who parted from judson outside the cheshire cheese at a few minutes after two and made his way with great strides down fleet street to tilbury house the sight of sir george's limousine drawn up at the curb told him that his employer had returned from lunch he went straight up to the office on the fourth floor well said sir george his manner was distant but pilbeam had been prepared for a cold reception he would he told himself soon thaw the ice i have great news sir george i have found out where we can make inquiries of miss there was an uncomfortable pause pilbeam had forgotten the name and so had sir george the latter after a moment of swift thinking decided on candour perhaps i had better tell you pilbeam i am sure that you will treat the information in the strictest confidence quite the girl is my niece is that so said pilbeam trying to inject a sharp amazement into his voice my niece repeated sir george with gloomy impressiveness it makes me all the happier that i have found her said pilbeam devoutly found her well amended pilbeam found the place which she seems to be visiting every day he told his story with the crisp expertness of one accustomed to squashing the vice of a great city into a column and a quarter sir george listened rapt pilbeam 
he said i knew all along that i could rely on you it is very kind of you to say so sir george i train my young men to be bright and you are the brightest of them all you may take this note to the cashier i will said pillbeam fervently pocketing the slip of paper thank you sir george rose i shall go at once to this marmont mansions you speak of i shall see this man coker i don't think he will be in for some time said pillbeam when i left him he was saying something about going and having a nap in the park then i will wait for him and when i see him said sir george portentously i shall stand no nonsense a powerful car was standing outside marmont mansions when sir george pike arrived at the storm centre beside it one foot on the running board a pleasant-faced young man of impressive physique smoked a cigarette this young man watched sir george as he alighted and approached he had no recollection of ever having seen sir george before nor did his appearance seem in any way familiar to the older man yet they had met and in dramatic circumstances sir george was peering up at the building his chauffeur had told him that this was marmont mansions but there was no name over the door to prove it he decided to seek a further opinion i am looking for marmont mansions battersea right here said the young man agreeably thank you not at all nice day very said sir george he passed through the doorway the young man who seemed to be expecting someone resumed his vigil presently he smiled and waved his hand a girl in a floppy and unbecoming sealskin coat was advancing briskly along the pavement sir george's chauffeur sitting stolidly at his wheel a few yards down the street eyed her with approval he had a nice taste in female beauty and not even the sealskin coat could hide the fact that flick was an unusually pretty girl here i am said flick haven't i been quick what do you think of the coat fine said bill it isn't it's awful but it was the only thing i could get that was warm enough i borrowed it from my landlady she climbed into the car and settled herself cosily the idea of hiring a car and taking flick for a drive out into the country had come to bill as a luminous inspiration while they lunched together in the neighbourhood of shaftesbury avenue a locality which seemed well outside the danger zone haunted by sir george pike and his minions the fineness of the day had not escaped their notice and they had decided that it would be unwise to waste it bill moreover being a young man used to the possession of a car of his own had been experiencing for some days that restless and starved sensation which comes to habitual motorists whose motoring is cut off for any long period his fingers itched to close themselves over a wheel again and he had sent flick off to her lodgings to borrow a warm coat while he negotiated for the hire of a car for the afternoon he climbed in after her where would you like to go it's lovely out at hindhead all right how do you get there and of course anywhere down on the river is wonderful well you choose but they were destined to go that afternoon neither to hindhead's majestic heights nor to any silvery reach of old thames while flick was still trying to make her choice the decision was taken out of her hands bill leaning back in a restful attitude was startled by a little squeak of dismay and looking up saw that she was staring with round and horrified eyes at something beyond him turning his head he perceived that the stout man who had asked him for marmont mansions had returned and was coming out of the doorway quick gasped flick oh be quick bill was quick though not an abnormally intelligent young man he gathered that this was no time for waiting and asking questions he started the car without a word and they began to glide off and as they did so the stout man uttered a sharp bellow and became a thing of leaping activity 
the reappearance of sir george at this point was due to the fact that he had got tired of ringing the bell of number nine there appeared to be nobody at home and he had decided that it would be more comfortable to wait and he intended to wait for hours if necessary down below in his limousine the sight of flick seemed to him as it had seemed to percy pilbeam twenty-four hours earlier direct evidence that providence looks after the righteous it was only when he saw her being borne rapidly away from him that he realized that his position was not so advantageous as he had supposed in this crisis sir george lost his head he shouted uselessly he galloped along the pavement not until bill's car was twenty yards away and moving swiftly westward along the prince of wales road did it occur to him that he too had a car and that the pursuit could be conducted far more agreeably on wheels than afoot he waved like a semaphore to his chauffeur hi hi he shouted here hi briggs come on you fool the chauffeur blandly unemotional stepped with dignity on his self-starter he drew up beside his fermenting employer sir george sprang in and gesticulated with both hands in the direction of albert road the corner of which bill and his companion had just turned at a high rate of speed uh, uh, gurgled sir george the chauffeur touched his cap aloofly he gathered that his employer wished him to pursue the other car but he was not thrilled it took more than this sort of thing to excite augustus briggs that was uncle george said flick bill had deduced as much he nodded and glanced over his shoulder it still is he replied briefly and drove his foot down on the accelerator they whirred over the albert bridge End of chapter 10The chase ends. Once started in flight, the human instinct is to keep on running. It was not immediately, therefore, that Bill recovered from the first stark desire to be elsewhere as quickly as possible, and began to turn on to the situation the searchlight of clear reason. For perhaps ten minutes or a quarter of an hour, his faculties were entirely occupied with the desire to shake off pursuit, and with this end in view he kept his large foot firmly on the accelerator, and paid only the most meagre attention to the hurriedly expressed criticisms of the various traffic policemen dotted here and there about the winding route. If he had a thought outside the bare, primitive craving for speed, it was a feeling of relief that he had taken the trouble to hire from the garage a really good car it was as if some presentiment had warned him not to accept the quaint old relics which they had offered him at the start of the negotiations but to hold out firmly and coldly till they produced a real hummer his motorist's eye had told him after one glance at the engines that this was a car of quality and events were proving his judgment sound with a smooth and effortless efficiency it was eating up the asphalt like a racer they snapped across chelsea embankment purred up oakley street and turning to the left at the fulham road began though bill was not aware of it to cover the same ground which he and judson had gone over that night when they had followed roderick to wimbledon common in putney high street they were enabled to draw away for a while for the limousine to sir george's manifest discomposure though briggs the chauffeur accepted the blow with wooden calm got itself blocked by a brewer's dray just across the bridge whereupon bill dexterously imitating the ingenious tactics of the hunted hare turned down lacy road into charlwood road turned again into felsham road and so doubling on his tracks crossed putney bridge once more and bowled along the fulham palace road to emerge finally into the bustle of king street hammersmith it was a manoeuvre which might well have settled the issue but augustus briggs for all his woodenness was an astute fellow 
and looking over his shoulder as they reached hammersmith station bill was annoyed to perceive the limousine swerving lithely round a truck still in the game it was at this point that he began to examine the situation what on earth is this all about he asked it's uncle george i know but what are we running away for because i don't want him to catch us why not the question deprived flick momentarily of speech bill filled the hiatus in the conversation by dodging an omnibus and turning sharp to the left up addison road what do you mean said flick astonished well said bill skilfully avoiding manslaughter with a quick twist of the wheel what can he do if he does catch us it had begun to irk his haughty spirit this headlong flight from a little man with a double chin whom he could have destroyed with a finger he would have guaranteed if challenged to mortal combat to clean up sir george and briggs the chauffeur too inside a couple of minutes in the vivid phrase of mr isaac bullet he could butter the pavement with them both yet here he was fleeing like the wicked man in the psalms permitting himself to be chivied by these persons all over london the pride of the west put up a strong protest what on earth can he do he demanded again he can't tie you up and drag you home against your will i know said flick it's just that i can't face him why not persisted bill just contriving to avoid diminishing the juvenile population of ladbroke grove by one you don't know uncle george said flick shaking her head he's such a compelling sort of man so frightfully sort of hypnotic oh come protested bill well you know what i mean he glares at you and tells you to do things and you just do them when he looks at me i always feel like a rabbit and a snake how do you mean you feel like a rabbit and a snake said bill puzzled well you know sort of hypnotized i'm sure if my door hadn't been locked that night and he had been able to come in and glare at me i should have lost my nerve altogether and come meekly down to dinner instead of running away if he catches us i know exactly what will happen i shall have to go back with him nonsense be a man well that's how i feel bill was in many ways a simple soul but he had lived long enough in this world to know that a woman's whims have to be respected however apparently absurd to the view of the more earthy male and in a dim way he could follow flick and understand her position until he had got used to him he had found ridgeway his late manservant affecting him in rather the same fashion ridgeway had had quiet but decided views on ties and hats and many a time bill remembered he had had his way in these matters sternly overriding the preferences of the man who paid him his wages one cannot argue about personality its compelling power has to be accepted as a fact if flick felt like that about her uncle george and shrank so timorously from the prospect of meeting him then uncle george must be shaken off if it took the last drop of petrol in the tank he pulled the wheel round and they shot away in an easterly direction and from this point the affair took on a dreamlike aspect which precluded coherent thought bill had no notion where he was going like the heroine of a melodrama he was lost in london his simple policy was to take any road which looked smooth and fairly empty and to skim down it till he came to another road possessing the same desirable qualities and always the limousine followed it was impossible to get away from it in the traffic and bill yearned for the open country 
and suddenly when he had least expected it the houses began to thin and he was thrilled by the discovery that there really was an end to this sprawling city after all so sedulously had bill twisted retwisted and kept on twisting his steering wheel that though he had started out along the portsmouth road he was now heading for hertfordshire and presently london with its tram lines and traffic was left behind and they were out on the open road now said bill teeth grimly set we'll show em although this car of his was but a hired one he had come in the course of this stern chase to love it like a son it was a beautiful car obviously only recently tuned up by expert hands and what it needed to give of its best was just such a broad highway as now lay before it tram lines and traffic fret and hamper a car of spirit what it craves is space this it had now got and the roar of the engines as bill pressed down his foot sounded like a joyful cheering the needle on the indicator crept up to forty then swiftly to forty-five laugh this off growled bill over his shoulder at the pursuing limousine it was as if augustus briggs had heard the provocative words he did not attempt to laugh it off for he was a chauffeur and by the rules of his guild not allowed anything beyond a faint smile at the corner of his mouth but he did indulge for an instant in this faint smile the idea of a cardinal six for such he perceived bill's car to be attempting to give the dust to his own peerless brown windsor excited in him an almost jovial contempt and so sudden was the bound which the limousine made as he opened the throttle that a hen down the road which had planned to make a leisurely crossing saved its valuable life only by a frenzied leap in the last split second and so going nicely they passed through new barnet hadleywood potter's bar and south mims and came to the town of hatfield and it was outside hatfield just before you come to brocket hall that the long long trail reached its abrupt end bill had not been unaware of the new touch of grimness added to the chase he had noted the chauffeur's spurt and had answered it by putting his needle up into the fifties but now a chill feeling of impending defeat had begun to lower his mood of exultation something seemed to tell him that the car behind had just that extra turn of speed which was going to make all the difference sticking doggedly however to his guns he was endeavouring to urge the cardinal six to a gate which its maker had never contemplated when the disaster occurred which subconsciously he had been anticipating all the time there was a sudden loud report the cardinal six swerved madly across the road nearly jerking the wheel out of his hands and when he had managed to get it into control he was made aware by a harsh bumping that the worst had happened at the very tensest stage of the race he had been put out of the running by a burst tire the tragedy had taken place almost immediately opposite the neat little gate of a neat little house standing back from the road behind the shelter of a quickset hedge bill brought the car to a stop and looked behind him the limousine a couple of hundred yards in the rear was coming up like a galleon under sail he grasped flick's arm it was a moment for swift action come on he cried and jumping out they ran through the gate the garden in which they found themselves was one of those beautifully trim preserves whose every leaf and petal speaks eloquently of a loving proprietor neat little sticks supported neat little plants neat little gravel paths ran between neat little flower-beds 
it was the sort of garden from which snails wandering in with a carefree nonchalance withdrew abashed blushing and walking backwards realizing that they are on holy ground and it should have affected bill and flick those human intruders with the same self-conscious awe but bill and flick were in a hurry and when we are in a hurry we forget our better selves in such a maze of flower-beds it was obviously impossible to keep to the paths taking flick's hand bill raced diagonally across country to where a shrubbery seemed to offer at least a temporary refuge from a window on the ground floor an agonized purple face glared at them with an expression of pure hatred two frenzied hands beat madly on the pane a protesting wail like that of a tortured demon came to their ears muffled but awesome they stopped for neither apologies nor explanations hand in hand they trampled over the beds and were in the shrubbery there they halted panting and presently observed shooting in at the gate the projectile-like form of sir george sir george pike had marked with a stern triumph the accident that had checked the cardinal six it had seemed to him like retribution overtaking the wicked so greatly did it stimulate him that he yielded once again to that overmastering impetuosity of his and instead of waiting to be driven up to the gate banged imperiously on the glass and bounded from the limousine while still a good twenty yards down the road the long period of physical inaction had told upon his nerves and he was impatient to be up and doing as quickly as his little legs would carry him he scuttled along the hedge and bolted in at the gate he was halfway across the flower beds following the clearly defined track of his quarry in the mould when a roar so loud and anguished that it compelled attention brought him to a momentary halt stop you what the devil do you think you're doing you dash 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 you he perceived a large mauve-faced individual in golfing costume gesticulating forcefully from the steps of the house dash 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 added this person driving home his point so great was sir george's absorption in the business in hand that it is doubtful whether mere words however eloquent would have stopped him for long the speaker had used two adjectives and a verb which he had never heard before but it was not the desire to pause and inquire into the meaning of these that caused him to remain what rooted him to the spot was the sudden appearance from behind some bushes of a second man in corduroy trousers and the thing about this second man that so compelled respect was the fact that he carried a large and dangerous-looking pitchfork and as if this were not enough was accompanied by a weedy dog of raffish aspect which now trotted up and began to sniff in a strong silent way at sir george's calves sir george looked at the dog and the dog using one rolling reddish eye for the purpose looked at sir george he could never even with his face in repose have been a handsome dog and now his appearance was made definitely repellent by a slightly updrawn lip revealing a large white tooth pressing as his engagements were sir george decided to linger the man in the golf suit came up dash dash he began enriching sir george's vocabulary with a new noun the owner of the neat little house and garden though he looked and behaved like a retired indian colonel of the old school was in reality no such thing but technically a man of peace 
he was in fact no other than montague grayson the well-known writer of sunny and optimistic novels and it would have been a distinct shock to his large public could they have beheld him in his present frame of mind and yet had they known all the facts they could hardly have denied that his wrath was justified if there is one thing that wakes the fiend which sleeps in us all it is getting stuck in the big chapter of a sunny and optimistic novel for nearly three hours montague grayson had been writhing in his study like a lost soul trying to inject whimsical humour and gentle pathos into the pivotal scene of his new book and when looking out of the window for the hundredth time he saw flick and bill ploughing through his beloved flower-beds all the hatred which he had been feeling towards his hero and heroine became instantly diverted to them he had not thought it possible to dislike any human beings so much until coming out of the house and catching sight of sir george he realized that what he had felt for flick and bill had been but a pale imitation of the real thing if montague grayson had been a dante he would have gone straight off and started writing a new inferno in which sir george would have occupied a position in the middle of the innermost of the seven hells as it was he contented himself with bounding out into the garden his bosom seething with that perilous stuff that weighs upon the soul dash you sir dash and dash you bellowed the ex sunny and optimistic man brooding over sir george like a thundercloud it should be mentioned here in further extenuation of mr grayson's peevishness that he had had a bad morning's golf what the dash do you think you're doing sir george drew himself up with what dignity he could muster painfully conscious of the dog which was plainly waiting only for a word of encouragement from the man up top before starting to give free play to his worst nature my niece he began you come trespassing in here trampling on my flower beds i am sorry what's the good of being sorry i should explain that my niece i've a good mind to shred you up and sprinkle you under the rose bushes the man with the pitchfork an enthusiast in any scheme that made for the good of his flowers nodded silent approval of this plan the dog breathed asthmatically if you will allow me to explain sir explain what possible explanation can there be it's an outrage i look at those beds covered with your beastly hoof marks my niece to bill and flick lurking in the shrubbery only the author's portion of this dialogue had been audible but that had been enough to send them creeping onward through the bushes with all the speed that they could command a respect for other people's property is deep-seated in most of us and already the heinousness of the crime that they had committed was heavy upon them there is something about the mere act of treading on somebody else's flower-beds that automatically puts back the clock and makes us children again and bill and flick as they slunk away were feeling about ten years old it was just such behavior as theirs that led to no jam for tea and they felt their position deeply it was not till the shrubbery ended in a small hedge and they found themselves out in a field dotted with sheep that the sense of guilt left them to be replaced by one of elation deplorable though their conduct might have been it had at any rate had the excellent result of giving them a breathing space from the way the interview between sir george and mr grayson was developing it looked as if their pursuer might be occupied for quite some time take care said flick suddenly and dropped on the grass 
bill joined her flopping as if his legs had been mown from under him what's the matter he asked a little querulously for his nerves were not what they had been at the start of this affair and he was shaken flick pointed above the hedge that rimmed the field rose the silhouette of the limousine against the pale sky the profile of augustus briggs stood out like something carven calm augustus seemed with the calmness of the man who is able to unhitch his brain at will and think of absolutely nothing only the smoke rising from the cigarette that appeared to be glued to his lower lip showed that he was alive bill looked at augustus keenly he was thinking hard a superbly strategic plan was beginning to shape itself in his mind at this point good fortune sent to him precisely the ally he required close beside them looking down on them with youth's frankly inquisitive stare was standing a small boy hello said bill smiling ingratiatingly hello said the boy he spoke reservedly as if wishing to convey that he committed himself to nothing he was a grave-looking boy with the pinched face of one on whom the cares of the world press heavily he seemed worried about the cosmos do you want to earn half a crown where is it here yes said the boy having examined the coin critically bill pointed see that car yes if i give you this half-crown will you go to the other side of the road and start throwing stones at it stones stones do you do you want me to throw stones at that car at that car said bill patiently and you'll give me that half-crown this half-crown an instant before one might have thought that it would have been impossible for this stripling to smile so strained and careworn had been his face but now his head seemed suddenly to split in the middle a vast grin gleamed like a gash beneath his snub nose stunned for a moment by the stupendous reflection that he was going to be paid a huge sum for indulging in his favorite sport he recovered swiftly he took the half crown bit it put it in his mouth and retired at a leisurely pace he crossed the field and for an age-long minute there was silence and peace the sheep browsed in the grass birds twittered their even song in the trees augustus briggs smoked his cigarette in the front seat of the limousine then things began to happen appearances to the contrary the mind of augustus briggs was not wholly a blank as he sat at his wheel placidly savouring his gasper his was the quietude of deep content this rest from the chase with the opportunity it afforded for a couple of whiffs was just what he needed most so far from having unhitched his brain he was thinking quite deeply the object of his thoughts being the tip he had received that morning from the butler on to-morrow's three o'clock race at hurst park the butler a knowledgeable man had recommended an investment on soapy sam and the more augustus examined the prospect the better it looked by this time to-morrow it seemed practically certain that he would be a richer man by a matter of ten shillings the reflection soothed augustus briggs he gazed almost with benevolence at the small boy who was crossing the road he was not fond of small boys as a rule but in his mellowed mood he did not actively dislike this one he would not have adopted him but on the other hand he he would not have clipped him on the side of the head he watched him indulgently as he disappeared through the hedge then he turned to his thoughts again to bob on soapy sam at five to one something whizzed across the road and clanged against the bonnet of the car for an instant augustus briggs sat 
gaping then peering over the side he saw that what had struck the bonnet was a large jagged flint and a moment later he observed bobbing up over the hedge a grinning face gah exclaimed augustus and as he spoke a second flint found its billet the chauffeur was not a man of deep sensibility towards most of the phenomena of the world through which he moved his attitude was one of superior indifference a primrose by the river's brim a simple primrose was to him and it was nothing more but one thing he did love with a strong and holy passion and that was his paint and the impact of those flints on his shiny bonnet caused him an anguish more acute than that which he would have felt had his own head been their target with one short sharp wail he leaped from the car raced across the road and burst into a torrent of eloquence the hedge it grieved him to discover formed an impenetrable barrier it was one of those hedges through which boys can glide like eels but which cannot be negotiated by chauffeurs fearful of tearing their uniforms he had consequently to be content with mere words and while he stood there sketching out a list necessarily incomplete for it had been compiled on the spur of the moment but nevertheless impressive of the things he proposed to do to the boy if he caught him bill and flick hurried silently out from their ambush augustus startled by the noise of engines spun around the car with a wholly unauthorized driver at the wheel was moving rapidly out of sight end of chapter eleven part one the chase ends it is pleasant to be able to record that bill's first act on returning to the metropolis was to drive guided by flick to sir george's house in manchester square and leave the limousine outside the front door he had no desire to add larceny to his other offences against the gentleman this done he hailed a cab and took flick off to a restaurant to dine he was feeling in need of refreshment after the activities of the afternoon and it had become evident to both of them that the situation which had arisen was one that called for calm and unhurried discussion how on earth he said as the waiter receded from the table which they had taken in a quiet corner your uncle found out that you were likely to be at marmont mansions simply gets past me i suppose we've got to take it that he did come there looking for you i'm afraid so there doesn't seem any other possible reason why he should be in battersea at all in any case he knows that you are to be found somewhere round these parts so the question now arises what's to be done flick drew little patterns on the tablecloth with her fork she looked about her at the gradually filling restaurant she had lived a cloistered life at holly house rarely emerging for meals except to go to recognized resorts of wealth like the ritz claridge's and the carlton and this sort of place was strange to her she was trying to decide whether the people at the other table were interesting or merely flashy when bill put his question again what's to be done yes i'm wondering too said flick but she spoke listlessly for the long ride with all its varied emotions had left her tired she wanted to postpone serious talk and to that end turned the conversation to the subject of this restaurant in which she was sitting what did you say the name of this place was she asked mario's said bill what made you choose it i was trying to think of somewhere where your uncle george would be least likely to drop in for a bite and i remembered this place slingsby took me here to lunch one day why don't you like it yes i think it's oh 
she was looking past him at the door and he was surprised to see that the colour which had been coming back to her face under the influence of food and drink had suddenly left it again her eyes had widened in a startled stare of dismay and for a moment there flashed into his mind the absurd thought that sir george might miraculously have appeared as if out of a trap he swung around in his seat and was relieved to find that no such miracle had occurred somebody had just come in at the door and was walking down the room looking for a table but it was not sir george it was a young man in a check suit black-haired and adorned if you could call it that as to the upper lip by a small blob of moustache bill had no recollection of ever having set eyes on this young man before nor did the other's appearance give to his thinking reasonable cause for alarm he turned round again and looked at flick inquiringly she was still pale did you see she whispered see said bill mystified do you mean the fellow in the check suit flick nodded mr pillbeam bill who had taken up his knife and fork laid them down again he eyed flick incredulously for a moment then turned once more and looked down the room and looking saw the check suited one had congealed into a pillar of amazement and was gaping in their direction with open mouth if he had been a highly paid motion picture star he could not have registered surprise more eloquently bill flushed darkly it took a good deal to ruffle his normally good-humoured outlook on life but it could be done roderick pike had done it by hitting him over the head with a stick and percy pillbeam had done it now by the mere act of walking into a restaurant where he was having dinner a man who has been through the sort of experiences which bill had been having that afternoon does not look at things in the light of pure reason mario's restaurant was open to the entire population of london and percy pillbeam had a perfect right to go there to dine if he wished but to bill who had been chased by the other's employer from the prince of wales road battersea to within a couple of miles of brocket hall in hertfordshire his presence in the place seemed as much an outrage as that of sir george pike in his flower beds had seemed to montague grayson the sunny novelist it was persecution that was what bill felt sheer persecution and he pushed his chair back and rose with protruding jaw where are you going asked flick the next moment it had become plain where bill was going he was stalking down the aisle in the direction of the table at which the intruder had now been induced by a solicitous waiter to seat himself he reached the table and planting two large hands on the cloth bent forward and raked the assistant editor of society spice with a lowering gaze that seemed to the latter to sear his very soul not for a long time had percy pillbeam seen at close range any one so big and so obviously unfriendly as bill he shrank into his chair is your name pillbeam pillbeam gulped dryly yuck bill bent a little closer to the diners at the neighboring tables the incident seemed a common one of restaurant life the old friend spotting the dear pal across the room and coming over to pass a chummy word pillbeam would have been amazed if he had known that anybody could possibly so misinterpret the position of affairs he was indeed wondering dully why the whole of the assembled company did not instantly rush to the spot to avert the murder which seemed to him so sickeningly imminent in the pursuance of his duties as scandal-gatherer for society spice he had been in some unpleasant situations but compared with this one they had been roses roses all the way for a swift instant he met bill's eye and looked pallidly away horrified by its red hostility you notice i'm dining with miss sheridan said bill in a quiet rumbling voice pillbeam tried to say quite but the word stuck in his throat good said bill now do you know what you're going to do 
Pilbeam smiled the beginnings of a weak smile, intended to convey that he was open to consider in the most favorable spirit any suggestions which Bill might make. "'You're going to wait right here where you're sitting,' cooed Bill, clenching and unclenching a fist that looked to the other's fascinated gaze like a ham. "'Until we are through, you will then keep right on sitting while we go out, and you will continue sitting for ten minutes after that. I should advise you to make it a little longer, so as to be on the safe side, as I shall be out there keeping an eye on the door.' see pilbeam said that he saw that's understood then now don't urged bill earnestly go getting absent-minded and forgetting will you pilbeam said he wouldn't and bill nodded a brief farewell and returned to his table pilbeam after watching him the whole way took up a fork and began to pick feebly at a sardine what did he say asked flick eagerly bill considered the question come to think of it he replied he didn't say much but i gathered that he understood all right understood that he wasn't to stir from the table till we had been gone ten minutes but he will he'll sneak out the moment we leave and follow me i think not said bill i think not would you mind changing seats then i shall be able to watch him not that it's really necessary come on he said encouragingly don't let a little thing like that spoil your dinner try some of this fish it looks good with gentle solicitude he forced her to make an adequate meal and was pleased to note the steady rise of her spirits as she ate when the waiter had brought the coffee he felt that the time had come for serious discussion of the situation the intrusion of pillbeam added to the shock of discovering that sir george had followed the trail that led to the battersea haven had disturbed him a good deal and he had been thinking deeply in the intervals of conversation now he said we must talk this thing over and see where we stand it seems to me that they're beginning to come over the plate a bit too fast flick nodded the metaphor was strange to her but she gathered its meaning let's get it clear bill went on your plan of campaign is to stay away till your people throw in the towel and say that this idea of marrying the man pike is off that's straight isn't it yes but how am i to stay away with them right after me like this they know now where you live and any moment they may find out where i live exactly obviously you can't come dropping in at marmot mansions any more no two courses proceeded bill judiciously are open we can change our addresses but even if i do change my address i shall be all the time in a state of jumps wondering if uncle george isn't going to pop out from somewhere and pounce on me just what i was going to say myself it doesn't seem to me worth it you can't go on with this hunted fawn business indefinitely it would give you the willies in a couple of days so what i suggest is that you clear out altogether what where new york new york i've thought it all out said bill complacently and between you and me i think the scheme's a pippin it'll only take a day getting your passport fixed up but what am i to do when i get to new york i've two ideas about that you might go to my uncle cooley at westbury where we first met you know flick shook her head it wouldn't be safe he would be sure to cable uncle sinclair that i was there they're great friends yes that's true well then here's the other idea i'll give you a letter to alice coker she will look after you if bill had not at that moment removed his gaze while he reached for a match he might have observed a queer expression flit over flick's face she looked at bill wonderingly it passed her comprehension how he could possibly be so dense as to imagine that she would go anywhere near the odious miss coker no matter how great the emergency 
true she had never let fall a word to indicate that alice coker was in her opinion of all the superfluous women in the world the most superfluous but she felt that he ought to have known it by instinct she bit her lip and her blue eyes clouded she's a great girl continued bill with tactless enthusiasm you'll love her yes said flick thinly i'll tell you what i'll write the letter now he called to the waiter and presently pen ink and paper were on the table i think this is a wow don't you he said buoyantly a what a pip explained bill the scheme of a lifetime it solves the whole thing flick watched him as he wrote clenching her hands under the table she was conscious of a rush of contending emotions at one moment she wanted to bang this dull-witted young man over the head and the next she was wishing that she could just bury her face in her hands and cry it was this latter desire which she found it particularly hard to fight down she was feeling bitterly hurt the airy way he had suggested that she should go right out of his life like this with never a hint that he would miss her for an instant it was illogical of course she realized that he was only trying to help her but women cannot always be logical in itself considered merely as a way out of her difficulties the idea of going to america was she forced herself to admit a good one the activities of the enemy had rendered london impossible she simply could not go on being as bill had expressed it a hunted fawn in new york she would feel safe and she had plenty of money there said bill flick took the letter and put it in her bag thank you she said i suppose we might as well be going now mightn't we i'm rather tired all right said bill i'll put you into a cab and then i'll hang around for a while just in case friend pillbeam starts any ranny gazoo but Pillbeam did not start any Ranny Gazoo. He was ostentatiously busy with the leg of a chicken as they passed down the aisle, nor did he allow his eyes to stray in their direction when they went through the door. Safety first was Pillbeam's motto. Bill closed the door of the cab. Good night, he said. Don't lose that letter. Of course not, said Flick. Good night bill turned back to the door of the restaurant and stood there solidly in his eyes the watchful look of one on his guard against ranny gazoo the cab turned the corner into shaftesbury avenue a hand waved at him from the window the cab had scarcely reached coventry street when the hand once more came out of the window this time it grasped some fragments of paper it opened and with a vicious jerk scattered these into the road then it disappeared again the good ship homeric lay in her slip at southampton preparing for departure her decks and alleyways were crowded with voyagers and those who had come to see those voyagers off flick leaning over the rail stared down at the sun-speckled water and bill by her side gazed at the gulls circling overhead for some minutes now conversation between them had taken on a limping gait and the atmosphere was charged with a strange embarrassment. "'You'll be off soon,' said Bill, urged by the silence to say something. "'Yes.' The gulls flashed to and fro against the cobalt sky, mewing like kittens. "'This is supposed to be one of the most comfortable boats in the world,' said Bill. "'Is it?' "'I think you'll be comfortable.' "'I expect so.' they rather pride themselves on making you comfortable that's nice bill was not sure whether he was sorry or relieved to hear at this juncture the all for the shore cry that puts an end to the sometimes trying ordeal of seeing off up till a few minutes ago everything had been jolly coming down in the train and for the first quarter of an hour on board the boat flick had been full of chatter a pleasant and cheery companion but just recently a cloud seemed to have fallen on her mood and she had tended to long silences and monosyllables 
i suppose i ought to be going he said i suppose so i hope you'll have a good time on board thanks it'll seem funny to you being in america again after all these years yes i'll look after bob thanks well i suppose i ought to be going i suppose so a gull wheeled so close to bill's head that he ducked involuntarily he laughed a nervous laugh <laughs> what a lot of people come to see people off he said yes friends i suppose said bill brightly i shouldn't wonder a steward with a voice like a foghorn in pain was once more urging all whom it might concern to make for the shore i suppose said bill struck with a novel idea i ought to be going i think you'd better well good-bye good-bye you won't lose that letter which letter why the one to alice said bill surprised oh yes said flick she'll give you a great time yes they had walked to the gangplank it was covered with a moving stream of humanity bustling like bees going into a hive there was something so suggestive of finality about the spectacle that a curious dull melancholy swept over bill he cast a side glance at flick the sight of her sent an odd pang through him Perhaps it was the hugeness of the vessel that made her seem so small and forlorn. Gosh! he exclaimed with sudden fervor. I shall miss you. The flat will seem like a desert without you in the old armchair. I shall just sit there with poor old Bob. He broke off. Good Lord! he said, dismayed. It's nothing, said Flick her face was working she dabbed impatiently at her eyes but i i was just thinking of bob she held out her hand abruptly good-bye she said and was gone bill stood for a moment staring into the crowd which hid her golly he mused she is fond of that dog he walked ashore thoughtfully end of chapter eleven part two A visitor from Mr. Paradine. However true it may be that action is the spice of life, there is no denying that an occasional dose of the soothing syrup of tranquillity makes a pleasant change. And so, after the scenes, always restless and bordering at times on actual violence, which, in order to keep the records straight, the historian of the fortunes of bill west has just been compelled to describe it is agreeable to turn aside and relax for a while in an atmosphere of cloistered and scholastic calm about a month after the departure of flick sheridan from southampton we find ourselves once more in the home of mr cooley paradine at westbury long island in a small upper room looking out over the sunlit garden it is the room dedicated to the studies of mr paradine's adopted son horace and at the moment when we enter it the hard-boiled lad is receiving a lesson in the french language from mr sherman bastable his tutor yes still his tutor it is true that a few weeks ago mr bastable definitely announced that not even so substantial a sum as a million dollars would be sufficient to induce him to continue his duties but the statements a man makes in the first flush of realization that the inside brim of his hat has been doctored with glue are not always carried out when scissors and warm water have done their work and reason resumed its sway scarcely half an hour after the hat had been clipped and scoured off his forehead mr bastable who had begun by sneering at a cool million had reduced his terms so considerably that he actually consented to remain in office for a mere additional fifty per month we find him consequently still doing business at the old stand but the sherman bastable 
who was now endeavouring to teach horace french was a very different man from the genial and juicily enthusiastic young fellow of a few weeks back he was now a soured and suspicious despot who fortified by instructions from his employer to stand no nonsense had taken on a cold implacability which was having the gravest effects on the latter's comfort of this change in his disposition he gave proof at this very moment seeing that horace like the room in which he sat was looking out over the sunlit garden he banged the table with a forceful fist attend can't you he cried you aren't listening to a word i'm saying all right all right said horace plaintively these passages were beginning to irk him more and more a free child of the underworld he had taken unkindly to discipline and it seemed to him sometimes as though mr bastable had developed all the less amiable characteristics of the late simon legree he removed his gaze from the shady lawn and gaped cavernously don't yawn thundered mr bastable oh all right and don't say all right boomed the tutor who had a retentive memory and could never look at his little charge even now without a twinge across the forehead when i speak to you say yes sir smartly and respectfully yes sir said horace a purist might have criticized the smartness and respectfulness of his delivery but the actual words were up to sample and the tutor appeared satisfied at any rate he returned to the task in hand indefinite articles said mr bastable resuming a or an is translated into french by un before a masculine noun as for example un homme a man un oiseau a bird there's a boy on that tree interjected horace switching abruptly from foreign languages to nature study mr bastable favoured him with a basilisk glare attend to your work he growled and don't say boyd it's a bird well it's making a noise like a boyd argued horace and un before a feminine noun such as dam proceeded the tutor un dam a lady una allumette a match un histoire a story un plume a pen do you get that i suppose so what do you mean you suppose so well said horace candidly it sounds to me a good deal like applesauce seems there ain't no sense in it the tutor clutched his thinning hair and groaned hollowly that extra fifty dollars a month had raised his salary to a very respectable figure but it frequently occurred to him that he was receiving but trivial payment for what he had to endure seems like there ain't no sense in it he echoed despairingly can't you see that's not grammar i don't know about its being grammar retorted horace with spirit it gets across don't it sir prompted mr bastable automatically sir and don't say don't it say doesn't it or does it not he eyed his pupil wanly the weather was warm and the strain beginning to tell on his sensitive nerves you're incorrigible i don't know what's to be done with you you take absolutely no interest in your work i should have thought that you would have some sense of your position your chances and opportunities oh i know said horace wearily one ought to grasp one's opportunities and try to improve oneself at least once don't say once oh all right yes sir emended mr bastable eyeing him balefully yes sir the tutor flung himself back in his chair which creaked protestingly 
do you realize that yours is a position which thousands of boys would give their eyes to be in can't you see that's not grammar said horace much as he disliked these seances it happened now and then that bits of them stuck in his mind oughtn't to end a sentence with in you put me right so i don't mind putting you right had you that time hot dog he said with a complacency which made the tutor feel not for the first time that his favourite character in history was herod the great you wised me up to that yourself every tutor is a statesman at heart he has to be mr bastable prudently realising the danger of his position instituted a counter-attack by assailing his pupil's pronunciation i wish you would learn to speak properly he said with hauteur your accent is abominable here he pulled out a massive book it's no good trying to teach you french till you can talk english read a page or two of this aloud and try to do it like a human being and not he searched his mind for an adequate simile and not like a caddy at a third-rate golf course what's wrong with caddies demanded horace who was intimate with several and in leisure moments had occasionally done a bit in that line himself go on don't waste time said mr bastable refusing to be diverted to an argument begin at the top of page ninety eight horace took the book it was entitled beacon lights of history volume two the middle ages with a disrelish which he made no attempt to conceal it was at this period he began sourly period it was at this period when the convents of europe europe i said europe protested horace aggrieved it was at this period when the convents of europe rejoiced in ample possessions and their churches rivalled cathedrals cathedrals mm, in size and magnificence that saint bernard he broke off mildly interested for the first time say i knew a gink that had a saint bernard big hairy dog with red eyes get on said mr bastable coldly saint bernard the greatest and best representative of med i a vul mon ast God, said horace under his breath tenderly massaging his aching jaw was born ten ninety one at fontaine in burgundy 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 he belonged to a noble family his mother had six sons and a daughter whom she early consecrated to the lord bernard was the third son a beautiful delicate refined young man tall with flaxen hair fair complexion and blue eyes from which shone a superhuman simplicity and purity he stopped revolted he did not know much about saints but he knew what he liked and something told him that he was not going to like saint bernard sounds like a cake eater he sniffed mr bastable was just drawing himself together for a legree like reproof when there was a gentle tap at the door pardon me for interrupting sir said roberts the butler hovering delicately on the threshold you haven't made me mad bobby horace assured him gratefully what is it roberts professor appleby has called to see master horace sir 
mr perdine would be glad if you would allow him to step down to the library for a moment his announcement evoked universal enthusiasm horace beamed upon him as people must have beamed on the man who brought the good news from ghent to aix nor was mr bastable displeased he was conscientious and had been prepared to continue his task for another hour but the thought of being relieved of horace's society gave him the sensations of a reprieved convict certainly he said i'm not going to put up any stiff argument neither declared horace he trotted joyfully out of the prison chamber mr bastable with the air of one from whose shoulders there has been removed an intolerable weight lit a cigarette and put his feet on the table the arrival some ten minutes before of the venerable professor appleby had surprised mr paradine at his customary occupation of fiddling about with the books in his library he had just scuttled up the ladder to one of the top shelves and dumped on his already congested table a pile of mouldering volumes when roberts brought the news of the visitor's advent for a moment mr paradine felt a little like a dog who has been hauled off a bone but his native courtesy asserted itself and it was with a cordial smile that he greeted the professor when he made his entry nice of you to look in he said i chance to be in the neighbourhood said professor appleby and i thought i might venture to call and inquire after the little lad he is busy at his studies no doubt i imagine so uh, won't you take a seat thank you my dear paradine thank you professor appleby relaxed in a chair with the contented sigh of a man who is not in the best condition he tapped his domed brow with a silk handkerchief and combed out his white beard with a delicate forefinger he was looking more like a benevolent minor prophet than ever his mild eyes wandered to the bookshelves and there came into them a sudden predatory gleam which vanished almost instantly to be replaced by their habitual expression of calm good will a warm day he observed very do you find it close in here not at all said professor appleby not at all i enjoy the peculiar and distinctive scent of old books i never find it stuffy in a library this was so exactly what mr paradine felt himself that his affection for his visitor deepened and how is horace inquired the professor physically said mr paradine he could not be better but professor appleby raised a deprecating hand i know what you are going to say my dear paradine i know just what you are going to say it was on the tip of your tongue to tell me that the little lad is not taking kindly to his studies not very kindly admitted mr paradine mr bastable his tutor reports that it is difficult to get him to take a real interest i expected as much no enthusiasm none it will come said the professor it will come we must have patience paradine patience we must emulate the assiduity of the polyp that builds the coral reef i had anticipated this it was on my advice that you adopted a totally untutored lad a child of the people and i still maintain that i was right in giving you that advice how much better even though progress may at first be slow to have a boy like this to work upon a boy whose mind is not a palimpsest that has been scrawled over by other hands you have nothing to worry about it would have been perfectly easy no doubt for you to have adopted a son from some family of the gentlefolk but 
in my opinion and i know i am right the results would have been far less satisfactory horace is virgin soil he has not been ploughed by others sooner or later you will find that you will reap your reward sooner or later i say it confidently you will find that by the mere process of living in your home the little lad is beginning to imitate your mental processes to acquire your own tastes it's odd that you should say that said mr paradine thoughtfully not odd corrected the professor with a gentle smile i based my observation on a knowledge of psychology which has rarely led me astray but why did it strike you as peculiar am i to infer that he has already begun to show signs of this as a matter of fact he has it is a remarkable fact appleby but the only thing outside his meals in which horace shows the slightest interest is this library of mine the professor coughed a gentle cough and gazed at the ceiling with a far-away look in his eyes indeed he said softly he is always pottering in here and wanting to know which of my books are the rarest and most valuable the dawning intelligence the little mind begins to expand to develop like a plant groping out for the sunshine it makes me feel that there may be hope for him i said the professor have great hopes of horace i had right from the beginning perhaps after he has had a year or two of school in england what cried professor appleby a moment before it would have seemed impossible that anything could disturb the calm serenity of this venerable man but now he was sitting forward on the edge of his chair staring at his host in the most manifest concern his lower jaw had fallen and his white beard wobbled agitatedly you are not sending him to school in england he gasped taking him corrected mr paradine i am sailing in a few days to pay a long delayed visit to an old friend of mine sinclair hammond i intend to take horace with me and enter him at one of the large english schools possibly winchester hammond was at winchester but is this wise is it prudent well i am going to do it said mr paradine with a touch of that belligerent manner which had so often caused adverse comment in the family professor appleby pulled at his beard his discomposure was plain mr paradine looking at him was conscious of a passing wonder as to why he should take the news so hardly but the education a boy gets at these english schools surely it has become a commonplace that it is too superficial too machine-like read all these novels of the younger english writers i never read novels said mr paradine with a slight shudder and then again this visit to england are you not afraid to leave your books here your priceless books entirely unguarded mr paradine uttered an amused laugh which sounded to his visitor like a knell <laughs> you talk as if i had never left the house before i am always travelling i was travelling when i met you and besides if you think i leave my books unguarded try to get through the steel shutters over those windows yes and try to pick your way through that door i had this room specially constructed it's like a safe i see said professor appleby unhappily in any case my library is insured and i'm taking all the most valuable of my books with me to england eh cried the professor 
starting as if the fingers combing his beard had suddenly encountered a snake taking them with you yes hammond is a collector too he will be just as excited over these books as if they belonged to himself will he said the professor brightening like a summer sky when the sun comes out from behind a cloud will he indeed yes he's that sort of man one of those rare collectors who have no small jealousies he sounds delightful yes you would like hammond i am sure i should of course when you are in england you will keep these books at some bank or safe deposit no i see no reason for that books are not like jewellery their value is not obvious to the lay eye if any burglar invades hammond's house at wimbledon he would hardly have the intelligence to take away what to him would be merely a bundle of dilapidated books true i shall keep them in my bedroom in an ordinary suitcase an excellent notion ah said the professor breaking off here is our young friend well horace hello said that youth professor appleby glanced at his watch good gracious i had no idea how time had flown i ought to go immediately i shall just be able to catch a good train perhaps the little lad might be spared from his studies to accompany me to the station thank you get your hat then horace we must be hurrying in spite of the statement that he had need for haste it was at a leisurely pace that professor appleby started down the drive he walked as if troubled with corns and as he went spoke earnestly to his young companion kid said professor appleby it's a lucky thing i happened to look in this afternoon do you know what's happened that old june bug back there doesn't seem able to stick in one spot for a couple of days on end he's taken you over to england right away horace stopped in his tracks displaying as great a concern at the news as the professor himself had shown a short while back in the library taken me to england what for to put you in school over there who me yes you well wouldn't that jar you cried horace in deep disgust i might have known there was a catch to this thing of getting me adopted it's bad enough here with everybody picking on me and me having to spend all day learning french and everything but gee i'd always got my getaway to look forward to but going to school he frowned resolutely say listen i ain't going to no school see i ain't going to no school not in england nor anywheres i you talk too much said professor appleby curtly if you'll give me a chance to get a word in i'll tell you something you won't have to go to any school the old man's going over to england to visit another book collecting nut and he's taken a stack of his best books with him you'll be able to make a quick clean-up and fade out he's going to keep the stuff in his bedroom in a suitcase yes he is said horace derisively that's likely ain't it when he locks the things up here as if they was gold dust he is i tell you he told me so himself he thinks there's no chance of anybody trying for them when he's there and why should they no ordinary yank who happens to blow into a house is going to load himself up with a bunch of books something in that agreed horace i'll have joe go over the same time as you do and you and he can get together and fix things all right said horace say that's a pretty girl the object of his commendation a slim girl with fair hair and a boyish figure was walking rather wearily up the road that led from the station he eyed her critically as she passed 
and so confirmed in his good opinion was he by this closer inspection that he stood gazing over his shoulder at her receding form and was awarded by his austere companion a disciplinary thump on the head you've no time for rubbering at girls said professor appleby like a minor prophet rebuking the sins of the people you just listen to me when i'm talking to you i want to get this thing straight in your ivory skull oh all right said horace end of chapter twelve part one a visitor for mr paradine the girl who had so pleased horace's critical eye walked on till she came to the gate of mr paradine's grounds then turned in and proceeded down the drive towards the house this was familiar territory to her she was surprised to find how clearly she remembered all the various landmarks there was the funny old shingled roof there the window of her bedroom and there through the trees gleamed the lake her eyes dimmed and she caught her breath with a little gasp as she saw the lake the two dressing sheds were there also the diving board all just the same as they had been centuries ago when she was sixteen skinny and freckled she walked on and rang the bell and presently mr paradine once more up his ladder was aware of roberts the butler on the floor below him eh said mr paradine absently a lady wishes to see you sir mr paradine almost slid down the ladder it was a rare almost an unprecedented occurrence for ladies to wish to see him who is she a miss sheridan sir there had been no affecting reunion between flick and roberts to each the other had appeared as a stranger flick remembered that on her visit to this place five years ago there had been a butler but the personality of roberts had not stamped itself on her mind as for roberts if he recalled the small girl who had stayed at the house in the third year of his butlership he did not associate her with this attractive young person did she say what she wanted no sir where is she i have shown her into the morning-room sir i suppose you had better ask her to come up here very good sir the uneasy suspicion which had disturbed mr paradine's mind that his visitor had come to collect funds for some enterprise of the community church vanished as she entered the room the community church when it made its periodical assaults on his purse did so through the medium of females of a maturer vintage he looked at her inquiringly so obviously puzzled that flick though she was far from being in a cheery frame of mind smiled faintly you don't remember me mr paradine why er to be frank well it's quite a long time since we met i stayed here five years ago with my uncle sinclair hammond good heavens mr paradine who had contented himself so far with a weary bow at long range sprang forward and shook her hand warmly i'd never have known you bless my soul you were quite a child then i remember you perfectly now bless my soul yes so you're back in america eh do you live here now marry an american eh no i'm not married just visiting well well i'm delighted to see you again my dear you caught me just in time oddly enough i'm on the very eve of sailing for england to stay with your uncle i know that's why i've come here uncle sinclair wants you to take me back to england with you you've had his cable cable said mr paradine i remember no cable he rang the bell roberts has a cable come for me recently yes sir one arrived yesterday if you remember sir i brought it to you in this room you were busy at the bookshelves at the moment and instructed me to place it on the table the table was covered with a deep top dressing of books and papers mr paradine rummaged among these and presently came to the surface bearing triumphantly a buff envelope roberts vindicated left the room 
i really must apologize said mr paradine i have a bad habit of snowing my correspondence under all the same roberts should have reminded me cables are important things he opened the envelope and read its contents yes this is the one your uncle says you will be calling on me and will i bring you over to england of course only too delighted where are you staying with friends in new york no i'm all alone alone mr paradine replaced his rimless glasses which had fallen off and stared at her you don't mean to say your uncle let you come over here all alone i ran away said flick simply ran away from home and now she said with a crooked smile and a little lift of her shoulders i'm running back again even with the aid of his glasses mr paradine seemed to find it hard to inspect her as closely as he wished he came a step nearer peering at her bewildered you ran away from home but why they wanted me to marry somebody i found i didn't want to marry uncle sinclair she went on quickly hadn't anything to do with it poor dear it was the others aunt frances and uncle george mr paradine would have liked footnotes explaining these two new characters but he hesitated to interrupt the flow of a narrative which was gripping him strongly things continued flick got rather unpleasant so i ran away and came over here i thought i could get work of some kind i never heard of such a thing that's practically what everybody said whom i asked for work i never dreamed anybody could be so little wanted as i was i had a certain amount of money when i got to america and i supposed it would last ever so long but it seemed to melt away and one night i had my bag stolen with almost every penny i possessed in it that finished me i stuck it out for another couple of days and then i spent my last two dollars on a cable home mr paradine though capable on occasion of behaving like a volcano was a soft-hearted and romantic man flick's story touched him and then i got a cable back telling me to go to you and you would look after me and bring me back to england my dear child of course i will of course your room shall be got ready at once the same one you had five years ago i'm afraid i'm an awful nuisance nothing of the kind said mr paradine heatedly how dare you say you're a nuisance you're nothing of the sort would you like some tea i should rather if it's not giving too much trouble the ringing of the bell did mr paradine the service of helping him cover his embarrassment there was to him something poignantly pathetic in this meekness on the part of a girl who only a short time back had on her own showing been so abundantly equipped with spirit as to run away from home and cross the atlantic to try her luck in a foreign land until the tea arrived he moved about the room with his back turned fussing over his books but if you go home he said when flick had drunk a cup of tea and seemed the better for it you will have to marry this man you dislike he realized that it might be tactless this harping on a delicate subject but curiosity overcame delicacy he was feeling like a child being told a story oh i don't dislike him said flick tonelessly i'm very fond of someone else who isn't fond of me so i've decided i might just as well marry roderick as do anything trying to live in new york on nothing has changed my views of life a good deal it has made a comfortable home and lots of money seem more attractive one has got to be practical hasn't one she got up and began to walk about the room what a lot of books you have she said ever so many more than uncle sinclair he has some i would be very glad to own 
said mr paradine handsomely he would have liked to hear more of this man whom flick was fond of but who was not fond of her but he gathered that she looked upon her narrative as completed and would resent further questioning he followed her across the room and touched her shoulder with an awkward little pat of condolence she looked around at him and he saw that her eyes were misty there was a momentary pause tense with embarrassment and he covered it by picking up the photograph at which she had been looking it was a full-length snapshot of a burly young man in football costume staring out of the picture with the doughy stolidity habitual to burly young men in football costume that is my nephew william said mr paradine flick nodded i know oh of course yes said mr paradine he was staying here when you and your uncle visited me wasn't he he looks very strong said flick she felt that she must say something he is strong said mr paradine and he added gruffly he is an idle worthless young waster flick uttered a sharp exclamation he isn't oh i beg your pardon she hurried on what i meant to say was that i don't think you know how hard he is working now to try to find out what is wrong with your london business hello mr paradine put up his glasses how do you know anything about that i i met him over in london yes that's odd where did you run across him uh in our garden there said mr paradine what did i say he spends his time fooling around at garden parties it wasn't exactly a garden party said flick he really is trying his hardest to find out why those profits have fallen off so much oh yes oh but he is insisted flick she refused to allow herself to be intimidated by the old man's gruffness the fact that he still kept bill's photograph in his library that holy of holies must surely be significant i'll tell you something he's found out already he's discovered that mr slingsby is selling nearly all your wood pulp to a firm named higgins and bennett at a very small profit when he has had much better offers elsewhere what it's quite true i think we both think that mr slingsby isn't very honest nonsense as straight and able a man as i ever met and i'm a judge of character you can't be a very good judge of character if you think bill is an idle waster said flick warmly hello you seem very friendly towards him i am why you hardly know him i've known him for years yes i suppose you have if you like to put it that way this is interesting what you tell me about those sales i can't understand it did william tell you how he found out no but he's awfully clever hm i never noticed it well he is and i'm sure that if you would take him into your business and give him a fair start he would do wonders mr paradine chuckled <laughs> if i ever think of founding a william boosting club i shall know where to go for a president i think he's rather hurt that you haven't sent him a word since he got to england asking him how he's getting on i'll bet he hasn't given me a thought since he landed said mr paradine callously still if you think he's so sensitive i'll send him a wireless from the boat and arrange a meeting i wish you would but i don't even know where he is nine marmont mansions prince of wales road battersea park london said flick glibly good gracious how do you know that he told me mr paradine looked at her curiously i don't know how long you were talking in this garden of yours he said but there doesn't seem to have been much that he didn't tell you i suppose he roasted me eh he said you were a perfect darling 
said flick who tried to make people believe you were a terror and didn't deceive anybody she stooped and bestowed a swift kiss on the bald spot in the centre of mr paradine's mop of stiff white hair i'm going out into the garden she said i want to see if you've been and changed everything since i was last here if i find you have i'll come back and smack you mr paradine followed her with a round-eyed gaze as she left the room his thoughts strayed back to the story she told him and he gave a discontented sniff hm. a man who isn't fond of that girl he mused must be a fool he picked up the photograph of bill and looked at it a rather wistful smile curving his lips an idle young hound william but not unattractive by no means unattractive he put the photograph down and toddled off to his ladder end of chapter twelve part two bill makes a discovery his long form draped in a flowered dressing-gown judson coker sat breakfasting in the dining-room of number nine marmont mansions battersea a gentle breeze floating in through the open window brought pleasant spring scents from the park across the road to blend with the robuster aroma of coffee and fried bacon propped up against the coffee-pot was a copy of the new york world which had arrived that morning by the american mail the hour was ten thirty a strange sense of well-being filled judson he took another mouthful of bacon and marvelled as he had been in the habit of marvelling lately how extraordinarily fit he felt these days it seemed to him that this mystery of his glowing health was one that would interest doctors achieved as it had been in spite of the fact that for nearly two months now he had been deprived of that regular stimulus of alcohol so highly recommended indeed insisted upon by the medical profession he was in tremendous shape why back in new york he would have shied like a startled horse if any one had suggested that he should wrap himself round half a dozen slices of bacon at daybreak like this whereas now he was in two minds whether or not to send out to the kitchen for a further supply he came to the conclusion that it must be something to do with the london air it probably possessed curious tonic properties and having decided definitely that another order of bacon was essential he went down the passage to the kitchen to put it in commission when he came back he found bill west staring moodily at the laden table hello bill old man said judson buoyantly come to join me in a bite sit down and draw up a chair i mean draw up a chair and sit down a relief expedition is on its way with more food i had my breakfast hours ago said bill with gloomy unresponsiveness haven't you finished yet i want to use the table to write a letter the champagne-like air of london which had brought new youth to judson seemed to have missed bill out when distributing joy and elasticity about the metropolis for the last few weeks bill had been restless and subject to sudden fits of irritability a fact which had disturbed judson not a little filled as he was nowadays with an almost maudlin benevolence towards all created things judson wanted to have smiling faces around him you've all day before you he pointed out park yourself on a chair and watch me eat shan't be long there's a letter for you in the sitting-room said bill from alice yes said judson with a brother's indifference he scanned his paper listen to this broadcasts his love sweetheart muffs it wellington mass 
miss luella phipps of this city took her ear from her radiophone at just the wrong time last night for she failed to hear her sweetheart's voice in forest hills new york announcing their engagement james j roper of forest hills new york is the lucky man and is a radio expert it occurred to him to let his fiancee hear his voice tell the world the glad tidings of their approaching nuptials why do they print drivel like that said bill sourly don't you think it's rather touching inquired the pollyanna behind the coffee-pot in his sunny mood he was prepared to find heart interest everywhere no oh judson returned to his literary research would match miss bower against men swimmers he proceeded having now meandered on to the sporting page who would it just says would her pals i suppose during the recent six-day swimming carnival miss bower hung up four new world standards and two new american marks what of it judson turned the pages <laughs> here's a good one he said chuckling girl tries to get into a taxi taxi man says i'm engaged that's fine says the girl i hope you'll be very happy <laughs> he gazed wistfully at his companion but bill's face remained coldly unresponsive and judson having now tried him with heart interest sporting gossip and humour gave the thing up and looked at him with concern what's the matter bill old man nothing's the matter oh but there is you've become a regular gloom all the time these days you're acting like a wet sunday in pittsburgh i believe you're sickening for something i'm not how do you know you're not said judson earnestly you've got all the symptoms you're jumpy and restless and you haven't smiled since six weeks ago last wednesday i'll tell you what it is bill old man i'm becoming more and more convinced that we ought to keep a little brandy or some other healing spirit always in the house in case of sickness you are are you i've heard of fellows who were saved from the tomb by a tot of brandy administered at just the right moment dozens of them absolutely snatched from the undertaker's grasp we could keep it in here urged judson in that closet it wouldn't take up any room he scanned bill's forbidding features for a moment with a hope that swiftly ebbed oh very well he said stiffly i was only suggesting it for your own good the second installment of bacon had arrived and he attacked it with an offended aloofness presently having finished his meal he took himself off to the sitting-room and bill clearing a space on the table sat down to write bill's days for writing to alice coker were tuesday and friday to-day was friday and it was consequently to compose a letter of love that he was now addressing himself one would have supposed that with such a treat before him his eye would have gleamed with a tender light but no it was dull and fishy and after he had written half a dozen words he stopped and began to chew his pen drearily literary composition can often be a slow and painful process but if there is one occasion when a writer should surely find the golden sentences bubbling up without an effort it is when he is inditing a letter to the girl he loves the fact that for some time it had been getting harder and harder to think of things to fill up the pages on these occasions was beginning to weigh upon bill's spirits 
impious as it was to entertain even for an instant the supposition that writing letters to alice could have become a bore honesty compelled him to admit that his primary motive in routing judson out of the room at this early hour had been the desire to tackle the task and get it finished and off his mind he ran his fingers through his hair it was no good words would not come what made it all the more strange was the fact that in the earlier days of his sojourn in london he had handled these bi-weekly prose poems with an absolutely inspired ease his pen had started racing the moment he sat down phrases of the most admirable and pulpy sentiment had leaped into his mind so quickly that he could not keep pace with them and stuff that you could have bound up in mauve covers and sold a dozen editions of had cost him practically no effort at all and here he was now without an idea in his head he got up and went into the sitting-room if anything could give him inspiration it would be those twelve photographs of alice that smiled down with such queenly sweetness from the mantelpiece the what-not and the console table he was inspecting the one third from the left on the mantelpiece dully conscious that it was giving him no kick whatever when a grave voice addressed him from the depths of the armchair bill old man bill turned sharply what's the matter now he snapped it was wrong of course of him to speak so curtly to his faithful friend but one cannot deny that he had a certain amount of justification judson was eyeing him with a peculiar and inscrutable expression on his face goggling at him in an indescribable sort of sad leering way that crashed into his nerve centres like a bullet to a man in his condition of irritable despondency the spectacle of judson's face even in its normal state was hard enough to bear with this peculiar expression added it had become intolerable what are you looking at me like that for he demanded judson made no direct reply to the question instead he heaved himself up from his chair and stalking to bill patted him gently on the shoulder then he grasped his hand and shook it for a few moments and finally having patted him on the shoulder once more resumed his seat i've got news for you bill man he said in a hushed voice what news bill o man said judson solemnly you were wrong just now believe me you were wrong in the attitude you took up about my suggestion that we should keep a little brandy in the place i mean what is this news of yours anybody said judson is liable to get ill at any moment and every house therefore should have its supply however small of brandy or some other healing spirit always ready so that you can get at it at a moment's notice i've been reading up about brandy bill old man it is employed a great deal medicinally as a food capable of supplying energy in a particularly labile form to the body it is also a very valuable stimulant carminative and hypnotic well i mean that shows you will you stop driveling about brandy and tell me there have been thousands of cases where the sudden breaking of bad news has caused apparently healthy people to keel over and faint and if there hadn't happened to be somebody in the offing with a nip of the right stuff their name would have been mud if you'll give me the money bill o man i'll be only too glad to pop round the corner to a pub and get a pint or two what is this news i heard my father say once that when he got badly hammered in the panic of nineteen o seven no said judson carefully 
i'm lying to you it wasn't my father it was a pal of his this bimbo was ruined in the panic and he went straight home and opened up a bottle and took a couple of good strong snifters quick and before he knew where he was he was feeling like a two-year-old again and what's more those drinks gave him an inspiration which enabled him to pull half his fortune out of the wreck more than half it's not far to the pub i can get there and back in ten minutes look here said bill tensely if you don't tell me what this news of yours is i'll step on you judson shook his head sadly he seemed to be deploring the headlong impetuosity of youth all right he said if you must have it alice has gone and got engaged to a bird in the steel business with pots of money she asked me to break it to you gently bill stared dumbly the fateful words sank slowly into his consciousness engaged judson nodded a deathbed nod that's right to a fellow in the steel business absolutely in the steel business old man there was a long silence and suddenly bill became aware with a sort of shock that his only clearly defined and recognizable emotion in this stupendous moment was a feeling of intense relief at the thought that now he would not have to finish that letter all the morning it had been pressing on him like some heavy weight and try as he would he could not check a horrible sense of exhilaration he realized dully that it was all wrong to be feeling like this it was shameful that a man in his position confronted with the wreck of all his hopes and dreams could find nothing better to do than to stand congratulating himself on having got out of writing a difficult letter besides the letter ought not to have been difficult all the evidence in short appeared to point to one conclusion that he was utterly lacking in the most rudimentary spirituality presently as he stood there trying not to feel gay and light-hearted he perceived that the air of the cokers was behaving in an odd manner judson had risen once more from his chair and now sidling up he was thrusting into bill's hand a sheet of paper as the latter's fingers closed over this he sighed patted him on the shoulder again and began to steal softly towards the door pausing on the threshold he nodded twice with extraordinary solemnity then he slid out it was only after he had been gone some moments that it dawned upon bill that this was judson's idea of handling a delicate situation with gentlemanly tact there are times judson seemed to consider when the strong man prefers to be left to wrestle with his grief alone left thus alone bill endeavored to carry out his part of the program he glanced at the document in his hand recognizing alice's handwriting he deduced that this must be the letter which had brought the news presumably judson had intended him to read it but what was the use once a man has grasped the essential fact that the girl to whom he was under the impression that he was betrothed has gone and got engaged to birds in the steel business with pots of money treatises on the subject are superfluous he put the letter down on the table unread there now came to him a pleasing theory that seemed to offer an explanation of his strange lack of decent sorrow men who are shot frequently feel no immediate discomfort beyond a dull shock this he came to the conclusion must be what had happened in his case his faculties must have been stunned later on no doubt the agony would commence feeling considerably relieved by this reflection he decided to go out and grapple with his tragedy in the open air dimly remembered novels whose heroes had received the same sort of blow suggested that this was the correct course for one in his position to pursue in those novels he recalled shepherds tending their flocks on the wind-swept hills 
used to be startled by the swift passing of tall soldierly men with pale drawn faces striding through the storm with mouths set like bars of steel and eyes glittering like flames staring sightlessly out from under the peaks of their caps he put on his shoes and was about to go in search of his hat when suddenly there presented itself the problem of the photographs those twelve photographs what to do with them in the matter of the faithless one's photographs two plans of action are open to the jilted swain he can either lay them up in lavender and live out his lonely life brooding over them as his hair gradually whitens or he can do the strong manly thing and destroy them out of hand it came as a further shock to bill when after five minutes tense thought he decided on the latter course to realize how little anguish the prospect caused him he made his decision without a tremor and did the photographs up in a brown paper parcel with as little remorse as a grocer wrapping a pound of tea undoubtedly his faculties must have been stunned it was bill's intention to get rid of these mementos of a dead past somewhere in the great outdoors for over a week now the weather had been too warm for fires which prevented one handy way of disposing of the things and it was obviously impossible for a sensitive man to tear them up and put them in the waste paper basket where judson would see them bill wanted no jarring comments on his action he was grateful now for the other's indifferent attitude towards all photographs of his sister judson was not an observant young man and the odds were that the novel bareness of the walls and mantelpiece would entirely escape him it is one of the defects of london from the point of view of a man whose heart has just been broken that it is practically devoid of wild spots in which to stride with a sightless stare the nearest thing it seemed to provide to the wind-swept hills was battersea park and thither bill betook himself with his parcel stepping lightly down the passage to the front door in order not to be intercepted by bob the celium who if aware that one of the gang contemplated going for a walk would he knew show a disposition to count himself in and much as bill respected and liked bob he had no wish for his company now the bobs of battersea are not permitted inside the park's exclusive boundaries unless attached to a leash and it seemed to bill scarcely decent that on this supreme occasion he should be hampered by a wriggling dog any moment now the agony might be beginning making solitude essential he tiptoed out and hurried down the stairs it was a lovely morning comment has already been made in these records on the callousness of nature in times of man's distress and it is enough to say that on this occasion nature more than lived up to her reputation it was a day when the most prudent would have left his umbrella at home and bill wandering through the green avenues and listening to the merry cries of children sporting in the sunshine continued to have that peculiar illusion of light-heartedness if he had not known that such a thing was impossible he would have said that his spirits were rising higher and higher every moment the way he jerked his wrist when having reached a spot secluded from human eye he threw the brown paper parcel containing the photographs from him was positively rollicking he heard it flop behind him without a pang and was caracoling gaily on down the path when a shrill voice spoke in his ear hi mister so unexpected was this voice that it had for one brief instant an uncanny effect of being the voice of the brown paper parcel a moment before bill had been convinced that there was not a soul within a hundred yards but it is a peculiarity of the london parks that no spot in them is ever really secluded from the human eye and now there had sprung up apparently through the asphalt a small and grubby girl in a print frock 
she was trotting towards him her face beaming with helpfulness and good will with her left hand she dragged along a small male relation who in his turn dragged a still smaller male relation with her right she waved the brown paper parcel you dropped this mister bill was a kind-hearted young man and he shrank from wounding the child he took the parcel with as much gratitude as he was able to summon up on the spur of the moment and with a smile a little too mechanical to be really brilliant handed over sixpence as a reward the family melted away bill walked on the episode had had the effect of shaking his nerve and though he passed several deserted nooks which might have been constructed by the london county council with the sole purpose of acting as dumping grounds for the photographs of girls about to marry into the steel business he made no use of them and presently roaming aimlessly he found himself on the edge of a large sheet of water here like alastor on the long chorasmian shore he paused the margin of the pool was fringed with children and dogs the latter held in leash by nurses or tied to benches the nurses exchanged dignified confidences one with another the children sailed toy boats the dogs barked continuously in the trees on a small island in the middle of the water a colony of rooks cawed in raucous competition with the dogs it was a jolly spot but to bill its chief charm lay in the fact that every individual present whether nurse or child or dog or rook appeared to be intensely occupied with his own affairs and consequently in no position to observe and comment upon the strange behaviour of any well-dressed young man who should stroll up and start throwing brown paper parcels into the depths it seemed too good a chance to miss with an abstracted eye on the rooks he sent the parcel spinning through the air and was just turning away humming a careless air when the splash was followed by another of such magnitude that he thought for a moment that the rather stout child who had been trimming the sails of his yacht close by must have fallen in and it is shameful to have to record that the first emotion that came to bill a man with one life saved from drowning already to his credit was a feeling of regret at the prospect of having to go in after the little chump but he had wronged the stout child there he was still safely on the water's edge the creature that had caused the splash was an enormous dog with long black hair and an expression of genial imbecility and was now swimming vigorously out to where the brown paper parcel floated and even as bill looked he snapped it up between two rows of shark-like teeth and started for the shore a moment later he had laid it at bill's feet shaken himself like a shower bath and was gazing up into his playmate's face his idiot grin urging him as plainly as if he had made a set speech to keep the fun going by throwing the thing in again bill picked up the parcel and hurried away he was now in a mood of acute exasperation it was not the fact that he was quite noticeably wet that infuriated him nor was his indignation due to disapproval of the phenomenon of an unleashed dog where according to the park's clearly printed bylaws no unleashed dog should have been what was gnawing at his vitals was a dull hatred of this brown paper parcel and all it stood for it amazed him now that he could ever have supposed himself in love with alice coker apart from anything else apart altogether from her evil habit of going about marrying birds in the steel business there must be a curse of some sort on a girl whose photographs were so impossible to get rid of it was with all the depression of a eugene arum that he strode from the pond and buried himself in a quiet leafy byway if anything could have soothed bill's mood of raging fury this murmurous lane with its fringe of tall trees in which he now found himself should have done so 
even more than any of the other nooks through which he had passed that morning it seemed apart from the world of men birds sang in the branches to his left and in the flower beds to his right bees were buzzing happily it is proof of the shattered state of bill's morale that the solitude of this sylvan retreat did not encourage him at once to drop his parcel he was in the grip of a sort of superstitious coma he had a presentiment that solitary though the place seemed he would not be alone for long and a moment later his presentiment was fulfilled round the bend in the walk concealed until they were almost on him by a large bush came pacing slowly a young couple a man and a girl the girl was trim and pretty but it was the man who arrested bill's attention he was a tall young man with brown eyes and chestnut hair of an aspect rendered vaguely artistic by a long and flowing tie of mauve silk and the thing about him that attracted bill's notice was his oddly familiar look somewhere he felt he had met the fellow before the man looked up and as he did so there came into his face an expression which bill could not interpret it was recognition that was clear enough but it was also something more than recognition if the idea had not been so absurd he would almost have said it was fear the brown eyes widened and a breeze rippling through the chestnut hair he was carrying his hat in his hand gave it a momentary suggestion of standing on end hello said bill he could not place the fellow but it was plain from the other's expression that they must have met hello said the young man huskily nice day said bill the observation seemed to have a reassuring effect on the other it was as if he had expected hostility from bill and was pleasantly relieved by the cordiality of his tone he brightened visibly beautiful he said beautiful 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 each having shot his conversational bolt there followed one of those awkward silences and then bill acting automatically under the influence of a powerful urge proceeding he knew not whence extended his hand here he said briefly and thrusting the brown paper parcel into the other's grasp he walked rapidly away he was conscious as he went of a whirl of mixed emotions but the one that stood out above all the others was a stupendous feeling of relief a memory of his boyhood came to him of the time when he had first read stevenson's bottle imp it must have been quite a dozen years ago but he could still recall the exquisite exultation he had felt on reaching the passage where the hero gets rid of the fatal bottle to the drunken sailor it was exactly so that he was feeling now his recent acquaintance might probably would think him mad but the chances were all against him running after him to tell him so and to force the parcel back upon him if he did it would be necessary to take firm steps bill stopped his train of thought had just been jarred violently off the rails by the sudden discovery of the reason why the man's face had been familiar he knew him now and he remembered where it was that they had last seen each other in the garden of holly house wimbledon when he bill had chased him hither thither and round about through the darkness with the intent to do violence upon his person it was the man roderick pike bill smiled grimly roderick pike no there was no likelihood of roderick pike running after him with parcels and then his thoughts began to flow in such a rapid stream that he could not keep up with them the discovery that this man was roderick pike immediately caused him to wonder what on earth he was doing strolling about battersea park with a girl why by all the laws of romance and even decency he should have been brooding forlornly on his vanished fiancee it offended bill to think that a man who has so recently lost flick 
should be behaving so callously and then his thoughts shot off at another tangent and this time they were such weighty thoughts that he was obliged to sit down on a handy bench to grapple with them flick of course he had never actually forgotten flick for an instant but it was certainly true that his meeting roderick had brought her into his mind with a curious vividness that had all the effect of making her seem like something suddenly remembered flick he could see her now as clearly as if she were standing before him flick happy and smiling flick tired and tearful flick frightened and looking to him for support a whole gallery of flicks each more attractive than the last and quite suddenly as if he had known it all along bill realized that he loved flick of course he was a fool not to have guessed it earlier judson had accused him of being like a wet sunday in pittsburgh quite justly he had been like a wet sunday in pittsburgh and why because the withdrawal of flick from his life had made that life seem so empty and unprofitable this was what had been troubling his spirit all these weeks bill got up he was glowing now with that fervor which comes upon men in their hour of clear vision he felt in his pocket for his pipe the situation was distinctly one that demanded a series of thoughtfully smoked pipes and found that he had left it in the flat it being obviously impossible to think coherently without it he returned home judson that model of tact and delicacy was still out and bill was glad of it he wanted solitude he found his pipe where he had left it in the dining-room beside that scarcely begun letter to alice coker and proceeded to the sitting-room a marconigram was lying on the table bill opened it hoping faintly that it might be from flick and experienced disappointment on discovering that it was from his uncle cooley uncle cooley said the marconigram was due to dock at southampton on the following morning he hoped that bill would meet him at the antiquarians club in pall mall at three in the afternoon it was news to bill that mr paradine was on the ocean at all and his immediate feeling was a regret that he had not more stimulating news to give him of his activities in connection with mr wilfred slingsby yes on the whole it was a nuisance that uncle cooley had chosen just this time to come over however being here he could not be ignored bill came to the conclusion that it would be more respectful and would make a better impression if instead of waiting till three o'clock he went to waterloo station on the morrow and met the boat train having made this decision he sat down and plunged into pleasant roseate dreams about flick End of chapter thirteen unforeseen enchantment at waterloo station it was with a light and jaunty step that bill strode over chelsea bridge next morning on his way to waterloo there had been a time in the silent watches of the night when lying in bed reviewing the position of affairs he had had certain uncomfortable doubts as to the stability of his character was not a man he asked himself who could so swiftly rebound from one love to another incapable of love in its deepest sense was not such a man incurably shallow and trivial and worthy of nothing but contempt from twelve thirty till a quarter to two he had been inclined to answer these questions in the affirmative but at one forty five precisely there had slid into his fevered mind the consoling recollection of romeo now there was a chap generations of lovers had taken him as the archetype of their kind and yet on shakespeare's own showing the fellow had been a perfect byword among his friends up till say nine thirty p m one night for his hopeless adoration of rosaline and it couldn't have been much more than nine forty five the same night before he was worshipping juliet 
and certainly nobody had ever accused romeo of shallowness and triviality no everything was absolutely all right all that had happened was that the scales had fallen from his eyes if you liked to put it that way and that was the sort of thing that might happen to any one with each step that took him nearer to his destination bill became more wholeheartedly convinced that flick was the only girl in the world for him what he had felt for alice coker had been the mere immature infatuation of a lad with no knowledge of life he looked back to himself as he had been two months ago and seemed to be contemplating another being in addition to having settled this soul problem he had also got the practical side of the thing straight as soon as there was a boat he must go over to america find flick and pour out his heart every moment that he spent three thousand miles away from her was a moment irreparably wasted and somehow the thought of pouring out his heart to flick affected him with none of that nervous paralysis which had come upon him on the occasion when he had mistakenly revealed his emotions to alice coker flick was different flick was well she was flick she was a pal by the time bill reached westminster bridge he was smiling at passers-by and telling policemen it was a nice morning and in york road he went so far as to give a hawker half a crown for a penny box of matches thereby converting one who had always been a stubborn sceptic to a belief in miracles he entered the bustling precincts of waterloo at a sort of joyous trot which increased to a gallop when a porter informed him that the boat train was even now discharging its passengers at platform thirteen bill had no difficulty in finding platform thirteen the march of progress has robbed waterloo station of its mysteries once it used to be a quaint dim wonderland in which bewildered alices and their male counterparts wandered helplessly seeking information of officials as naively at sea as themselves but now it is orderly and efficient bill not having known it in the days of its picturesqueness had no sense of romantic loss yielding up a penny for a platform ticket he charged past the barrier into the swirl of the crowd the platform was full of travellers and their friends and relatives his native shrewdness telling him that uncle cooley would probably be at the far end of the train looking after his baggage bill wasted no time it was his intention to show zeal to save his uncle trouble and annoyance by attending to the baggage himself and incidentally to reveal himself in the light of the capable young man of affairs he brushed aside a boy who was trying to sell him oranges and chocolates and sped upon his way and was rewarded by the spectacle of mr paradine hovering on the outskirts of the crowd like an undersized sportsman trying to get a glimpse of a dog-fight hello uncle cooley how are you have a good voyage shall i get you a porter said bill efficiently why william said mr paradine turning and speaking with an agreeable cordiality i never expected to see you nice of you to come and meet me thought i might save you trouble with your trunks very good of you but i'll look after them myself i've got some valuable books i want to keep an eye on i'll meet you down the platform you'll find horace there the prospect of a chat with horace did not cause bill any noticeable elation but mr paradine who had now intercepted a passing porter and was pointing out trunks to him in the manner of a connoisseur exhibiting the gems of his collection to a sympathetic fellow enthusiast seemed anxious to be alone go along and talk to him he said that big one that little one and there are five more he added to the porter you'll find another friend of yours with him at least she said she knew you she girl named sheridan felicia sheridan niece of sinclair hammond the man i've come to stay with waterloo station is always in a seething and effervescent condition when a boat train comes in 
but to bill as he heard these words it seemed to boil and bubble like a cauldron travellers travellers friends travellers relations porters paper boys station masters and the persevering lad who was still trying to sell him oranges and chocolates danced before his eyes in a weird saraband the solid platform seemed to heave beneath his feet the whistle of an engine sounded like a scream of joy flick he gasped is is flick here but mr paradine was too busy to reply accompanied by the porter he was now in the centre of the maelstrom burrowing after trunks like a terrier in a rabbit warren bill though he would have liked to ask a number of questions respected his uncle's preoccupation and drawing a deep breath plunged down the platform with as much direct forcefulness as if he had been in sight of the enemy's goal line with a football under his arm indignant humanity scattered like smoke wreaths before him and presently after causing more hard feelings among his fellow creatures than a judge at a baby contest he came to a space that was comparatively open and there her hand in the uncouth paw of the boy horace stood flick in a world full of people who happening upon horace immediately wished him elsewhere nobody had ever wished him so far elsewhere as did bill at that moment not even mr sherman bastable in his least affectionate mood could have found the boy's society more distasteful his mere presence was bad enough but far worse was that look of sardonic scorn on his freckled face a look that seemed to ridicule all romance and wither it with a chilling blast for an instant bill had a sense of defeat there was something hideously immobile about the boy's attitude that seemed to suggest that nothing could shift him come one come all this platform shall fly from its firm base as soon as i his demeanour said and bill was at a loss to know what to do about it till suddenly an inspiration came to him few boys are averse from a quiet snack at any hour and horace was probably no exception to the rule hello horace he said you're looking tired and thin take this you'll find the refreshment room down there through those gates the words acted like some magic spell horace's stomach had that quality which optimists try to persuade us belongs to the ladder of fortune there was always plenty of room at the top without a word or indeed any acknowledgment unless a sharp grunt was intended for a speech of thanks he seized the money which bill was thrusting upon him and hurried off bill turned to flick who during this brief business interview had been drinking him in with round and astonished eyes flick said bill bill said flick you darling said bill i love you i love you i oranges and chocolates said a dispassionate voice at his elbow oranges sandwiches and chocolates with prismatic dreams of murder filling his mind bill turned apart from the fact that any interruption at such a moment would have affected him like a blow behind the ear from a sandbag he had supposed that in his previous conversations with this lad he had disposed once and for all of this matter of oranges and chocolates it was a perfectly straight issue to settle which both sides had only to show a little reasonableness and intelligence the boy thought bill wanted oranges and chocolates bill did not want oranges and chocolates and he had said so perfectly plainly yet it seemed now that they had been shouting at one another across seas of misunderstanding i don't want any oranges he said tensely chocolates suggested the boy chocolates for the lady the lady doesn't want chocolates sandwiches nor sandwiches 
bun sweets of all descriptions chocolate nut chocolate sandwiches oranges apples banbury cakes and bananas bill grasped flick's arm and hurried her along the platform it is supposed to be a universal illusion on the part of the young when in love that they are entirely alone in the world but bill great though his passion was could not achieve this state of mind waterloo station seemed to him absolutely congested how there were enough people in london large city though it was to fill it up to such an extent amazed him the entire population of the british isles together with visitors from every part of america seemed to have banded together to prevent him getting a quiet word with flick ever since you went away he resumed coming to a halt behind a luggage-laden truck i the truck became suddenly endowed with movement it thrust itself between them like a juggernaut and when it had passed and he was about to speak again a finger tapped him energetically upon the shoulder pardon me sir asked a voice in rich minnesotan but could you direct me to the telegraph office adversity makes strategists of us all bill grasped the other's arm and whirled him round i don't know myself he said but that boy over there could tell you the one with the orange and chocolate tray thank you sir thank you don't mention it flick darling said bill ever since you went away i've been perfectly miserable i couldn't make out at first what was the matter with me then i suddenly realized i've got to talk quick so get this i love you i i beg your pardon he broke off icily turning as he received a sharp prod in the ribs from what felt like the ferrule of an umbrella the stout woman with the brown veil flying from her hat repeated her question where can you get a porter bill spoke in an overwrought voice what there was about him that made all these people flock to him as to some human information bureau he was at a loss to understand goodness knew he had been trying to make his face look forbidding enough and yet they kept surging up to him in their thousands as if he were their guardian angel he began to feel like one of those ask mr holleran men whose cheery advertisements dot the roadside throughout long island anywhere around here they're popping about all over the place there's one over there standing by that boy with the chocolate and orange tray i don't see him he was there a moment ago the stout woman wandered away discontentedly her veil flying behind her bill turned to flick again by your leave sir a porter this time with a truck the irony of the situation afflicted bill here was a porter interrupting him doubtless in search of stout women with baggage and a moment before the stout woman had interrupted him in search of a porter it would have been a kindly act on his part to bring these kindred spirits together but he was otherwise occupied i know what you're saying he resumed you're saying what about alice coker never mind about alice coker that was a mere infatuation simply an infatuation i love you and only you and i believe i honestly believe i've loved you from the very first moment we met amazing how easy it was to talk to her like this the mere sight of her encouraged him to eloquence she radiated confidence and comfort it was as simple as telling an old friend that you were glad to see him no trace now he felt of that fluttering self-consciousness which had set him stammering under the queenly gaze of alice coker silly nonsense that had been imagining for a single moment that he could be in love with a girl who made him self-conscious the whole essence of love and bill now considered himself an expert on this subject was that it made you feel at home with a girl happy with her at your ease with her just as if she were a part of you flick darling he said let's go off and get married quick 
her eyes were smiling up into his the brightest bluest eyes that had ever danced in human face and waterloo station seemed to blaze with a brilliant and unearthly light it soothed every nerve in his body that smile of hers it set him aglow with a happiness beyond all dreaming it was like a lighted window welcoming a weary traveller home across the snow and taking advantage of the fact that this delightful station was full of people who were kissing one another he bent over with no more words and kissed flick and the kiss seemed like nothing so much as the formal affixing of a signature to a document whose pleasant terms had long since been agreed upon and settled it was so entirely simple so perfectly natural and in order and somehow it seemed to put matters on such a sound and satisfactory footing that for the first time since she had come to him out of this whirl of restless humanity he found himself able to talk coherently and conversationally well, what are you doing over here he asked i was just coming over to america to find you i ran short of money and i had to cable home and they cabled back that i was to go to your uncle he has brought me over but didn't alice coker look after you i never went near her why not oh why of course you wouldn't said bill with a flash of belated intelligence what a consummate fool i was ever to think you would the more i look back at myself the more it seems to me that of all the hopeless fools in the world i was the worst you weren't i was taking all that time to realize that i loved you do you really love me flicky of course i do i always have i'm hanged if i can see why said bill candidly i know you do i can feel it in my bones but why because you're the most wonderful man on earth by jove i believe i am anyway i feel i am when you look at me like that flick squeezed his arm bill darling what are we going to do bill looked at her in astonishment why get married as soon as ever we can that reminds me i shall have to be looking for work can't live on nothing but that will be all right i have a hunch that uncle cooley will come out strong all i need is a start it's going to be very difficult not a bit watch me i mean about me i'm supposed to have come back to marry roderick what you don't mean to say demanded bill with honest amazement that that silly business is still on do you mean to tell me that in this twentieth century people still think they can force a girl to marry someone she doesn't want to when you get a man like uncle george and a woman like aunt francie making up their minds it doesn't matter what century it is said flick simply you wouldn't do it said bill with a sudden swift spasm of fear of course i wouldn't said flick stoutly but oh bill darling we've got to hurry up and do something after what has happened i know as well as i know anything that i shall be a sort of prisoner at holly house i'm in disgrace i'm like a convict that has tried to escape i daren't risk running away again until everything is quite settled you must let me know the moment you're ready for me i'll write to you no don't they might see your letters and then it would be more difficult than ever she broke off bill whose eyes had never left her face saw her start what is it he asked bill said flick quickly in a low voice don't do a thing just stand where you are and try to look as if you were perfectly ordinary aunt francie is coming i might have guessed that she would be here to meet me the woman advancing up the platform was so exactly what bill would have imagined any sister of flick's uncle george that he had a feeling almost as if they were old acquaintances nevertheless he was far from being at his ease aunt francie was finding some difficulty in manoeuvring around a truck and flick seized the opportunity for further counsel 
stay where you are she'll think you're somebody i met on board how am i to let you know said bill hurriedly as the enemy appeared round the truck i've got it what paper do you take in the morning the daily record it's uncle george's paper watch the agony column whispered bill flick nodded briefly and turned to greet her formidable aunt aunt francie she exclaimed there was a noticeable chill in the bearing of mrs sinclair hammond as she pecked at the cheek of her erring niece mrs hammond had much to say to her of a nature that could not well be said in front of strangers the lecture of a lifetime hung on her firm lips only waiting for bill's departure to be released flick turned to bill good-bye mr rawlinson she said brightly extending her hand thank you so much for looking after me bill took his cue with a courteous bow in the direction of the more formidable than ever aunt francie he moved off down the platform he had as he went something of the emotions of a knight of old compelled by other engagements to ride off and leave a maiden at the mercy of a dragon End of chapter fourteen judson finds an old friend the waiter having brought coffee and cigars retired and bill leaning across the table spoke in a low and confidential voice chetty he said i've got something i want to tell you old man several times during the meal which had just come to a conclusion he had been meaning to speak but on each occasion the orchestra of the regent grill room which has a nasty habit of bursting at unexpected moments into la boheme and even louder classics had been seized with a spasm which had rendered low-voiced confidences impossible this had caused bill a good deal of annoyance for the necessity of confiding his affairs to a sympathetic ear had become imperative a week had elapsed since his momentous meeting with flick at waterloo station and all through that week he had been going about laden down with a secret which it had grown more and more irksome to keep to himself the time had arrived when he simply had to talk about it to someone and in all this great city there was no one except judson whom he could elect to the position of confidant judson puffed comfortably at his cigar spill it he said amiably he looked at his companion with friendly eyes apart from the fact that having a pleasant secret of his own tucked away in his bosom he was feeling well disposed towards all humanity he felt particularly genial towards bill during this past week all his old affection and esteem had returned bill for so long a blighted flower had suddenly revived as if someone had poured water on him he had gone whistling about the flat and to-night had reached such heights of jovial camaraderie as actually to suggest a dinner at the regent followed by a visit to the alhambra review judson thoroughly approved of the change bill looked about him cautiously the waiter had disappeared the nearest diners were out of earshot the orchestra its fever past was convalescing limply and seemed incapable of further noise for quite a time he felt justified in continuing i wonder he said if you've noticed that i have seemed somehow different these last few days i should say so assented judson cordially much more the little ray of sunshine well i'll tell you why juddy old man i've discovered what love really means what again said judson bill frowned confidants ought to be more tactful if you're thinking of alice he said that was just infatuation i see this time it's the real thing ah what do you mean ah demanded bill he was sensitive nothing old man nothing just ah 
surely said judson who came of a free race a fellow can say ah you said it as if you thought i wasn't serious not a bit of it i was only thinking thinking what well isn't it a bit rapid i mean to say a week ago you were raving about alice and it seems to have taken you just seven days to forget her and tack on to someone else not that i'm blaming you mind said judson handsomely i admire a quick worker bill knocked his cigar ash against his coffee cup he was wishing that he had not been so peculiarly situated as to be compelled to waste his finest thoughts on a fellow like judson no soul there you had judson coker in two words all right within his limitations and a pleasant chap to exchange trivialities with but no soul i don't know what you mean by a quick worker he said perhaps it doesn't seem quick to you said judson pacifically i've known flick for years ah flick said judson with enthusiasm now there's a girl in a million if you'd been in love with flick i am in love with flick now let's get this thing straight said judson he drank coffee to clear his mind the entertainment had been on a strictly teetotal basis but nevertheless he was feeling slightly foggy a week ago you were crazy about my sister alice then you switched to this other girl you're telling me about and now you say you're in love with flick i don't get it bill old man i don't get it sounds to me as if you were headed straight for bigamy not he added broad-mindedly that i've anything personally against bigamy must be nice to have two homes to go to bill groaned in spirit better to have poured out his heart into a dictaphone than to be squandering words on this poor worm if you had twice as much sense you'd be half-witted he said sourly can't you understand that i've been talking about flick all the time you mean flick's the girl you're in love with groped judson the second girl i mean not the third girl there isn't any third girl said bill between his teeth but you said there was i didn't i should have thought that any one with one ounce more brains than a billiard ball could have understood i've suddenly realized that flick is the only girl i have ever loved ah now i see flick is the only girl you have ever loved well it's a pity you didn't find it out before you let her go off to america if she hadn't gone to america i might never have known what i felt well what are you going to do send her a cable she's back no really yes i found her at waterloo last saturday when i went to meet my uncle bill's voice shook i told her that i loved her juddy and she said she loved me atta boy what she can see in me said bill i can't imagine no assented judson heartily no but there's a difficulty you see she has come back to marry that man pike judson started not the fellow who said it was toddy van reiter who founded the silks good lord bill you must stop that that would never do i've nothing against toddy toddy i may as well tell you has come out of the business extremely well i had a letter from him this morning but this bird pike is one of the worst on no account must you permit a corker like flick to marry him i won't said bill firmly but you see the position 
she got broke in new york and was scared and cabled her people that she wanted to come home they fixed it up for her to come home but naturally it was on the understanding that she went ahead and married the fellow pike the world's worst said judson the world's very punkest it must not be it isn't going to be said bill impatiently but you see the difficulty obviously she can't run away from home again until she is quite certain that i can look after her and just at present it's difficult to see how i am going to be able to look after her unless i get in really strong with my uncle you want to expose that crook slingsby and then he would eat out of your hand but how do we know he is a crook he is bill old man he is said judson earnestly i didn't tell you before but i went to get a drink out of him one night and he palmed off a cup of cocoa on me saying that it contained nourishing fats and now flick writes and tells me that they are trying to rush this wedding through said bill i've been putting messages in the agony column of the record every day so we've kept in touch and this morning i got a letter from her saying that they want to have the wedding come off next week i seem to see myself letting them do it growled bill if they try to start anything like that i'll take flick away and marry her and get a job of some kind any sort of a job just something that will carry us along till i make good hmm yes said judson doubtfully the only trouble is bill old man when it comes to getting jobs i should imagine that you're a sort of halfway henry a halfway henry a fellow with not enough brains to own streets and too much to sweep them explained judson i'll sweep em if it comes to that you don't know what love is or you would realize that a man will do anything for the girl he wants to marry the butterfly existence of a bachelor suited judson so perfectly that this sort of thing was rather above his head can't say i've ever wanted to marry myself he mused still i suppose there's something to be said for it must make a fellow feel pretty good i imagine to get up and say no more boys not any more for me got to be going now little woman waiting for me at home exactly agreed bill pleasantly surprised at this evidence of sentiment in one whom he had supposed incapable of the finer emotions but then proceeded judson thoughtfully there's the other side of the picture when you sneak home at three in the morning and tiptoe up the steps and shove the key quietly into the keyhole which you carefully oiled the day before and turn the lock without a sound only to discover that she has put the chain on the door you've got to look at it from every angle bill old man bill beckoned to the waiter who had reappeared and was hovering in a meaning manner about the table he was too revolted for speech once more he was regretting that necessity had compelled him ever to make a confidant of such a man he paid the bill in silence and rose from the table one thing i've thought of said judson trotting in his wake down the aisle you'll have to get a license suppose you have to make a quick job of it you'll need a license can't get action without a license i've got a license said bill coldly and spoke no more till they were in their seats at the alhambra then it was only to say shut up to his companion whose researches in the program had caused him to start babbling excitedly but it must be the same judson was arguing with animation thrusting his program into bill's face and indicating the name of one of the personnel of the ensemble with an eager finger prudence striker 
such an unusual name must be the same girl i used to know in the follies back in new york i'll tell you in a second directly the chorus come on yes there she is second girl from that end well i'm darned fancy her being over here he relapsed into a momentary silence only to emerge once more with a long and rambling story told in a hissing undertone about the night when he and jimmy boole and freddy osgood and miss stryker and a pal of miss stryker's whose name was on the tip of his tongue and a pal of miss stryker's pal whose name had sounded like biscuit only it could hardly be that anyway something that had sounded very like biscuit had gone to celebrate jimmy's birthday down at that place in greenwich village and freddy had got so plastered and tried to play the trap drums though in his calmer moments mark you freddy would have been the first to admit that he knew about as much about playing trap drums as shut up said bill oh all right said judson aggrieved anyway it's the same girl there is a brisk delirium about a modern review which while entertaining to the care-free mind has the unfortunate effect of irritating the man on whose soul anything in the nature of a deep problem is weighing it was not long before bill rendered distrait by thoughts of that letter from flick began to regret that he had been foolish enough to suggest this expedition the blare of the music and the restlessness of the chorus afflicted his nerves by the time the curtain fell at the end of the first portion of the entertainment he was convinced that he could endure no more what he wanted was a long walk i'm going home he announced going home gasped judson but look here you needn't come if you want to sit out the rest of it i want to get away and think oh think all right then see you later bill left the alhambra and crossing leicester square wandered aimlessly in the direction of piccadilly after the heat and turmoil of the theatre the cool night air was like a caress the sky was a deep and mysterious blue picked out with little stars that winked down at him as he walked as if they knew how he felt and would have liked to do something to help it was a night for lovers to stand beneath their lady's window and bill stopped so abruptly that he was nearly run down by a taxicab he wondered he had not thought of that before obviously there was but one place for him on such a night he hailed the taxi which after some slight eloquence on the part of its driver was about to move on wimbledon common he said end of chapter fifteen a dinner engagement for bill london was a dead and empty city when bill turned the corner into the prince of wales road battersea even the coffee stall at the end of the road was silent and deserted just how late it was he did not know for his watch like time itself seemed to have stopped he was dimly aware of a not unpleasant fatigue for like judson on a previous occasion he had walked all the way back from wimbledon not as had been the case with judson because he had to but because his uplifted mood made any other form of locomotion impossible lovers are a curious and unpractical race if bill had been asked what he imagined himself to have gained by his journey to holly house and those hours of silent sentinel duty in the shadows of its garden he would not have been able to say yet he was not conscious of having wasted his time the fact too that it had been quite impossible for one with his slight knowledge of the topography of the house to guess which of those windows whose lights had gone out one by one as he watched belonged to flick did not in any way take the edge off his fervour 
for all he knew he might have been expending his emotional energy on the window of his uncle cooley or even on that of mrs hammond but he did not care he had done the only thing possible on such a night and now he was ready to drop into bed and dream of quickly made fortunes and a life lived happily ever after he climbed the five flights of stairs that led to number nine marmont mansions and stepping delicately to avoid waking judson reached his room ten minutes later he was asleep exactly when it was that he was woken by a noise that sounded like the sudden collapse of the roof he could not have said the evidence of his window which had been an oblong of black and was now an oblong of dingy grey seemed to point to the fact of several hours having passed he was on the point of dismissing the noise as part of a dream when the sound of a hearty chuckle outside his door came to convince him of its reality there was somebody in the passage and however unpleasant it might be to get out of bed it behooved him to go and look into the matter only an idiot burglar would burgle a place like this and laugh while doing so but even idiot burglars must be thrown out by the conscientious householder bill put on a pair of slippers grasped a chair as the handiest weapon and charged forth the noise had evidently been caused by the falling of the hat stand and what had caused the hat stand to fall had just as evidently been the efforts of judson coker to hang his hat on it he was now leaning placidly against the front door and he turned a happy face in bill's direction as the latter came out of his room he was still in full evening dress with the exception of the white tie conventionally worn with that costume this he had apparently lost or given away and in place of this he was decorated with a ribbon of light blue of the kind used to adorn the female hair hanging diagonally athwart his shirt front and giving him a vaguely ambassadorial look his hair was disordered and he beamed at bill with an almost overpowering friendliness battersea at that moment contained no sunnier man than judson coker hello bill old man he cried jubilantly say i can't get this darn thing to stand up bill old man every time i try to make it stand up it falls down and every time it falls down it makes the most awful noise and every time it makes the most awful noise i try to stand it up and every time i try to stand it up it falls down and every time uh, where was i he asked puzzled bill lowered his chair and regarded him sternly then stooped and restored the hat stand to an upright position judson who had watched the process with a tense interest which would have been almost excessive if his friend had been trying to walk a tight-rope across niagara falls uttered an excited cry you did it there was nothing petty or envious no hidden note of jealousy about his admiration you did it first shot you're a better man than i am gunga Din don't make such an infernal noise you're quite right bill old man noise yes but not infernal noise well bill proceeded judson genially it's great seeing you again after all this long time yes sir that's what it is great what have you been doing with yourself sit down and tell me all about it what have you been doing that's what i would like to know judson nodded owlishly you're absolutely right bill absolutely right you're always absolutely right and a great gift it is too nothing to beat it well bill old man i've been out to supper 
You remember my pointing out a girl to you at the Al Al? Al Al. Wait, said Judson with dignity, raising a compelling hand. Lots of fellows think I can't say the word. Oh, yes, they do. It's all over London that I cannot pronounce the word Al Ham Burr. But I can, I can, I can, and I'm glad, glad, glad. Where was I? Bill, somewhat recovered now from the moroseness which comes to those abruptly awakened in the small hours, was growing interested. Did you meet someone who took you to supper? he asked. No, sir, replied Judson with a touch of hauteur i was the one that took some one to supper yes i know what you're going to say you're going to say where did i get the money to take some one to supper and very frank and honest of you too to say so manly that's what i call it manly i got that money bill old man because i've got a head you'll have one to-morrow all right said bill unkindly a smart business head resumed judson lots of fellows haven't got smart business heads and where are they streeping the sweets you know what i did well listen then because you're a young man trying to get along and this'll be useful to you alhambra i've said it once and i can say it again you remember that piece there was in all the london papers about toddy van reiter founding the silks well i clipped that out and mailed it to toddy and told him i'd had it put in all the london papers because he was a young man trying to get along and i wanted to do him a good turn at the same time and mark this bill always bearing in mind the word alhambra at the same time i asked him to lend me a hundred smackers <laughs> and what ensued he sent em they arrived this morning and that's what i say to you and i want to lay stress on this bill that any one who thinks that just because i've been having a bite of supper i can't say the word alhambra lies lies said judson waving his hand spaciously and restoring his balance by a swift snatch at the hat-stand in his teeth and you know as well as i do bill that it's the worst possible thing to lie in your teeth because four in every five will get pyorrhea you'd better go to bed said bill i will agreed judson with a sage nod of his smart business head that's just one little thing that i will do i'd like he went on eyeing the hat-stand with sudden truculence to see the man who will stop me going to bed that's me blunt and straightforward and if people don't like it they can do the other thing i'm going to bed just like that this way said bill watch your step funny you should have said that bill old man <laughs> chuckled judson it's just what that girl said the girl i met at the al how he halted bill there's something at the back of my mind that i want to tell you something important but what is it ah there you have me but it'll come back oh yes it'll come back never forget that bill however black the sky however dark the outlook it'll come back it'll come well good night bill old man mustn't keep me up said judson and with a brief alhambra 
vanished into his room daylight was now streaming pinkly in through the window and the bird population of battersea park had begun to greet it with a vociferous chirping the light and the noise combined prevented bill from dropping off to sleep which was just as well for an hour later his door opened and judson made his appearance clad now in a suit of blue pajamas just looking in to tell you that thing i forgot said judson it came to me in a flash only half a minute ago well judson plunged into thoughtful silence for a moment uh, sorry he said forgotten it again <laughs> good night old man he retired bill closed his eyes and after what seemed the lapse of a few minutes awoke to find that the morning was well advanced so well advanced that he could hear down the passage as he opened his door the pleasing sound of one who prepared breakfast he made his way to the bathroom to the accompaniment of a musical snoring from behind judson's closed door it was only after bill had finished breakfast and was reading the sunday papers that the heir of the cokers presented himself a trifle pale he seemed nevertheless in far better condition than one meeting him some hours back would have supposed possible his mental equilibrium also seemed to have re-established itself he bade bill a subdued but friendly good morning and drank four cups of coffee in rapid succession did i dream it he said or did i make a certain amount of noise coming in last night seemed to remember crashing into something that was when you upset the hat stand the hat stand said judson pleased that was the clue i wanted now it all comes back to me how much did i tell you old man when i came in or didn't i i seem to remember having a chat with you you told me toddy von reiter had sent you a hundred dollars that's right judson helped himself to more coffee but declined with a gentle shake of the head and the soft sad smile of a suffering saint bill's offer of scrambled eggs in fact he confessed with reference to these wholesome foodstuffs i don't believe i can even stand a sight of them you might put a paper up in front of your plate bill thanks it's funny about eggs on the morning after they sort of look at you <laughs> he drank deeply from his coffee cup well now let's see did i tell you about taking prudence stryker to supper you told me you took someone to supper that's right prudence stryker the girl i pointed out to you a dear old pal of mine back in new york remind me some time to tell you about the night she and i and jimmy bull and freddie osgood thanks said bill you told me about that at the alhambra did i oh well there she was prancing about on the stage last night and after the show i popped round and took her out for a bite of supper we had quite a good time so i gathered got in with a bunch of hearty mixers and went on to a fellow's apartment just a nice home evening it wasn't till about half past three in the morning that the people in the apartment below sent for the police well what i'm trying to tell you bill is that prudence handed me a bit of information that's going to send you singing up and down battersea park road i meant to tell you last night only it slipped my memory you're sure you remember it now i certainly do it was about that mutt slingsby slingsby bill laid down his knife and fork the better to attend for the first time he permitted himself to hope that this news of judson's might really be of importance how does slingsby come into it judson shook his head sadly as one mourning over the wickedness of the world slingsby treated that poor girl darn badly bill o man i didn't get an absolute stranglehold on the facts of the case because 
between ourselves i wasn't feeling as bright as i could have wished at the moment but i did get on to this that prudence and this fellow slingsby were extremely matey for quite a time and then he sneaked off and started going around with a girl from the gaiety and one thing leading to another prudence did the square straightforward thing by blacking his eye and passing out of his life forever she blacked his eye then that was exactly it happened the night before flick went to work in his office but that's neither here nor there old man i'm coming to the really important part we somehow or other got talking about you and i mentioned that you were old paradine's nephew and had come over to london to try to find out why the profits on the old boy's business had fallen off and then she said that you were just the fellow she wanted to meet because she could put you wise to where the dirty work was bill sat up excitedly there really has been dirty work as far as i could gather from prudence it has been running on all six cylinders for years and here's the point i was verging on a state which you might call pie-eyed when she told me but i gathered this much that one night slingsby who must have been pretty well tanked himself to do such a bonehead thing confided the whole business to her told her everything old oh, man where the body was buried and all about it the way fellows you would ordinarily think darned shrewd level-headed birds make goofs of themselves with women beats me look at samson or mark antony for the matter of that the bigger they are sighed judson the harder they fall but what was it what has slingsby been up to ah now that said judson she didn't tell me because she's saving it up for you she wants to give you the low-down in person so that you can hand it on to the old man thereby doing slingsby dirt and putting him where he belongs i've arranged everything you're to give her dinner to-night to-night this very night i'll come too if you like no thanks sure no trouble you know quite sure thanks very well said judson resignedly maybe you're right at that he went on after a moment's meditation the idea of a quiet evening and an early bed doesn't look so bad to me i'm bound to admit for some reason or other i've got an odd sort of headachey feeling to-day i guess it's the weather well she will meet you at mario's at eight fifteen you can't miss her tall dark handsome girl built rather on the lines of a motor truck mario's said bill no hang it all not mario's eh why not mario's is sacred it was there that i dined with flick the last time we had dinner together before she went off to america you'll go to mario's and like it said judson firmly good heavens you can't expect the girl to start chopping and changing just to humour your whims it's darned decent ever to take the trouble to meet you at all yes admitted bill i suppose it is eight fifteen sharp in the lobby then you won't have any difficulty spotting her she'll be wearing a red dress she's rather spanish in appearance with great gleaming eyes and a good lot of teeth ugh eh said judson sharply nothing she's a thoroughly nice girl full of pep you'll like her i will if she really tells me something important about slingsby gosh juddy do you realize that this may mean the straightening out of everything if she can tell me as much as you think she can i shall be in the strongest possible position with uncle cooley aces and eights agreed judson 
and then i shall be able to take flick away from those confounded people of hers and marry her without any more delay juddy you don't know how i feel about flick she's like a wonderful inspiration sometimes when i'm sitting all alone i can see her face with those dear blue eyes of hers judson reached for the referee and hoisted it defensively in front of him there are limits to the obligations of friendship some other time old man he said End of chapter 16sunday night at mario's the spirit of optimism and joviality which has just been shown sweetening the daily round of number nine marmont mansions battersea had found during the week which had passed since flick's arrival no counterpart at holly house wimbledon in spite of the fact that the return of prodigals is almost proverbially associated with joyful revelings and effervescent gaiety on the part of the whole strength of the company with the possible exception of the fatted calf flick had found little to cheer her in the atmosphere of her revisited home and day by day in every way she had had need to fill her mind with thoughts of bill in order to prevent depression claiming her for its own the lecture which her aunt frances had begun on the platform of waterloo station had continued intermittently throughout the week and at seven o'clock on sunday evening it gushed up into such a freshet of eloquence that mr sinclair hammond bursting the bonds of years put his foot down and asserted himself with a mild man's impressive ferocity flick said mr hammond interrupting his wife's remarks in an odd strained voice yes uncle sinclair just run away for a moment will you mrs hammond directed at him the gaze which had so often sent him cowering back among his books but to-night it had no effect hell hath no fury like a mild and peace-loving man who has at last decided to give battle and mr hammond was strong with the strength of one who has been simmering for a week in a fury of suppressed animosity just as bill west another mild man could be roused by a blow on the head with a stick so could sinclair hammond be stirred to action by the spectacle of flick whom he loved being talked to and talked at and nagged and harried and generally rendered miserable i am speaking to felicia said mrs hammond frostily get out flicky said mr hammond with a twisted half smile and flick left the room mrs hammond turned majestically on her husband unlike the king of france she had no one to warn her that this was no mere revolt but a revolution which was to destroy her supremacy in the home for ever and she endeavoured to crush him in the old familiar way be quiet said mr hammond and mrs hammond was quiet you've got to stop it francie said mr hammond mildly but holding her with a glittering eye you've had plenty of time to say all there was any need to say on the subject of flick's leaving home and now you've finished do you understand definitely and completely finished i won't have the poor kid worried any more and to remove temptation from your path i am now going to take her out to dinner somewhere i am going to transport her to where there are lights and music and good dyspepsia promoting food the band will play the lights will gleam who knows i may even dance with her and when we come home probably at about six in the morning you will welcome her with your famous smile 
you will dig up a motherly embrace and your pleasant chatter will deal exclusively with the brighter side of life do i make myself clear but sinclair protested mrs hammond and there was an awe-struck note of appeal in her voice you can't take felicia out to dinner george is coming to dinner your brother george said mr hammond is a man whom in many ways i respect and admire but as a dinner-table companion for flick at this particular moment he fails to qualify he would lecture flick and i do not intend to have her lectured but he will think it so odd if felicia is not here to meet him wailed mrs hammond mr hammond kissed her affectionately on the forehead he was very fond of francie he may be able said mr hammond frivolously to get an article for pike's weekly out of it famous nieces who have behaved oddly to famous uncles well i must be going up to dress i suppose it means a white waistcoat he sighed ah well we must all make sacrifices in this world he kissed mrs hammond again and left the room humming flick he called flick came out of the morning-room flicky said mr hammond we're a couple of reckless young fellows out for a good time how would you like to come and have dinner somewhere somewhere low and vulgar let's go to one of those night clubs which are living hells that society spice writes about flick gazed at him for a moment with an incredulous awe dearly as she loved her uncle sinclair she had always recognized his limitations and this was open rebellion this was hoisting the skull and crossbones wouldn't it be lovely she said wistfully it will be lovely mr hammond corrected but uncle george is coming to dinner flick reminded him i know think how jolly it will be to revel in some gay cafe and feel that uncle george is sitting snugly all the while in yonder dining-room it'll be like turning on the cold shower and standing over by the bathroom door watching it flick hugged him you're a darling uncle sinclair well i got a kind of idea that a little change would do you no harm to-night where shall we go do you know a good hell let's go to mario's mario's a new name to me considering that i am one of the wild and depraved younger generation they are always writing about nowadays i know very little of london's west end will it be devilish enough for me i want a place where i can throw bread at people how is the bread throwing at mario's splendid all the best shots go there mario's was the place where young lord trevelyan picked off six waiters with six consecutive rolls six said mr hammond musingly ah oh, well we must see what we can do but how do you come to know of this low resort i went there once flick hesitated with somebody hm oh ah said mr hammond he scrutinized her a little closely and his manner took on a certain gravity who took you to mario's flicky bill west mr paradine's nephew you remember my telling you about him in the garden that day i remember so he is over in this country and you have met him again yes flicky said mr hammond i know you will think me an awful old bore but i'm afraid i shall have to begin dinner by talking what you might call shop you won't mind i don't mind anything you do uncle sinclair right said mr hammond cheerfully i ought to get finished by about the fish course and after that we'll start throwing bread were these waiters that lord trevelyan bagged sitting or on the wing rocketing indeed said mr hammond well well we can only do our best hurry up and get some clothes on flicky 
I'm off to dig my white waistcoat out of the mothballs. Flag that waiter, old love, said Miss Prudence Stryker, indicating a sprinting martyr who was whizzing about among the crowded tables in his efforts to do the work of two ordinary men and remind him that when he was a little boy he promised to bring us a bottle of lanson bill beamed politely and turned to do her behest waiter louder recommended miss stryker less of the pekinese and a bit more of the bloodhound waiter that's better you've got a nice voice if you studied and had it developed you'd make a good train announcer bill beamed again it seemed to him that he had been beaming through a dreadful eternity if it is true that a man may smile and smile and be a villain it is equally the case that he may beam and beam and yet be in an extremely acute state of discomfort bill was not enjoying his evening out at mario's celebrated night club even in the remote days when he had been wont to add his presence to those parties in new york of which judson coker had been the life and soul bill had never really derived much pleasure from this type of entertainment indeed even before his mistaken infatuation for alice coker had turned his thoughts to deeper things he had come quite definitely to the conclusion that parties bored him to extinction to be at home at these bohemian revels a man has to have a nimble wit he must be a strong kidder a good scout and a great old josher and must possess in addition an interior of cast steel and asbestos bill was deficient in all these qualities his interior put up practically no resistance after the second or third cocktail and no one was more keenly alive than he to the fact that he was a poor josher an indifferent scout and hardly to be reckoned a kidder at all by an impartial critic the present occasion was proving even more exacting than those other orgies then he had been one of a crowd while now he was in the position of having to shoulder the whole weight of the entertainment himself and it had proved a considerable weight apart from the fact that the holy associations of the place made it distasteful for him to dine there with anybody but flick there was a flamboyant exuberance about miss prudence stryker which had oppressed him from the very moment when she had sailed forward to meet him in the lobby the accuracy of judson's description of her had come home to him right from the start judson had said that she was built on the lines of a motor truck she was judson had said that she would be wearing a red dress she was though the adjective was almost feeble judson had said that she was full of pep this also was true the only point on which judson had gone astray was in his prediction that bill would like miss stryker he did not he would have been hard put to it to name any other living person whom he disliked more he disliked her large and gleaming eyes he disliked her impressive physique he disliked the tendency which she had developed as early as the soup course to address him as old love and most of all he disliked the way she bent forward and laughed merrily in his face and her habit of pointing her witticisms by slapping him on the arm as mr wilfred slingsby had discovered at an earlier date prudence stryker was a girl of muscle and her slaps were like the kicks of a playful horse nevertheless he persevered miss stryker whatever her surface faults had one outstanding merit that eclipsed them all she was the girl who knew where mr slingsby had buried the body and as such must be conciliated so bill though speculating wanly as to what she would be like if the waiter ever brought that lanson brought the old bulldog courage of the west to bear and set himself grimly to see the thing through the exact nature of the body which mr slingsby had buried 
refused to reveal itself all through the age-long meal miss stryker stoutly declined to talk what she described as business confining herself to snappy anecdote and mirthful jest all that bill had gleaned by the time the coffee arrived was that mr slingsby's secret was a pippin well worth waiting for and in the interval of waiting he managed to achieve such a creditable imitation of a vivacious host that miss stryker formally stamped him with the seal of her approval as a good kid and as everybody knows it is but a step from being a good kid to being a good scout and from there a mere amble to the giddy eminence of a great old josher shortly after bill had reached the good scout stage miss stryker expressed a desire to dance bill rose politely the idea of dancing with his fair guest was one that filled him with loathing but in pursuance of his policy of conciliation he forced himself to do it it was at the moment when they were circling round the room for the second time that flick entered the restaurant with her uncle sinclair and mounted the stairs that led to the balcony as a vague concession to old-fashioned propriety mr hammond had decided on a table in the balcony in preference to one on the main floor the main floor a glance told him was infested to no little extent by brilliant creatures who while doubtless good-hearted and kind to their mothers seemed to him better seen at a distance the balcony to which are banished those who visit mario's without dressing had the appearance of being ninety-nine per cent pure his white waistcoat would be wasted there but that could not be helped how long bill danced he could not have said the process seemed interminable from time to time the music would stop and they would return for a brief instant to their table only to spring up once more at the bidding of the saxophones eventually however just as he was beginning to feel that miss stryker's powerful form must be constructed of india rubber she confessed to a desire for temporary repose they sat down and bill feeling that if he missed this opportunity another would not occur until he was too weary to understand what she said leaned forward i wish you would tell me about slingsby he pleaded want to know about that said miss stryker amiably i do indeed well then listen kid said miss stryker here it comes bill hitched his chair a few inches nearer and beamed devotedly into her face miss stryker with a preliminary slap at his throbbing arm began to speak mr hammond tugged at his waistcoat which had grown mysteriously tight since its last public appearance and looked down interestedly over the rail at the throng below nothing in this modern life of ours flicky he said is more significant than the attitude of the good and respectable towards sunday evening places like this are the outward and visible signs of the inward and spiritual change that has taken place in the life of the english family twenty years ago a man of my decent stodginess and unblemished reputation would never have dreamed of moving out of his home on sunday night twenty years ago i would have spent the concluding hours of the sabbath surrounded by my loved ones beneath my own roof tree there would have been supper consisting of rather red cold beef rather wet salad cold clammy apple pie blancmange and a very big very yellow cheese this would have been followed by hymns in the drawing-room or possibly if our views were a little lax by some round game played with pencils and pieces of paper the fact that i am here and strongly tempted to drop a sardine on the head of that bald gentleman down below is due to what they call the march of progress mr hammond helped himself to hors d'oeuvres having relieved myself of which prosy reflections 
he said i will now turn the conversation to the subject of your previous visit to this place how did you happen to come here bill brought me he had been here once before with mr slingsby mr paradine's manager in london and now about william said mr hammond tell me all flick's kitten eyes searched his face gravely she was wondering what would be the result if she really did tell him all if she confided in him the twin facts that she loved bill and that bill loved her and the additional fact that as soon as ever he gave the word she proposed to elope with him consideration for her uncle sinclair's feelings caused her to decide against this course it would have been comforting to herself to pour out her secret and she knew that she could have relied on him to keep it but it would be at the expense of his peace of mind poor darling how he would worry i happened to meet bill the day i left home she said and so you see when i was by myself in london i naturally saw quite a lot of him i see said mr hammond doubtfully i used to dine with him a good deal i see and one of the times he brought me here mr hammond crumbled his bread i seem to recollect your telling me in the garden that day that this william had been the ideal of your girlish dreams did he still exercise a spell when you met him again he's very nice said flick guardedly you didn't tell him i suppose that you had once worshipped the ground he trod on bill was in love with somebody else when i met him again in london mr hammond looked relieved ah he said madly and desperately said flick bubbling he had twelve photographs of her in his sitting-room mr hammond's relief was now complete he attacked his roast chicken with gusto i'm bound to admit flicky he said that you've taken a weight off my mind you may have suspected occasionally during the past few years that i am mildly fond of you i am a battered old hulk but with little to live for i thought you said you were one of the younger generation never mind for purposes of my big speech i am a battered old hulk with but little to live for except the happiness of my golden-haired child i wish i had been your child said flick wistfully how simple everything would have been then wouldn't it if you mean that you would have twisted me round your finger even more easily than you do at present you are probably right i've been a good deal worried about you my flicky i want to see you doing the right thing and i've come to the conclusion that your marrying young roderick will be the right thing the mere fact that he will eventually inherit several million pounds gives him a great glamour in my eyes i never knew you were so sordid if i loved a man i wouldn't mind how poor he was brave words child but never forget poverty is the banana skin on the doorstep of romance what are you gazing at so intensely you have a spellbound look flick had been watching the gyrating couples on the floor below she withdrew her gaze with a start as he spoke and turned to him once more had mr hammond been an observant man he would have noticed that her eyes had widened into a curiously fixed stare and that about the corners of her mouth there was an oddly pinched look but he was not an observant man moreover he was smoking now and the cigar which he had purchased in a somewhat doubting spirit was proving of such rare excellence that his mood had become dreamy and introspective i was looking at those people down there dancing said flick she seemed to speak with difficulty weird creatures said mr hammond puffing comfortably 
flick scrawled hieroglyphics on the tablecloth with nervous digs of her coffee spoon uncle sinclair she said at last i suppose men are always falling in love with girls it has been known to occur admitted mr hammond i mean thinking they are in love with girls and really not being in love with any particular girl but oh i don't know how to put it i mean there is a sort of man who might pretend he was in love with a girl and and really seem to mean it and make her think he meant it while all the while he was perfectly happy with other girls and forgot all about her after they had been separated for a day or two i should imagine a great many young men were like that unless they have changed a lot since my day constancy is a shy plant that blossoms only in the sunshine of middle age except of course added mr hammond hastily in the case of a young fellow like roderick you wouldn't find him doing that sort of thing i wasn't thinking of roderick said flick she traced another intricate pattern on the tablecloth the little muscles working about her mouth i suppose you're right uncle sinclair in what respect i mean about being sensible i suppose well what you'd call romance is rather silly isn't it and the only thing to do is to be sensible that is my opinion given for what it is worth though mind you i don't think that you would have any cause to complain of lack of romance where roderick was concerned the boy drips with it look at that tie he wears if you were a girl uncle sinclair would you marry a man if you found out you couldn't trust him what do you mean well suppose someone had pretended that he was in love with you and then you suddenly found out that all the time he was going about with other girls dining with them and dancing and flick shot a swift glance over the balcony rail and beaming up into their beastly faces as if he thought them the most wonderful thing in the world she went on viciously wouldn't that make you feel you had made a mistake mr hammond patted her hand paternally don't you worry flicky he said roderick isn't that sort of chap not that sort of chap at all if he was i would be the first to advise you to have nothing whatever to do with him a fellow you can't trust isn't any good to anybody End of chapter seventeen black monday to many people in this age of rush and hurry indeed one might say to most people the early hours of monday morning are the worst of the week for it is then that the soul enfeebled by the soft ease of saturday afternoon and sunday winces painfully from the thought of resuming the white man's burden and going to work again mr wilfred slingsby as he sat at breakfast in his house in bruton street on the morning after bill's dinner with miss stryker experienced nothing of this monday feeling everything seemed to him for the best in the best of all possible worlds his eye was bright and his mind at peace as he ate his kidneys on toast and read the pile of morning papers heaped beside his plate most men are content with a single newspaper to help them through breakfast certain sybarites read two mr slingsby's pile contained every journal published in london not a single sheet however humble was unrepresented in that mountain of literature but his reading was that of a specialist a glance at each periodical was enough for him before he threw it on the floor only one section of these papers interested him that devoted to theatrical reviews the previous saturday night had seen the opening of a new and sprightly farce tell it to papa at the bijou theatre and this had the distinction of being the first theatrical venture for which mr slingsby had assumed sole financial responsibility and it seemed from the papers to-day 
as it had seemed from the sunday papers yesterday that he had stumbled upon a gold mine mr slingsby finished the last review and leaned back in his chair a happy man it is the dream of all those alchemists who dabble in theatrical ventures to discover one day the philosopher's stone to produce a historic farce one of those farces which flare over the horizon about once in every twenty years and after a record-breaking career in london go on running for ever in the provinces and this dream judging from the criticisms of the press taken in conjunction with the enthusiasm of the first-night audience mr slingsby seemed to have achieved he finished his breakfast smoked a leisurely cigar and rang for his car to take him down to the city complete happiness was mr slingsby's no thought of any damocles sword suspended above his head came to mar his joy from this day forward he was on velvet he could abandon his commercial career and live the life of a leisured gentleman confining his activities to smoking big cigars and telling dramatists that their second acts needed a lot of work done on them as the car stopped outside his office building his heart was leaping high larks did not actually sing in the sky above st mary axe but to mr slingsby they seemed to be singing so exalted was his mood that he beamed upon henry the office boy like a father and was in two minds about giving him half a crown gentlemen waiting to see you sir said henry gentlemen eh said mr slingsby almost adding tra la la where is he i showed him into your office sir quite right chanted mr slingsby just managing to check his right foot from executing a dance step any name mr west sir mr west eh ah mr west yes yes he curvetted into the private office ah west said mr slingsby jovially while the air seemed to echo with the clash of cymbals and the note of flutes hope i haven't kept you waiting he had kept him waiting but bill did not mind that bill had come early and intended to stay late good morning he said frigidly he wanted no friendly overtures from this blue-chinned man he was about to execute the spiritual equivalent of hitting mr slingsby over the head with a hatchet and he resented the other's ebullient chumminess sit down make yourself comfortable have a cigar said mr slingsby bill sat down but waved away the proffered corona he waved it away with much the same cold aloofness which an executioner might have exhibited towards a cigar case extended by a prisoner at the block he was feeling like an executioner the conversation which he had had at mario's with miss stryker had made it plain to him that mr slingsby had indeed revealed to that lady the location of the body's interment and the body was one of such magnitude that he marvelled at any man even when a good bit tanked and under the weakening influence of love confiding such a secret to anybody i came here this morning he began you weren't by any chance at the opening of tell it to papa at the bijou on saturday were you interrupted mr slingsby no said bill i a riot my dear fellow cried mr slingsby a positive knockout not a single paper either yesterday or this morning that doesn't rave its head off it's the first show i have ever owned outright and it's the biggest winner since charlie's aunt in fact between ourselves i shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't make even more money costs nothing to run three acts with only one set an ordinary interior and looks like playing to capacity for a couple of years it's a funny thing the way people let these gold mines slip away from them i know for a certain fact that at least six managers turned it down cold it was quite by accident that it came my way 
but i know a good play when i see one and the moment i read the first act i may as well tell you right away said bill i knew i was on to a winner even then of course i didn't know how big it really was but i knew it couldn't fail there's one scene where the fellow loses his trousers the mere accident of mr slingsby pausing at this moment to relight his cigar enabled bill to escape hearing the entire plot of tell it to papa and to jerk the conversation back on to a business plane he had an uncomfortable sense of being bustled and hurried as he began to speak and this made it difficult for him to be as impressive as he could have wished but he relied on the subject matter of his discourse to grip his audience i dined last night with miss prudence stryker he said feeling that this was a statement which if anything could would divert mr slingsby's mind from the humours of tell it to papa his confidence was justified mr slingsby let his cigar go out again and stared fixedly across the desk mr slingsby did not actually say proceed your narrative interests me strangely but the mere fact of his silence was enough to convince bill that his attention was arrested and i may as well tell you proceeded bill severely that i know exactly what you've been up to there was a weakness about the phrase which he did not like but he had only just stopped himself saying i know all ah said mr slingsby there was nothing tremulous about the hand that struck the match that lighted his cigar for the third time nor did his voice express undue emotion but his dark eyes were gleaming what do you know i know that you are higgins and bennett higgins and bennett murmured mr slingsby bewildered higgins and bennett bill had no patience with this childish attempt to evade the issue yes higgins and bennett he repeated the mysterious firm that has been buying up all uncle cooley's wood pulp at the smallest possible prices it was a nice simple ingenious trick wasn't it you get the job of london manager to uncle cooley and then you start a firm under another name and sell all the stuff to yourself and sell it again to other firms at a handsome profit i don't wonder you can afford to put on your tell fathers not tell father tell it to papa much better title corrected mr slingsby never mind that said bill sternly but it makes a difference urged mr slingsby you'd be surprised how many good shows have been killed by bad titles you can see it for yourself if you think a minute tell it to papa it rolls off the tongue it looks well on the billing it i didn't come here to discuss the titles of plays said bill what i want to know is what you intend to do about it mr slingsby's black eyebrows rose do about it he said my dear fellow what is there to do about it there was always the chance of the thing coming out one of these days and now apparently it has happened you haven't got anything remotely resembling evidence as yet of course but unfortunately that doesn't matter now that you are on the track you won't have any difficulty in getting evidence i must clear out that's plain enough no argument about that bill was oppressed with a feeling that the scene was going all wrong even in this moment of his triumph the other's personality was too strong for him hardly in a less degree than on that other occasion when the blue-chinned one had trampled all over him at the luncheon table he felt himself a weak-kneed diffident inferior with an effort he forced himself to a spurt of truculence sadly aware the while that it was not going to amount to anything the second mate of a tramp steamer or one of miss ethel m dell's more virile heroes might have attempted truculence with mr slingsby and got away with it but bill even as he spoke knew that he was not the man to do it he did not even bother to bang the desk 
clear out he said in what he tried to make a hard and intimidating voice it sounded to him like an apologetic bleat suppose i have you arrested mr slingsby looked at him with a pained incredulity this mr slingsby seemed to think judging from his expression was simply asinine mere babble from the sick-bed have me arrested he said talk sense you don't suppose your uncle is going to thank you for making a public exposure of this business and getting him laughed at by everybody he will be only too glad to have the whole thing hushed up he eyed bill as if he expected him to apologize and such was his magnetism that bill very nearly did mr slingsby summed up never he said severely go into a thing of this sort unless you are prepared to have it slip up on you at a moment's notice bill just contrived to check himself from saying he wouldn't i had the sense to make all my preparations long ago my money is invested in south american securities and i shall take the next boat to buenos aires he paused no he went on i shall go to new york first and arrange for the production of tell it to papa tell me he said shelving the more trivial matter of his criminality you have lived in new york for a number of years who would you say was the best manager to go in with on the production of a nice clean farce with only one interior set for the three acts it doesn't need money spent on it the thing takes care of itself all i need is an honest man bill routed and discomfited rallied for a brief counter-attack what do you want with an honest man he said bitterly mr slingsby was not to be jarred out of his geniality there's no need to be personal he chided gently no need for any hard feelings i'm the one who ought to be grumbling you've spoiled as nice a little income for me as ever a man had fortunately i can get on without it tell it to papa is all i shall want for the rest of my life you have no cause to be nasty you have done pretty well for yourself old paradine ought to come down handsome when you tell him besides you've learned a very valuable lesson one that ought to be a great help to you in your future life never said mr slingsby and would have laid his hand on bill's shoulder if the latter had not drawn coldly back never tell your business secrets to anybody anybody mind and above all never give yourself away in an effort to impress a girl with your smartness it doesn't pay in fact better keep away from girls altogether they're tricky propositions no sense of honesty nothing fair and square about them how was prudence asked mr slingsby chattily bill found himself saying that miss stryker had seemed pretty well quite a nice girl in her way said mr slingsby tolerantly beast of a temper and inclined to be deceitful but quite a good sort on the whole i think i shall be able to give her the part of the maid in one of the touring companies of tell it to papa and now my dear fellow he said making a little rustle of dismissal among the papers on his desk i'm afraid i shall have to ask you to be going i have a lot of cleaning up to do before i leave by the way it would be most kind of you if you didn't say anything about this little matter to your uncle before i sail i shall be able to get wednesday's boat i should appreciate it extremely if you would postpone telling him till i've gone there's just an outside chance that if i were actually ready to hand so to speak he might take it into his head to be vindictive better not tell him till i've gone eh what do you think all right said bill he had no notion why he said it except that it was the only thing that he felt he could possibly say capital said mr slingsby his excellent teeth gleaming in a delightful smile well good-bye my dear fellow i hope we shall meet again one of these days oh before you go he scribbled on a card take this 
he said give it to the house manager at the bijou and he'll fix you up with a couple of seats any night you want better perhaps not make it a saturday i know you'll like the show best second act that's ever been put on the stage it was not till late in the afternoon that bill returned to marmont mansions the necessity of stopping dazedly at intervals rendered his progress westward slow and by the time the lunch hour arrived he had not gone beyond the strand he turned into a quiet restaurant and the effect of the meal was so curative that he emerged again in a state of cheerfulness almost rivalling that of mr slingsby he perceived that the impact of the other's powerful personality had led him to ignore the really vital fact whether wilfred slingsby was crushed or defiant was immaterial whether he stayed in or out of jail made no difference whatever crushed defiant free or in broad arrows mr slingsby had played his part whatever his demerits as a man wilfred slingsby had made it possible for him to do mr paradine a momentous service he had made it possible for him to achieve what he had come to london to do yes uncle cooley could hardly overlook a service like this now surely he must as mr slingsby had suggested come down handsome and if he did why then the last obstacle between himself and flick was removed through a world ringing with joy bells bill made his way to marmont mansions and floated airily up the stairs into his sitting-room there was a letter lying on the table and the joy bells seemed to ring louder than ever as he recognized flick's handwriting he tore it open the joy bells stopped as if they had been turned off with a switch he collapsed on to the settee there was a strange buzzing in his ears the opposite wall seemed far away and obscured by a mist at the pit of his stomach was a dull aching feeling as though some unseen hand had smitten him with violence he re-read the letter there must be some mistake mistake that was what the letter said feel we have made a mistake sure we should only be unhappy marry roderick on wednesday only thing to do and for this extraordinary this ghastly this unbelievable change of heart she gave no reason no reason whatever bill stared before him and the room grew darker and darker End of chapter eighteen bill trespasses the garden of holly house slumbered in the moonlight trees threw dark shadows across the lawn and in the bushes little breezes went whispering to and fro to any man strolling there with his mind at rest the place would have seemed a magic haven of peace but on bill lurking warily in the shelter of the shrubbery its romantic appeal was wasted his mind was far from being at rest it was with no vague intention of hanging about in the darkness and keeping a sentimental watch on lighted windows that bill had come to the garden this time he was here to-night as the man of action hours of concentrated brooding over flick's letter had brought him to the conclusion that it was an inspired letter probably dictated word for word with all the commas and full stops complete by that repellent woman who had forced them asunder in waterloo station yes the more bill thought about it the more definitely he seemed to see in that letter the hand of the demon aunt no man of action embarks on any enterprise without a settled plan bill had a settled plan it involved the cooperation of one of the minor domestics of the hammond household and it was in quest of such a domestic that he had taken up his present position in the middle of a laurel bush facing the side of the house he had reasoned the thing out it would be useless to attempt to communicate with flick through the ordinary medium of the post 
a woman like that waterloo station woman brimming over as that brief glimpse of her had told him with the lowest and most criminal cunning would undoubtedly be exercising supervision over flick's correspondence she would be watching for the postman like a bird dog all ready to intercept letters as for district messenger boys it would be a sheer waste of money to employ them no the only thing to do was to lurk about here until one of the servants came out for a breath of air and then collar him or her and bribe her or him with untold gold to convey secretly to flick the note which even now was burning holes in his left breast pocket it was a good letter the writing of it had occupied an hour and a half but the results had justified the toil in six closely filled sheets it told all that there was to tell about his undying love explained the roseate aspect of the situation as regarded the future when uncle cooley should have been informed of the slingsby matter and sketched out in detail a scheme for flick to leave home privily next day meet him under the clock at charing cross and proceed with him to the registry office where he had made all arrangements for their immediate marriage in the whole annals of love correspondence there had probably never been a letter which so nicely combined the fervent and the practical and all that was needed now was a messenger to take it to her but the charms of the moonlit garden obvious though they should have been appeared to have no appeal for the domestic staff of holly house the breezes chuckled in the bushes the moonbeams danced on the lawn invisible flowers filled the air with a languorous scent but not even a knife and boot boy was lured out of that back door little by little as he kept shifting his position to avoid cramp bill began to be filled with sneering and contemptuous thoughts towards the british domestic he seemed to picture these degraded creatures huddled together on this divine night in a stuffy kitchen with all the windows shut and the fire going full blast talking about the movies or reading forget-me-not novelettes and finally after a distant clock had twice struck the hour the strain of this waiting became too much for him he burst from the bushes and marched up to the front door a long interval followed his ringing of the bell then a parlour-maid appeared bill who had anticipated a butler and had been wondering if the latter would remember having seen him before experienced a momentary relief and had even got so far as feeling that here was the minor domestic for whom he had been waiting all these weary hours when he caught sight of the girl's face and immediately withdrew the fingers that were fumbling in his pocket for the note she wore spectacles and through these her eyes seemed to glitter with so austere a light that he suspected her instantly of being a minion probably the demon aunt's right-hand woman nevertheless it being necessary to render some explanation of his presence he plunged boldly ahead i want to see miss sheridan he said the spectacles raked him with what seemed a shocked incredulity the parlour-maid had the air of one who has been reading books of etiquette and is cognizant of the fact that calls upon young ladies at such an hour of the night are among the things that are not done she made bill feel like the villain of a what is wrong with this picture advertisement miss sheridan is not at home sir she replied in a voice of ice can i see mr paradine mr paradine is not at home sir she eyed bill with critical spectacles and went through the first stages of closing the door nor can we in justice blame her bill's vigil in the bushes had left him a good deal dishevelled and far from the sort of person one likes to find on one's front doorstep after dark they've all gone to the theatre this was true 
it had occurred to the amiable mr hammond that flick was looking pensive and depressed and he had continued his good ministrations on her behalf by suggesting a dinner in town and a visit to the theatre and it was part of the irony which so marks mundane affairs that the manager enriched by the expedition was mr wilfrid slingsby for it was at the bijou theatre that they had taken a box to bill however there seemed no truth whatever in the statement its obvious falsity confirmed him in his opinion that this woman was a mere instrument of flick's aunt frances he withdrew sullenly as the door closed and after pausing for several moments in deep thought on the drive sneaked around the corner of the house and hid himself once more in the bushes there was no need to be discouraged by a single parlour-maid a big house like this would have all sorts of servants and at any moment one of a more benevolent disposition might pop out he snuggled into his laurel bush and waited he had been waiting some ten minutes when there suddenly came to him something that was practically an inspiration on the night when he had taken refuge on top of that outhouse roof flick he now recollected had come climbing down her knotted sheet from a window immediately above it presumably that of her bedroom silly of him not to think of that before all he had to do was to locate that outhouse climb on to its roof and there he would be if there was a light in the window he could whistle softly till she appeared and if the darkness showed that she was not there he could put the letter with a good-sized stone in his handkerchief and hurl the whole package in for her to find when she went to bed he wasted no more time extricating himself from the bush he made his way round the house there was his roof just as he had left it so far good but the window above it was dark he groped about for a stone found one and was wrapping up his parcel when from somewhere above his head there came the sound of a window opening followed by a soft but penetrating hey a man who has been subjected to the amount of nervous strain which bill had had to undergo that day is in no mood to have hey said to him out of upper windows when he is trespassing in hostile gardens bill bit his tongue dropped the stone and the note and leaped sideways into the shadow of the outhouse there he waited holding his breath for the drama to develop it now became apparent that only his guilty conscience had led him to suppose that he was the person whom the mysterious voice had addressed for at this moment there sounded from the darkness to his left a sharp whistle and he perceived that he was not the only trespasser in this garden the breeze which for some time had been freshening now began to blow strongly shredding away the bank of clouds which had covered the moon and illuminating the scene as if a spotlight had been turned on he himself was in the shadow of the outhouse but beyond this little pool of gloom the garden was bright and he saw all things clearly out of the window easily recognizable in the silver glow protruded the head and shoulders of his uncle's adopted son horace while below his large feet ruthlessly trampling some choice begonias stood a squat burly figure the figure of a man whom bill did not know and with whom if he had had his choice he would have been loath ever to become acquainted for as plainly as if he had carried a sign this man wore the word plug ugly written all over him we who have met joe the dip at close quarters in the light of the sun know that he was not one of nature's beauty prize winners seen at night he was a human gargoyle the boy horace was leaning farther out of the window i've got em he said the wind was now blowing so strongly as to render whispering impossible and horace's chest notes came plainly to bill's ears as did the plug ugly's response good enough said the plug ugly drop em down for the first time on hearing these words bill 
though still at a loss to know what all this was about became convinced that dark deeds were in progress possibly the interview with mr slingsby had blunted his genial trust in human honesty at any rate he needed no further words to tell him that sinister things were toward and this was fortunate for there were no further words horace reached back into the room leaned forward again balancing in his hands some solid object that looked like a bag and dropped this into the depths where it was neatly caught by the plug ugly the boy then retired and closed the window and the plug ugly here and after to be called joe the dip trampled down a few more begonias and began to steal down the path that led past bill's hiding place he had arrived abreast of him when the latter spoke stop said bill what have you got there in the normal round of his everyday life joe the dip was a man of phlegmatic habit it took a good deal to stir him to any exhibition of mental distress more marked than the quiver of a raised eyebrow but this was something special it got right into his emotions and churned them up with a single startled yelp of dismay he looked once over his shoulder and then began to pound off across the lawn as fast as his ample feet would take him it was a futile move even under ordinary conditions bill could have given him fifty yards in a hundred and won comfortably and now the welcome prospect of action coming after his long tedious wait in the bushes made him a super sprinter joe moreover was hampered by a heavy bag the race ended halfway across the lawn where joe feeling the hot breath of the pursuer on his neck turned at bay he dropped the bag and flung himself on bill nothing could have been more admirably suited to the latter's frame of mind joe standing beneath the window in the moonlight had looked an ugly customer but that did not damp his ardor bill had had a trying day and what he felt at that moment was that they could not come too ugly for him at the precise moment when joe's clutching fingers closed upon his throat he induced him to relax them with a short sharp upper cut which from the click which followed its delivery appeared to have landed squarely on the spot where it was calculated to do most good there ensued a scrambling flurry of blows at close quarters and then joe securing a grip swung bill off his feet and they fell together and for some moments matters became confused with joe in the ascendant but every fighter has his weak spot with some it is a too fragile jaw while others have a finicky distaste for being hit on the nose achilles it will be remembered could stand little punishment on the heel none of these weaknesses impaired the efficiency as a fighting machine of joe the dip strong men with hammers could hit him on the nose and accomplish nothing nor was it easy to discourage him by buffets on the jawbone nevertheless he was but human he had his danger spot and it was one which had frequently undone him in the rough and tumbles of his colorful past he was extraordinarily ticklish you had but to prod joe with a sharp finger and he became a spent force and this was what bill did now purely by chance as he strove to overcome him in the wrestle his wandering fingers suddenly roamed searchingly over his adversary's ribs and on the instant joe wrenched himself free with a stifled howl and staggered to his feet bill also rose there was nothing in his acquaintance with joe that led him to suppose that it was safe to remain on the ground while the latter was standing he jumped up and from that instant the tide of battle began to turn joe was a massive rather than a nimble fighter when it came to long-range exchanges he was at a disadvantage the wind had dropped now as suddenly as it had risen and clouds once more covered the moon but there still remained enough light for bill's purposes he slid in and jabbed joe in the eye 
he swung forcefully and felt joe's cauliflower ear yield squashily under his fist he slid in once more and smote joe on the other eye and it was this last blow delivered with all the violence of one who had had a morning with wilfred slingsby an afternoon with flick's letter and a night in the bushes of holly house that decided the issue it seemed to lend the final touch to joe's discouragement staggering back he prolonged his stagger till it became a run then making for the shrubbery he cast himself into it and working his way round till he came out into the open took to his heels and passed out of bill's life for ever bill stood panting this little turn-up had done him a world of good he felt happy and invigorated dismissing his late opponent from the scheme of things he picked up the bag and went back to the outhouse to find the letter he had dropped and it was here that he received the final shock of this disturbing day the letter was not there nor was his handkerchief both had been swept away into the darkness by that unfriendly wind bill searched well and thoroughly but he could not search the whole garden and gradually there stole upon him a sense of discouragement as poignant as that which he had caused joe the dip to feel in the concluding stages of their little disagreement he was beaten fate was against him and there was no use struggling he slouched brokenly through the garden out into the road slouched half a mile down the road till he met a taxicab and climbing wearily in drove back to marmont mansions where judson greeted him with frank amazement what on earth judson exclaimed have you been doing to your face bill old man bill had not been conscious of anything amiss with his face a glance at the mirror now revealed surprising wounds judging from the evidence at least one of joe's wandering wallops must have got home on his nose he placed the bag on the table and went off to the bathroom when he returned cleansed and refreshed he found that judson's simple curiosity had led him to open the bag what are you doing with all these old books bill books bill began to understand he told his story briefly that kid must be one of a gang of crooks he said he certainly dropped that bag out of window to the fellow i had the scrap with joyous excitement lit up judson's speaking countenance why good gosh bill old man he cried this is the most amazing bit of luck that ever happened old paradine can't in common decency do less than slip you half his fortune now he's a nut about books many a time has my old father bored me stiff with stories about his library if ever there was a blue-eyed boy you will be it once he hears about this make your terms stiff bill old man slip it into his ribs don't weaken he ought to give you half a million a year for this and a lot of good that will be grunted bill moodily flick's marrying roderick pike the day after to-morrow what but i thought she was going to marry you well she isn't they've been getting at her i suppose i had a letter from her that's why i went to holly house i thought i might be able to see her or at any rate get word to her judson's jaw had fallen this calamity was affecting him deeply flick he cried marry that bird who said toddy von reiter found the silks not while i have my strength what are you going to do about it said bill wearily do about it do about it boomed judson do about it why he paused reflectively well i'm darned if i know End of chapter 19
sixpenny worth of rice wednesday morning eleven of the clock and a fair fresh day with a cheerful little breeze nipping along from the southeast placid stolid wrapped up in its own affairs and titanically indifferent to all else london went about its daily business from putney to sloane square from cricklewood to regent street from sydenham hill to the strand from everywhere to everywhere red yellow and maroon omnibuses clattered without ceasing policemen guarded the peace stockbrokers dealt in stocks beggars begged hatters sold hats loafers loafed spatters sold spats motors rolled in the park paper boys hawked the three o'clock editions of the evening papers and retired colonels sat spaciously in the club windows fronting on piccadilly and pall mall dreaming of lunch the only things in all the great metropolis that even hinted that this was not just one of london's ordinary days were the striped awning stretched over the pavement in front of st peter's eaton square and the strip of red carpet which the awning shadowed portents which indicated clearly to the cognoscenti that a marriage had been arranged and would shortly take place beneath that church's famous roof in addition to bill who was dressed in quiet grey picked out with a twill of invisible red and accompanied by bob the celium wearing a tan-coloured leash and a splash of mud on the tip of his nose the cognoscenti already assembled on each side of the awning consisted of the usual group of old women discussing other weddings they had seen in their time the usual seedy men chatting in undertones about snips and winners and the usual baby asleep in a perambulator without whom this kind of gathering never seems complete these would stand round gaping until the bride and bridegroom emerged when they would potter off to reassemble at the next wedding that happened along of all those present bill alone had come to this spot with a motive other than that of mere idle sight-seeing but what that motive was he would have found it difficult to explain he certainly expected to derive no pleasure from watching flick go into that church and come out again on the arm of her husband not even the mild and vacuous pleasure which the old women and the seedy men would experience no it would be sheer torture to witness this ghastly thing and yet he knew that strong men with ropes would not have kept him away there is a deep-seated instinct in all human beings that prompts them to twist the knife in the wound and make things as unpleasant for themselves as possible and it was this instinct that bill was obeying and even now before any of the wedding party had appeared he was not in the loosest sense of the word enjoying himself the struggles of bob the celium alone would have prevented that bob was taking this business of waiting hardly his dog soul was seething in rebellion for he considered that he had been cheated and imposed upon observing bill leaving the flat he had slipped adroitly through the door at the last moment and asked quite civilly to be taken for a walk to this proposition bill had apparently agreed and they had started out perfectly normally and all quite in order and now here he had been for twenty minutes marooned in the middle of this beastly pavement unable to move more than a couple of yards in any direction and he was beginning to feel that this was going on for ever he expressed his resentment accordingly by a series of determined efforts to strangle himself on the end of his leash weaving the leash about bill's leg in order to get a better purchase and it was during the last of these attempts at suicide that the cheerful little breeze whipping round the corner of the street removed the latter's hat and sent it trundling across the square to bill's deeper sorrows therefore there was now added the misery of being conspicuous and an object of derision in the eyes of the hoi polloi of all spectacles that enchant a simple-minded london audience that of a man chasing his hat on a windy day is the most exhilarating and when in addition to chasing his hat the man is in imminent danger of being tripped up by a frolicking dog their enjoyment becomes complete 
bill's little entertainment went with a roar and when he returned hatted once more and full of hard feelings towards his species his chagrin was deepened by the discovery that in the interval of his occupation elsewhere flick had arrived and gone into the church the cognoscenti when he rejoined their ranks were already engaged in discussing her and comparing her with other brides of their distant acquaintance the notices on the whole were favourable one lady in a cloth cap and a cavalry moustache said she liked em plumper but with this exception flick had a good press adverse criticisms were reserved for the appearance of her paw bill knowing that flick possessed no paw took this gentleman to be her uncle sinclair to whom doubtless would have been assigned the task of giving away the bride he had not gone very well with the critics indeed there was one man in a sweater and a dented bowler hat who grew almost caustic in the subject of mr hammond's trouser crease where's the groom inquired the lady whom flick's figure had displeased he's light of course he's light rejoined one who knew about these things only natural he'd let er get there first he explained apparently with some recollection in his mind of the habits of boxers looked a bit pale i thought she did ventured a rather diffident voice the speaker seemed to be a comparative novice at these affairs and a little conscious of the weakness of his position in the midst of these experts i always look pale said the man who knew coldly besides i reckon you'd look pale if you was properly up against it like her i seen a picture of him in the record this morning nasty-looking bloke yes the man of knowledge was not one of your broad-minded fellows who are able to make allowances for the alterations which reproduction in a cheap morning paper can effect in the human countenance the fact that nobody could possibly really look as villainous as roderick had done in the record did not occur to him a nasty mean-looking bloke with a smudge across his face if you ask me i think he'll beat her bill could endure no more three courses suggested themselves to him to go away to knock the speaker down and trample upon his remains and to go into the church and sit there and because it was the unpleasantest and would make his torments the most complete he chose the last he made his way through the square found a handy tobacconist's purchased an ounce of tobacco in a forbidding wrapper and on the strength of this business deal left bob in charge of the man behind the counter then walked out of the shop threw away the tobacco and returning to the church strode boldly in and sank into the nearest pew it was dim and cool and rustling in here and quite against his wishes a feeling of peace was beginning to steal over bill when he was roused to wrath once more by a voice breathing delicately in his ear ticket whispered the voice it was a pink youth who looked hot and uncomfortable the scowl which bill bestowed upon him was so fierce and so packed with hatred malice and uncharitableness that his heat and discomfort seemed to grow even greater and after backing a pace and blinking he finally decided to withdraw from the affair the idea of a man in a grey suit and minus a ticket being at a wedding of any importance offended all his finest feelings but even had the edifice he was in been of a less sacred character bill had not the appearance of one with whom it would be agreeable to wrangle gray suits always make a big man look bigger and bill's suit was very gray bill sat on after one startled glance at his suit the congregation appeared to have come to the conclusion that he was just one of the myriad sights of a great city and gave him no further attention he plunged into mournful meditation whispering had begun the atmosphere had become suddenly disturbed and restless 
it was a long time before bill deep in his thoughts roused himself to observe this but once it had come to his notice it was unmistakable people were murmuring with their heads together people were shuffling plainly something was wrong an important-looking man with a badge pinned to his coat came down the aisle he stopped and whispered sibilantly in the ear of an ornate woman in the pew in front of bill's the woman uttered an astonished squeak postponed the man with the badge nodded solemnly there was more whispering then it's no use waiting said the woman none said the man with the badge others had apparently received the same information the church was beginning to empty itself bill added himself to the stream and was presently outside in the square where disappointed and perplexed cognoscenti gaped in amazement at this strange anticlimax they had been to many weddings in their time but they had never yet been to one where nobody got married bill sought his hospitable tobacconist retrieved bob and began to walk aimlessly back he was passing under the awning when a hand touched his arm and turning he perceived judson judson was looking intensely serious his face was pasty and his eyes heavy and it suddenly came to bill that he had not seen the heir of the cokers since they had dined together at eight o'clock on the previous night a man in bill's position cannot think of everything and one of the things to which he had not given a thought was judson he remembered now that the other had slipped out soon after dinner for what he described as a quiet stroll that stroll had apparently lasted all night wedding off said judson there seems to have been a hitch of some sort said bill judson smiled it was a smile that seemed to cause him some difficulty and even pain but there was triumph in it you bet there's been a hitch he said i popped round last night and kidnapped the bridegroom judson stooped and began to tickle the celium who was wiping his front feet affectionately on the leg of his trousers kidnapped him cried bill his companion's statement had been plain and straightforward and yet he found himself puzzling dizzily over it as over some strange cryptogram kidnapped him judson removed his attention from bob well not exactly kidnapped him he said it wasn't necessary when i got to his apartment and put the thing to him as man to man i found he wanted to kidnap himself that made everything jolly and simple i don't understand what don't you understand bill old man said judson patiently he blinked in a pained way at a passing lorry which was rattling by in a noisy and uncouth manner trying to a man who had had a disturbed night you went to pike's apartment yes the lorry was out of earshot now and judson felt more composed after what you told me about flick going to marry him i instantly saw that it was necessary to take a strong line i decided to slip round and threaten him with horrible penalties if he did not at once disappear and it shows how you can misjudge a fellow he turned out to be a capital bird perfectly matey and an excellent host but i didn't discover that till later of course he was out when i got there but i managed to induce his valet to let me in so i took a seat and waited the valet a most able man asked me if i would like a drink i said i would i was having my third when the bimbo pike arrived he paused and again that look of pain passed over his face this time it was caused by bob who barked suddenly and gratingly at a cat pike was considerably rattled at seeing me but he calmed down after a while and i got to business i put it to him squarely i said 
nobody was less fond of unpleasantness than i was but if he didn't disappear the worst would inevitably ensue and bit by bit pillow man it came out that he was only too anxious to disappear nothing he wanted less than to marry flick it seems there's another girl she used to be a stenographer or something in the pike's weekly office whom he has long loved in a manner well he described his feelings to me and believe me he had got it bad that must have been the girl i met him with in battersea park said bill very probably if you met him with a girl in Battersea Park, this would be the girl you met him in Battersea Park with, because he told me he had been meeting her on the sly for weeks past. He would have bolted with her like a shot months ago, only he was scared stiff of his father. His father would be the bozo who pursued you in the car, I take it. Yes, Sir George Pike flick's uncle well the old dad had apparently got him hypnotized i reasoned with the man more drinks were produced and we began to do ourselves pretty well and with each snifter he took he seemed to come more and more round to my way of thinking i've given up all that sort of thing now but there's no doubt that bad as it is for the constitution there's nothing like a drop of drink for putting heart into a fellow round about one in the morning good old pike had begun to walk up and down the room and was talking about calling the old man up on the telephone and telling him just where he got off no need to do that i said just disappear i will he said that's right i said you really think so he said i certainly do i said i ought to have done it before he said better late than never i said it turned out that as far as the money end of it was concerned he was sitting very pretty some time ago in order to do down the income tax people old pike had transferred a large mass of wealth to this bird's account the understanding being that roddy i was calling him roddy by this time was to return it in due season be a man i said call her the cash send a few wires of farewell and leg it for foreign parts he burst into tears clasped my hand and said that i was one of the master minds of the age in which mark you bill old man he wasn't so darn far wrong for if ever one fellow had given another fellow a bit of good advice i had he said that it was the dream of his life to go off to italy and write poetry how would it be he said to tool off to florence or naples or one of those wop spots then he could write to the girl to follow him out there and they could get married and and write poetry and eat spaghetti and live happily for the rest of their lives i said it was the pippiest scheme of the age a lollapalooza and the long and the short of it is that he left on the nine o'clock train to catch the boat at tover so that's that bill old man bill was beyond speech he pressed judson's hand silently his faith in a great coherent purposeful plan governing this sometimes seemingly chaotic world of ours was completely restored it was a splendid beautifully managed world a world in which even judson had his uses and now proceeded judson i come to the really important part as i told you we made a very fair night of it and i left roddy's apartment after sleeping on the sofa at about nine this morning i had a couple of hours to fill in before i came to find you here 
and I was thinking of going and sitting down in the park. Well, I was going along the Brompton Road, headed for the park, when I happened to pass a building into which a good many people were popping, and I thought I might just as well sit down in there. It was becoming pretty necessary for me to sit down somewhere right away. A large car had rolled up to the curb. Bill moved away a step to frustrate Bob's apparent intention of casting himself beneath the wheels. "'And I'm darned, Bill, old man,' proceeded Judson earnestly, "'if I didn't find myself right plumb spang in the middle of a temperance lecture. A nasty shock. But it was simply too much effort to get up and leave, so I stayed where I was.' bill it was the luckiest thing i ever did in my life made me a different man absolutely and entirely a changed man no more alcohol for me i'm off the stuff for life give you my word i hadn't the remotest conception till that moment what it did to a fellow makes your inside like a crumpled oak leaf that's what it does i always had the idea that it was a valuable stimulant and carminative medicinal if you know what i mean but when this bird shot a colored slide on the screen showing the liver of a hard drinker bill was looking past him with bulging eyes a morning-suited man of middle age and amiable aspect had come out of the church and on this middle-aged man's arm walked a girl in bridal white they crossed the pavement and entered the car and after that said judson he took some worms and slipped him a stiff bracer and believe me or believe me not bill old man what it did to them was plenty all bright and chirpy those worms had been at the start jolly good fellows having one on the house but the minute they had got that stuff well over the larynx he broke off his audience had deserted him bill coming out of his trance had become a thing of action the car had begun to move off when he darted forward flung open the door and without a word hurled himself in bob the celium trailing through the air on his leash like a kite uttered a short strangled yelp of disapproval flick said bill and for a space no more words were spoken this was due principally to the behaviour of the celium it had taken bob a moment or two to get the hang of things at first sniff that wedding dress of flick's had had a strange and misleading smell but now recognition had come and he was giving a spirited imitation of six celiums enclosed in a single limousine to leap up lick flick's face leap back kick bill in the eye leap up again knock mr hammond's hat off and plunge panting stertorously towards flick once more was with him the work of a moment he looked like one of those old-fashioned shimmering motion pictures and with this emotional exhibition coming on top of the natural surprise consequent upon bill's intrusion conversation was for some few moments at a standstill eventually mr hammond calm even in this crisis retrieved his hat from the corner into which bob had rolled it and spoke gazing mildly at bill if you are looking for a cab sir he said pleasantly you will probably find one along the street flick said bill winding the leash round his fingers and pulling strongly i got your letter but i understood i understood exactly what had happened i know that it must have been dictated by that infernal fat-headed aunt of yours my wife observed mr hammond in pleased recognition and if it is not a rude question who in the name of goodness are you a small voice spoke from the corner this is bill west uncle sinclair there was a pause flick 
resumed bill i was talking about that letter i understood just why you had written it did you see me said flick round-eyed see you at mario's a dizzy feeling began to grip bill see you at mario's what what do you mean but you said you understood i flick held her hands out to him with a little cry i don't care i saw you with that girl but i just don't care take me away bill i want you to take me away bill took her hands mechanically you saw me good heavens he exclaimed enlightened you don't mean you saw me dining with that girl at mario's on sunday night yes but i don't care i want you to take me away bill slipped the leash into mr hammond's hand would you mind holding this animal for a moment he said he gripped flick's hands and drew her closer oblivious of the keenly interested gaze of mr hammond who had just replaced the glasses which bob had knocked off and was scrutinizing him as though he were some rare first edition flicky my darling flicky he cried i can explain everything i had to dine with that infernal girl i hated it but i had to go through with it she knew all about slingsby and judson met her and arranged this dinner so that she could tell me and she told me my gosh she told me everything i saw slingsby next day and told him that i knew he had been swindling uncle cooley for years and he has cleared out and directly i tell uncle cooley everything will be all right he's sure to fix me up so that we can get married right away mr hammond coughed gently <clears throat> is it your intention to marry my niece he asked interestedly yes it is said bill he turned to flick again let's go right off now flicky roderick's run off and is going to marry some girl who used to be a stenographer or something well well said mr hammond tell me he went on turning to bill you look extraordinarily like a young man who dropped in one night at holly house some months ago and chased my nephew roderick sixteen times or so round the garden are you by any chance the same that was me said bill then it was you who were responsible for my brother-in-law the eminent sir george pike falling into the pond i was mr hammond shook him warmly by the hand take him flicky he said i could wish you no better husband why good heavens a man who saved you from drowning whose image you cherished in your heart through all those long weary years he took up the speaking-tube yates he said to the chauffeur do you know a good registry office he turned to flick and bill he says he does not there's one at eleven beaumont street pimlico cried bill enthusiastically yates said mr hammond speaking into the tube drive to number eleven beaumont street pimlico he hung up the tube and leaned back oh uncle sinclair said flick breathlessly after the ceremony said mr hammond i think it would be judicious if you were to return home flick if only for a day or so it would be a little difficult for me to explain your absence this morning later on the atmosphere may grow a trifle less tense he took up the speaking tube again yates he said stop at the next grocer's you come to i wish to buy six penny worth of rice End of chapter twenty astonishing humility of an uncle the sun of a fair summer afternoon shone upon st mary axe mr cooley paradine alighting from his taxicab at the door of the building that housed the london branch of his pulp and paper business climbed listlessly up the three flights of stairs niobe mourning for the loss of her children was no more pathetic figure than mr paradine 
grieving over the mysterious disappearance of the most prized gems of his collection of old books the mystery of the affair weighed on him sorely when the theatre party had returned from its revels which had included a late supper at a gay restaurant there was no sign that any burglars had entered holly house no sign whatever and yet the books were gone mr paradine had brooded over this astonishing affair ever since without ceasing and the minor mystery of why his nephew bill had telegraphed to him in such an urgent vein bidding him come without fail to the office this afternoon paled in comparison mr west here he said gruffly henry the office boy stepped forward a model of smiling efficiency courteous and prompt in the presence of the boss that was how young fellows got on in the business world this way sir bill looked up as the door of the private office opened he had been seated in mr slingsby's chair but he rose and came forward with a promptness and courtesy which not even henry had exceeded hello uncle cooley mr paradine glared about the room he was in the mood when a man feels that he can find a faint relief in quarrelling with some one and he had decided that he was going to quarrel with bill not that quarrel was the right word it suggested a conflict he proposed to squelch bill on what grounds he should squelch him he did not at present know but doubtless time would provide an excuse where's slingsby he grunted as henry his duty done stepped delicately out and closed the door slingsby's gone said bill gone at this hour of the afternoon where america america bill bent forward and tapped his uncle impressively on the arm don't paw me snapped mr paradine what are you pawing me for slingsby said bill uncowed by his forbidding manner was a swindler and a crook i was on to him from the very start but you would insist that he was perfect slingsby a swindler what are you talking about a marked change crept over mr paradine's demeanour as he listened to the story crisply unfolded by his nephew ferocity ebbed from him like some gas with which he had been inflated for several long minutes after bill had concluded he was silent then he drew a deep breath what i want is a nurse he said dejectedly that's what i want a nurse i'm not fit to be trusted alone bill beamed upon him with jovial encouragement what you want uncle cooley he said is a good live fellow like me looking after your business mr paradine eyed him with a strange humility would you like to come into my business bill he asked pathetically i'm ready to start learning now then you shall and name your own salary anything you say uncle only make it large enough for two i've got a wife to support mr paradine blinked a wife yes i think you know her your friend sinclair hammond's niece what when did this happen it's a secret at present but perhaps you could break it gently to my aunt-in-law it happened yesterday yesterday yes but she was going to marry someone else yesterday she was but i met her and we talked it over and she went off and married me we young business men move fast nowadays uncle cooley time is money with us he reached under the desk oh by the way uncle i think these books belong to you often as mr paradine had gazed upon the contents of the bag which bill had pushed across the desk he had never gazed so fixedly as now and stunned though the look was which he had bestowed upon them it was as nothing to that which he now directed at bill where 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 did you get these oh 
i just happened to run across your adopted son horace as he was handing them down from a window at holly house to a pal of his in the garden here there and everywhere that's me i hate to have to tell you uncle cooley but that boy is a member in good standing of a gang of crooks they seem to have planted him on you with the idea of having him pass out the swag mr paradine sighed deeply a nurse he muttered a nurse there was a silence bill said mr paradine brokenly i take back everything i may have said in the heat of the moment about my relatives they are a ghastly crew but by george you restore the average from now on he said as he rose i don't move a step without you i'm afraid you'll have to if you intend leaving now i promised my wife i'd meet her here i'm expecting her any moment why don't you stay and have a chat mr paradine shook his head some other day bill he said give her my love but i can't stop now i'm going back to wimbledon he swished his stick militantly through the air i'm going to have a talk with that boy horace bill said mr paradine i seem to have made a fool of myself in practically every direction but this is one job i'm going to carry through i started it and i'm going to finish it i'm going to make that boy horace a credit to society if i have to wallop him every day for the rest of my life i'll send him to a good school by gad and i'll employ ten tutors with sawn-off shotguns to look after him during the holidays by the time he's grown up i'll have him making the hero of a sunday school story look like jesse james good-bye bill my boy come and lunch with me at the antiquarians one of these days you're a great fellow you're forgetting your books uncle cooley mr paradine who had reached the door returned so i am he said humbly so i am yes i certainly do need a nurse if you see any good nurses bill reserve one for me flick arriving a few minutes later found her husband smiling glassily at the opposite wall the recent interview had affected bill rather like a strong application of ether it needed flick's womanly presence to restore him to a sense of belonging to the world of solid things well said flick eagerly bill smiled another glassy smile everything's all right darling he replied as right as it can possibly be uncle cooley has gone away promising me vast fortunes and thinking me the most wonderful fellow in the world so you are said flick bill frowned thoughtfully i wonder he mused i'm the luckiest i know he said i've only got to look at you to realize that but look here you know i've been thinking over things and from start to finish i can't see a single thing in the whole business that i've actually done myself it was you who first got on slingsby's track it was judson who introduced me to prudent striker it was prudent striker who told me where slingsby had buried the body it was horace who obligingly chose the moment when i was standing under the window to shove his head out and drop that bag of books it was judson who got roderick out of the way in time to prevent flick ruffled his hair lovingly i shouldn't worry precious she said don't you know it's the one sure sign that a man is really great when he has all sorts of people working for him look at pierpont morgan and henry ford and selfridge and all of them they don't do the work themselves they just sit and let other people do it for them that's what shows they are such great men something in that said bill gratefully yes there's certainly something in that he drew her to him henry the office-boy who was standing on a stool and looking in through the transom 
sighed quietly he was a lad of sentiment end of chapter twenty one end of bill the conqueror by p g woodhouse